Old as the night has a group of friends sneak out late at night. There is no real need for them to sneak out. They're all adults and they're in a place where they belong. But there is a quiet thrill in sneaking and it's necessary for the ritual to work. They all carry candles with them, though it is unlit and they make their way to the library in the College of Technology. Even though the library is open 24 hours a day, it is quiet, as most of the students and professors are asleep. The librarian doesn't even look up from their book at the circulation desk. The friends are that quiet as they walk casually or quietly through the library, going through the first few aisles where there are books and they walk with quiet practice as they make it first into the part of the library where all of the shelves are empty of books. And they travel deeper into a part of the library that is even darker, where there's still books on the shelves, books that the university was too busy and too lazy to remove from the shelves. In a very quiet section of the hidden part of the library, they find a familiar table. Like the rest of the section, the table is free of dust, and so are the chairs. And above the table is a single light bulb, still strong and still burning, but the only light source visible from the table. Everyone takes their seats. There are five seats around the circular table, and there are six people. The sixth chair was carried by one of them to set up for her sister. They sit equidistant from each other. They all set their own candles in front of themselves. One red candle, dragon blood scented. Even unburnt, the smell is sweet and reassuring, a comfort during dark times, one that can represent spiritual centering, but in this case it is brought because the color and smell is a comfort to the one whose name is as bloody as the candle and whose spirit is as sweet as the scent of the candle. One orange candle, the largest candle brought by the smallest member of the friends. Despite its color, the smell is of caramel and fall, a scent of familiarity and warmth during cold autumn nights, but also one that is easily mistaken for something else. If you only look at the candle, you might think it smells of pumpkin or perhaps orange blossoms. If you know the young woman who carried the candle into the library, you would know that judging the candle by its look was as poor a choice as judging the one who carried it by her looks. One green candle. The scent is one of pine and clean. Maybe better suited for Saturnalia. Certainly better suited for making a college dorm smelling sweet than for a ritual held in the dark of an unknown library. The candle will still serve its purpose, even if it's a mystery of why it was chosen or why it was an appropriate choice. Much like the man who carried it, he is ignored by many who only notice him when he is gone. But among his friends, he is always noticed and always appreciated. One light blue candle, the scent is called River Sunset. The scent is difficult to discern, but it is there. A scent that conjures a feeling of being lost, where you're following the river hoping to find your way home. And instead, what you're finding is pleasant sights, and you're so caught up in the sights that you lose track of time and the sun is going down. The woman who carried the candle can talk a lot because she listens a lot. She often has riddles and pleasant thoughts to share, but just as easily she can snare people in her words and never let them go. One dark blue candle. The scent is deep ocean. The scent reminds of salt water and ocean spray, though not of the ocean on the beach nor anywhere else the ocean is supposed to be at. It is the scent of smelling salt water while traveling through a desert. It is ocean spray that wakes you up from a deep sleep, a warning of illness before it gets worse. The woman who carries the scandal chose a close color to her sister's. They like to confuse others who don't know them personally. Her scent is as much a warning as it is a comfort to herself, a reminder that she is away from home, not as a lost traveler, but as an invasive or introduced species. 
one white candle. This candle is the smallest, being only a tea light. It will burn long enough for their purposes, and the candle is an important part of the ritual. The man who carries the candle has a ring on his right middle finger that looks like it is made of steel. He feels like he is the weakest of his friends and that he is the least interesting, so he has chosen go to go last, letting the weakest candle burn the longest. The friends are all sat down. The light above is burning bright as a lighter is passed around the circle, lighting all of the candles one by one. Each person takes the time to only light the candle in front of them. The candles all lit, the smallest among them flies up to reach the light bulb ten feet above and twists the bulb just enough that the light goes out, but not enough that the bulb goes out. Now, in near total darkness, all of the friends sit in front of the candles, letting the light dance in front of them. The candles warm and brighten the room, but already the first part of the ritual has begun. There is no exit from this room anymore. The way they came from is blocked by a bookshelf filled with books. All the shelves are full of books written in titles of stories that were never written in their own world. They all know that the first part of the ritual is done and that they have to carefully begin the next part. Each of the friends remove a single suite from their possession and leave it in the center of the table, careful not to burn themselves on the fire. Marceline leaves an ounce bag of gummy isopods in the center of the table. Her favorite treat is perfect for Feralia, Saturnalia, Parentalia, Fornicalia, or even for a street fair, a treat that has a long history and just as easily one that can be enjoyed anywhere. One that has a lot of meaning but also can be obtained almost anywhere. These treats were taken from her bag where she always carried some. She didn't notice she offered two different bags, one sweet and one sour, both gummy isopods, one from her one also from her. Fallen Grace offers an iced tea cake, one that was made by hand in the cooking class with help from her younger sister. Fallen Grace still went to great effort to ice and decorate the cake herself. The icing is milk chocolate with white chocolate and Jolly Roger on top of it, a favorite treat of the one they were trying to summon but even so, Fallen Grace couldn't help but do her own spin on it. Her own expression, even in a gift, meant for someone else. A small inkling of fear inside herself that it makes the gift worth less, and another part of herself that insists that the gift is more valuable because of it. Hell pulls out his gift for the being they are trying to summon. A thermos of hot chocolate that he made from purchased ingredients from the street market. The milk is still warm and sweet, steam rising from the cap of the thermos as he poured the drink, filling it part of the way as he opened a bag of maple marshmallows that he poured into the thermos. He did a lot of research on creatures, and he knows that they love cream, milk, and sweets. So he chose whole milk because the fat that is used in cream is still there, the chocolate is sweet, and the marshmallows are added because it is a traditional way to make it sweeter, and maple marshmallows are even sweeter than the normal ones. Summer is the next to offer up a treat. Her silver earring in her right ear glitters as her tattooed right hand offers her treat. She offers a cupcake that she bought from the bakery. A dry chocolate cupcake with white icing is more than a little smeared from the travel, offered in the same cup that it is used to travel from the bakery to the library. The cupcake was once beautifully crafted, but the traveling has made it smeared inside the cup, and more of the icing is inside the cup than on the cupcake. The cake is still edible and still sweet when offered in the center of the table. Autumn, nearly identical to her sister, 
except the tattoo is on her left wrist and her piercing is stainless steel and through her left ear, even though both ears are pierced. Autumn's cupcake offered is a strawberry shortcake with cream cheese frosting, carefully carried from her home in a cup, but this frosting is not smeared, and she carefully removes it from the cup, leaving it in the center of the table, proud of her own hard work, baking and icing her cake. She does not know that the cream cheese she used was expired, and that the cake would make a person sick if they ate it. Dylan is the last to offer his gift to the center of the table. Inside a small plastic bag, he removes a soul cake. Shaped like the biscuit, and the flat pastry is shaped with a cross on top and confectioner's double-A sugar, the sugar that looks like crystals. The cake has a few raisins inside, and it was Dylan's first attempt at baking ever since going to college. He tried a few and he thought they tasted all right, so he laid out a napkin and rested his soul cake on top. Hopeful that it was an accepted gift, but seeing his own treat compared to everyone else's, he wanted to disappear into his chair. Even though they did not coordinate, everyone brought something different, and they all poured just a bit of themselves into their gifts. Seven gifts sat in the center of the table, surrounded by six candles, and sat around the table are six different souls. They sat in silence for the next part of the ritual. The silence remains as the candles all flickered and something in the air changed again. The scents were all mixed and mixing, but now only one scent could be smelled. The scent of dragon blood was the only scent around the table. The other candles are still burning, but their scent is not one that can be smelled. Marceline was chosen first. She leans forward as the flickering of her candle accents her scar over her eye. In the low light, as the candle flickers, her hair appears to change as she speaks. Sometimes her hair is straight past her shoulders, and sometimes it is short and curled as she speaks. She does not notice, and while the others notice, they do not say anything. They only listen to the first story as a soft voice speaks in the darkness. She speaks for herself, but she does not know what herself means. The first story is told, soon to be followed by the second. Six candles burn. Five sweets rest in the center of the table. One person shares a story. Seven listen to the story. Five are seen. Two remain unseen. When the event occurred, many places that were thought safe were swiftly abandoned to the enemy. The cities were hurt first as whatever lived in the mines below made their way above. The water was contaminated, and all who drank it were changed into the enemy. Monstrous forms that sought to wipe out all of human life. Humanity abandoned the cities and made their way to the countryside to set up refuge. The water was clean, and the enemy mostly stayed in the cities and the mines. Mostly. The children are safe. So, beyond the railways, people come to gather in the countryside, where food is grown and safety is found. There you will find many vendors, some carrying goods taken from the cities. Others have food and drink that was made in the countryside. The peace is great and the mood is light, with feelings of joy and celebration drifting along the scent and smoke and you can find a lot of information about the event. And even if most people don't want to talk about it, the children are safe. The event doesn't affect those of monstrous form, so they often act as protectors and they are willing to go into the cities. You might be able to approach one of them and ask them for more information, but it doesn't mean they will answer. They may want something in exchange, or maybe they just don't want you risking your life to enter the cities or the mines, gain from the treasures that are there. The children are safe. 
The countryside is organized for fun. The food trucks have plenty to offer, and senti is still taken. Imperial currency holds its value even after the event. There is a corn maze for exploring, hay rides, pie contest, pumpkins to harvest, and lanterns to carve. Plenty to do, and it is a genuine joy to participate in. There's even face painting, apple ciders, and animals to pet. In any other circumstance, this would be a place for children to be safe. There's a quiet sense of fear everywhere. Even though the monsters are protectors, they are not trusted by all of humanity. Some of it is fear of the unknown or even the fear of monsters, but a lot of the fear is the thought that the enemy may disguise itself as a helpful monster to lull others into a sense of safety for harming them like helpless children. Still, to those who are brave enough, they may decide to go from the countryside to the railroad. The rail you know, yard that brings people from the city also offers a way for people to head back into the city. It isn't safe for children. The rail yard can only be accessed by going beyond the hay maze. There's a few secret routes that lead to the rail yard, but the best way to sneak by is to convince the monsters guarding the way that you are one of them. If you get deep enough into a hay maze and you find the crossroads with only four paths, you then find the fifth path, and it will lead to the secluded area where the monsters lie. You will always find three monsters protecting the exit from the hay maze and the rail yard. Always three. If there are more than three, then you are not allowed to leave to the rail yard. If there are less than three, then you are in the wrong place, and the exit is not open for you. The first monster is a fae that refuses to speak. A fairy that will not be matched by riddles, who will not want food, and who fears gold rather than iron. A fairy from Hibernaria, who is well known but not well understood. One that is notorious, but leaves no survivors of his victims. A monster that will never look you in the eye, who is as quick as lightning, and who you don't want to ever stop moving. Should he stop moving, someone or something will die. The second monster is even crueler than the first. He looks like a beautiful woman at first. She wears a cotton mask that mostly hides her mouth. She does not like it when anyone stares at her face. She carries many knives, and she never misses. She only cuts what she intends to cut, and she cuts as deep or as shallow as she wants. If you can answer her riddle, she will accept you as a monster. But if you answer it wrong, and she thinks you're the enemy in disguise, she will kill you before you even realize what you did wrong. If you answer and she thinks you aren't a monster, her knives will make sure that you leave the hay maze a monster. Maybe she'll let you try again since you are a monster now, if you can stop the bleeding. The final monster is the strangest and most dangerous of them all. No one has ever seen this monster directly. They only see it in pieces. It can only be seen in full in the mirrors scattered across the hay maze. The mirrors let the monster see you, and they also gaze back even if you don't see them. Be careful because in the hay maze, if you are there, they see you. They hear you. They know you. Maybe they've seen you outside the maze too. Can you keep acting like a monster the entire time in the hay maze? Can you be a monster long enough to fool all of the monsters in the hay maze into thinking you belong? Or maybe you do make it through the countryside. You find masks, you fool the monster in the mirrors, you fool the hay maze, and they let you into the rail yard. Would you want to go there? The enemy lives there. And even though you may find the next step to your journey, like many journeys, you can back out, 
and go back at this point. But if you keep going forward, you will keep moving forward. There may be more chances to turn back, but turning back may change you more than going forward. And it's and of course, there is always the chance that the same monsters that let you out of the hay maze may not let you come back. Just outside the entrance to the grounds of the pumpkin house, my friends and I all gathered, excited to go into the haunted house. Tell was smiling and chatting with Dylan, who was relieved to be a part of it all. Summer and Autumn chatted among themselves, like normal, and Fallen Grace sat on my shoulder. Outside the grounds, we could hear creepy carnival music from inside the part of the park that was the countryside. We're here. I can't believe we're all here, I said as we all eagerly waited in the line to get into the haunted house. When it was finally our turn to get in, the sun was setting and the sky was in twilight. The darkest it got around this area. The smell of funnel cake, pumpkin pie, kettle corn, and fresh earth filled the air. The memories of every haunted house, every carnival, and every warm autumn moment filled my mind with all of those smells. It's been years since I've been to the pumpkin house, and it is the first time I get to go with my big sister, Fallen Grace. What do you want to visit first? I asked her while she was practically buzzing with excitement on my shoulder. There's few places she can be out publicly, but in this place, beyond the veil, she is safe, and she isn't even in the top 100 weird things people would see here. Just standing in line, there were stranger people ahead of us. Directly in front of the docent was a hunched-over werewolf. The hair was a deep and dark gray. They stood over three meters tall with a long snout and sharp teeth who was also delicately parsing out Senti to the docent. Behind the werewolf was someone who had an extremely elongated neck that bent much like a snake, and who smiled at us, and we smiled back. She looked like one of our professors, but we were smart enough not to ask. Sometimes you see school staff outside of school functions, and you don't want to necessarily accuse them of being where you're at, because it's admitting you're at that same place. Just behind the woman with the long neck was a very scared-looking couple. They both wore very strange hats that made it look like they had two black circles on top of their heads, almost like mouse ears, and they kept whispering to each other, and they kept staring at everyone around them, including me and Fallen Grace. I waved at them, and they quickly turned away. Maybe they got lost, and they're asking for directions? It is strange for someone to react so harshly to someone trying to be friendly. I don't bite, Fallen Grace said to them, only for the woman to awkwardly answer back. We saw Gidhala. I tilted my head and I turned to everyone else. Does anyone speak Gothic? Ingovainic? They asked the group, and Summer shook her head and tried Kimru. Hello? She tried, which the woman seemed to understand. She started speaking way too quick for any of us to understand what she was saying, while Summer tried to follow along. Dunef, the man said as he reached for Fallen Grace, and I grabbed his hand before he got close. Don't grab my sister. I warned him, and Fallen Grace quietly cussed him out. The couple then got the message, and they kept talking to themselves in Ingovanic, while they returned to Summer to translate what they were saying. They're lost, and they don't understand anyone. She thought I was speaking the same as her, but that's just what I'm getting based on context. Her language isn't like any Gothic I've heard. I did get the fact that everyone is really angry at everyone around them. She said as the couple continued to go forward and they spoke to the docent in the same language, who pointed them back to the parking lot where they muttered and they started making their way back. What was that about? I asked the docent. A familiar face from years ago. A man who is far too thin to be normal, his eyes hidden behind sunglasses, even in the dark, and he was always smiling. His pinstripe suit he wore made him look bored borderline skeletal, 
as he smiled and he answered. Oh, they were just a bit lost, and they were demanding to speak to the manager about the fact they got lost heading to a completely unrelated theme park. Docent answered. What did you tell them to make them go away? I asked, hoping to have a good answer. Pumpkin House had a very low tolerance for people who refused to play along, and even less for people who were demanding things from its employees. I told them that the real manager was inside them all along, and that if they wanted to reach their destination, they had to go somewhere else. They threatened to report me to their friends, but somehow, I don't care. The docent answered, and I smiled. Just what I expected from a docent. One cent each, I asked the docent, offering the copper coins, and he raised his hand and shook his head. You're all VIPs. Go on in and enjoy all the fares we have to offer. Although do remember, the prize in the center of it all is something that has to be sought after. Most people won't go further than the countryside. But as for many quests, going to the end as fast as you can isn't the best answer. Slow down, take your time, and remember... He leaned back and spoke in his best announcer voice. Helcom, helcom, helcom to the pumpkin house. Please enjoy, he said with a smile as we passed by the gates to get to the countryside. This part of the pumpkin house grounds changed the least year to year. It was a lot like most other fall festivals. Booths selling food, booths with games for prizes, face painters, and many other fun things to do. I headed first to a dart booth that had stuffed animals for prizes. The carnival worker had one eye and one arm missing as he handed me the darts in exchange for a single copper coin. Dylan was sitting in a chair to get his face painted. Autumn and Summer were waiting for pumpkin spice flavored apple cider. And Kel was staring at a scarecrow that had a raven on top of its head. People were already having fun, and I still had Fallen Grace, who was standing on the table, getting darts for herself. What prize are you looking for? She asked me, and I pointed to some thing on the top shelf. It didn't quite resemble any creature that I knew. It was bone white with four legs and big black eyes. I loved the creature, just looking at it. Something about the shape and the eyes convinced me that it was a perfect stuffed animal to take home. I want that thing, whatever it is. I want it, I love it, and I need it. I said, pointing at the creature that was definitely going home with me tonight. The carnival worker looked at the creature I was pointing at before he grunted and answered. That's called Yippee. My kid likes it. He said before I turned to Fallen Grace, and I jumped from one foot to the other while telling Fallen Grace, Win it for me, please, please, please. I'm really bad at these games, and I need that yippee. I told her while she shook her head. You won't learn anything if I win it for you, she said as she flew up. Up to carefully lift up her dart as she threw her dart in a half-deflated balloon, causing it to pop. All right, I will win that yippee. I can win things for myself said as I threw my own dart towards the balloons. My dart flew way off and hit the carnival worker directly on his eye patch. Oh gods, I'm so sorry, I told the carnival worker who only grunted in response, pulling the dart out of his eye patch. That's fine, it happens all the time. Next time, aim for the balloons, he said, handing the dart back to me, while Fallen Grace stood on the table, faking a yawn to avoid laughing at me. All of her darts were already in a balloon, and I took my time, aiming carefully as I threw the dart with all of my might. This time, it hit the balloon, but it bounced off. I will get it, I said to no one in particular as I threw the other two darts, one right after the other. One hit the board embedding into it, and the other didn't even reach the distance. Better luck next time. Want to try again? The worker asked as I threw down my coins to throw again. This repeated four more times before I gave up. Six centi spent, I did not manage to pop a single balloon. Falling Grace won a two-legged smiling cat from the carnival worker, 
with a promise that the prize would be sent to her after she was done in the pumpkin house. By that point, all of my friends were there and watching me struggle to throw a single dart to burst a balloon. Summer and Autumn both had identical drinks, with an extra for Kel and Dylan. Fallen Grace quit laughing, and now she looked a bit concerned. Dylan had a large black widow spider with a spider web on his cheek. Everyone already had something while I was busy trying to win. You think that's enough for me? Let's find something else to play. I said as we wandered off with Kel staying behind to speak to the carnival worker. While we wandered away to grab a lavender latte for myself when I noticed something. There were no children in the countryside. There were plenty of things that were made for children. Hay rides, face painting, even a much smaller corn maze than the last time I was there here, but there were no children at all. Just a few wandering adults and some teenagers, but it felt almost empty in the countryside. Fall festivals are always full of children, and when they aren't there, where could they be? Where are the children? Has anyone seen them anywhere? I asked and everyone shook their heads as Kel rejoined us before he had a recommendation. Maybe we should ask the Scarecrow. He seems to know a lot. He says, pointing to the Scarecrow, who was having a much larger gathering of crows around him. Why the Scarecrow? I asked before Kel answered. He has a raven that wears a hat. That is the surest sign of wisdom. The Scarecrow is wearing a hat, and that is why we should trust him? Dylan asked Kel incredulously. What? Don't be ridiculous. The raven is wearing a hat, so that proves the raven is wise. The scarecrow is wise for being friends with the raven, Kel said, and I nodded agreeing with his point. Yeah, he's got a point, Autumn said. Definitely, but if the raven doesn't know where do we go next, Summer asked. Let's start one step at a time before we start worrying about the next step. If we spend too much time wondering about what the next step would take, we will never take the first step. I told my friends as we made our way to the scarecrow. The scarecrow hung from a wooden stake, surrounded by ravens who all stared at us. We approached the scarecrow, and with everyone else nervous, I asked the scarecrow, Scarecrow, can you tell us where the children are? I asked the scarecrow. Dressed in flannel and overalls with straw sticking out of his clothes with a head seemingly made out of burlap. There was silence for a long moment before a small voice spoke just on top of the scarecrow's head. Why are you asking the scarecrow? You know he's not alive, the raven said. A white stripe on his chest and he wore a very small top flat on his head, which I do admit made him look very dapper. Oh, no, I didn't know that, but pleased to meet you. I'm Marceline, and you are? I asked the raven, who idly preened his wings before he answered my question. I'm Edgar. Pleased to meet you, young prince. So what brings you to the king of the Corvids? He asked. And before I could answer, Autumn whispered to Summer. I wonder if he's going to say never more, she said with a snicker, while Edgar let out a long sigh. First of all, fuck you. Second of all, if you're going to be rude, you will find that everyone will help you never more, Edgar said while Summer silently tried to shush her sister. Sorry about that rudeness, but I noticed there's no children in the countryside. I was hoping you could tell me where they are all at. I have a feeling like cobwebs in my mind, something that tells me it's important, but I can't remember why. I asked the king of the corvids, who pecked at the head of the scarecrow, before he answered. Are you sure you want to know? I can just tell you the children are safe and you can move on. You can live in ignorance and move on. Buy some masks and head into the hay maze. Just know right now you have the choice between knowledge and safety. You cannot choose both. Edgar said ominously, but I answered with ease. I choose knowledge. I don't think my nature would accept something else. I said while my friends agreed with me, 
Edgar tilted his head. Fascinating choice, but to answer your question, the children are kept in the hay fort. Though you'll never get in looking like that, you may have to find a mask that can disguise yourself. We'll find a stall that sells masks, but be warned, any mask worn too long becomes your face, Edgar said, and I nodded. I think I understand. Thank you, Edgar. Let's go, everyone. Quick question, Kel asked. Never use the words quick question around me again, but what is your question? I asked. Can we go to the bathroom first? Yeah, absolutely, I need to go also. Anyone else? Awkwardly, everyone raised their hands, and I could hear Edgar snickering. First, the bathroom. Then, we grab snacks. Why snacks? Adam asked. I'm hungry. Then, we check out the masks. And then, we head to the hay fort, I said, trying to lead the group awkwardly to the bathroom stalls. Then, we grabbed some overpriced corn dogs that the carnival worker told me was called the Heartbreaker. I didn't quite get it, but I'm sure it's some kind of adult joke. That wasn't one I could understand at all. As we ate our snacks, we made our way to the only stall that was selling masks in the entire countryside. The name on the stall was Justin Pine's Pine Masks. A clever pataphysical pun that no one seemed to get except for you. The man at the stall was a young man with a short scraggly beard who sold pins and magnets alongside his masks. I could see Kel examining some of the skull-shaped pins and Dylan was excitedly shaking the booth seller's hand. Apparently he recognized him from Share My Day. Autumn and Summer were bored and looking over the magnets for something they'd like, though they weren't into the old-fashioned monsters. While in Grace only sighed as she sat on my shoulder. I don't think they have anything in my size, but I should be easy enough to sneak in. But if you can, can you get me a Jolly Roger magnet? She asked me while I stuck my tongue out at her. Why don't you pay for it yourself? You know, you have money too. I'm not exactly rolling in it. I told her and she made a big show of digging into her pockets. I can't fit any money in these pockets. I can pay you back when we get home. Wait, hold on. I think I found something. Actually, two somethings. She removed her hands from her pockets with both of her middle fingers lifted up at me. She could be a handful, even just being 18 centimeters tall. I did chuckle at her show. Still, as I pulled the Jolly Roger magnet aside, I also checked over the masks. There were plenty of latex masks of incredible details. I could see a part man and part fly abomination where the compound eyes seemed to follow me. I could also see a snarling lycanthrope where the fur was soft to the touch and the latex was warm to the touch. I nodded to myself as I understood what was happening here. The ominous warning of a mask worn too long becomes the face, the hyper-realistic masks, the way they feel warm to the touch, and they followed me. The masks were possessive. If I put it on for too long, it would start to change my behavior and possibly become impossible to remove. I couldn't just say anything, though. Challenge has to be a challenge, and if I try to reveal it too soon, that will only convince the house to try harder. Still, I could be careful, and I could pay attention to any ominous warnings. How a physical awareness comes in handy. Especially if you understand the genre of the story the house is trying to give you. Still, though, such stories also have twists. And the twist may feel like it comes out of nowhere, but it has to exist in a way that can be understood, even if only in hindsight. So now I was being on guard from such twists. My hands flit over the masks until I found one that seemed to interest me. It was a simple mask, masquerade style with beautiful red sequins and black checkerboard patterns. Every other mask was a hyper-realistic monster. Why was this one a masquerade mask? And why did it stand out to me? 
I picked it up and I brought it over to Justin, who was still chatting with Dylan. How much for this masquerade mask? I asked him and he took one look at it. Oh, for you? I'm afraid the price is too much for someone like you to pay. He said with a sudden tone change he did not have with Dylan. Ah, so this was part of the game. He was being vague about the price, so this must be the mask that the house wants me to take. Why don't you tell me the price and I can decide if I can pay it or not? I asked him. I could have just put it down or even walked away if it was anywhere else. Knowing when to walk away is a great negotiation tactic. However, here in the pumpkin house, it wasn't about the price. Not in this situation. It was telling a story where I was a character. If I acted logically, or even if I was rude back, then it would ruin the story. Playing along was the right way to keep the story going. Otherwise, the house will have to correct the plot, and that can get... messy. Well, it's the kind of price that if you understand it, then you have to pay it. If you put it down, then you can look at other masks. I have a lovely Harlequin mask that is much cheaper and made from real Harlequin material, he offered. And I knew I had a choice, but I just had to mask. You used Harlequin skin to make a mask? I asked him more than a little thrown off by what he was suggesting. What? No, Harlequin books. Do you think I'm a monster? He asked, showing me a full Harlequin mask, also with black and red checkered sequins with a sinister smile. Though I do admit that was definitely a lot better looking than the mask I was looking at. Now, at a mental crossroads, I thought it out for a second. Right now, Justin was the harbinger, warning me against buying what was in my hands right now, and he's offering me something else. If I take what he's warning me against, that would warrant a punishment, usually for ignoring the warning. If I take what he is offering, though, that would mean no punishment is needed. However, that is only true if I think of it like a horror movie from the 2730s. Those rules apply, then. However, beforehand, sometimes the one who is helpful is actually offering something harmful. If that is the case, then by following his advice, I would actively be aiding in my downfall by trusting a seemingly helpful stranger. That was classic in the old fairy tales about mysterious merchants, that what they offer is actually extremely harmful, and by understanding how it worked, it either ends in your death or some cosmic vengeance on yourself. However, if it is a modern tale, then the story isn't about the merchant at all. It's about how I would act in the situation. The point of the story wouldn't be to put me in situations. It would be about getting me to improve myself. The first act in the story is about showing how I normally act with all of the advantages and drawbacks. And then as I learn my lessons, I would grow and change, regardless of what choice I make. Choice is my own. There will be advantages and disadvantages, and trying to predict what is going to happen won't actively work against me, because even making the choice to think clearly and plan things out is still a choice, and that choice will still have an effect on the narrative. Thinking pataphysically gets exhausting, especially in pataphysical nexuses like the pumpkin house. There is the narrative below me and the narrative above me. Understanding the narrative below me was simple enough. The masks were going to affect me in some way, and I would have to handle that problem. Thinking above it or understanding what the masks represent and how that would mean that I can handle the problem effectively was a lot harder. All these thoughts went through my head as my blank face was showed to Justin, and he broke character a, a bit to ask, Hey, are you okay? Yeah, she's fine. She just gets that way when she thinks too deep. Fallen Grace told him while he nodded, and then he clarified, 
The Harlequin mask is only ten centi, he said, trying to make it tempting, while I shook off an upcoming headache. At this point, I cannot predict the narrative. What I can do is make a choice, and the choice will put me on a quest one way or the other. So I will choose the choice that closest fits the kind of person that I am. Sure, the Harlequin mask looks great. Can you tell me all about the mask, please? I asked as I pulled out ten copper coins from my purse, and he handed me the mask along with the receipt, as a smile crossed his lips. Well, the mask represents a jester in a play called The Tragedy of the Hanged King, a comedic character that may have a more sinister part to play in the tragedy. That specific mask was one of only five, come directly from the last play held in Vandenberg. And as I can see, your friends have great interest in the other four masks from the tragedy. And sure enough, I could no I noticed that my friends were interested in the other masks. Autumn was looking over a mask that was plain silver, with no mouth and only a single eye free on the left side. Summer had an identical golden mask with only the eye on the right side free. Those masks represent two different sisters of the hanged king. One tried to kill the king, the other warned the king of murder. So he punished one sister by hanging her from the sky, turning her into the moon. And the other he rewarded by also hanging her, and she became the stars. Creepy, Autumn said, examining the inside of the mask. But fitting, Summer said, examining her mask from the front trying to see if there were any imperfections. Kel was looking over a mask that looked a lot like a classic plague mask, except it was all black and there were black feathers along the back of it, allowing him to look a lot more bird-like if he was to put the mask on. He was also wearing his arrow ace pin with pride on his shirt. Ah yes, the ambassador of Alagata. A very important role the most loyal subject of the king, one that is feared by all who he approaches. Though despite how dangerous he is, he is loyal to the king. Even at the end of the play, when the hang king ordered his death, the ambassador eagerly hung the king without a single objection, before then hanging himself. Some say he was even in love with the hanged king, Though, who is to say? And it was the final mask that Dylan held that was the strangest. It had a crown on top that he was expected to wear, but the mask was almost like a veil that descended around his head, surrounding his head like a wedding veil or like La Llorona's sheet. Even as a mask, he was holding in his hand, the mask gave me extremely ominous vibes. Unlike everything else so far, this actually felt like this might be a real threat to me. And that mask represents the Hanged King, a powerful tyrant that was so powerful he had to be tied to his throne. Even from his throne, unable to move, he manipulated others to do his bidding and had his loyal ambassador to do all that he wanted. And as he descended further and further into madness, he ordered the deaths of his sisters, then his people, then eventually ordered his own death and the death of his ambassador, leaving only one person in all of Alagata alive. Justin pointed towards me directly. His gesture? I asked, looking down at the gesture's mask. Now it felt more sinister, though now I understood why he wanted me to grab that specific mask. There was a part we were to play, and it had something to do with the tragedy of the Hanged King. It rang a bell somewhere in my mind, but I had no answer. Well, thank you so much, Justin. We will take good care of these masks. But I do have to ask, was there somewhere where we can buy backpacks? I think we're going to need them. I asked an Hebrew character again. Oh yeah, sure. Right over there, we, they have quite a few hiking backpacks and purses for sale. Thank you so much for your business. 
He said as we walked away, and we agreed to wait to put on the masks until we got a lot closer to the Hayfords. Well, Kel, do you think that everyone is aware of what is happening in a pataphysical way? No, they do not. Do you understand what is happening in a pataphysical way? No, I do not. Do you think I understand what is happening in a pataphysical way? No, you do not. What makes you say that? If you understood what was happening, you would have explained it to me as soon as I said I didn't understand it, and then I would be able to understand what is happening. But because you didn't explain once I said I didn't understand, that means you don't understand what is happening. I tilted my head as I turned to him, and then I turned to Fallen Grace as we exchanged the same look, saying, You would have to be really smart to be this dumb. How well do you understand pataphysical theory? I can spell pataphysical theory, he responded in a deadpan voice. I cannot tell if you're joking or not. That's not a joke. I can spell pataphysical theory. He responded, and I let out a sigh. Basically, there is a story within the story, and then there is a story around the story. You have a situation that is fantastical or supernatural in some way to draw attention, and then you have something relatable so people in the story can relate to the characters, or at least follow along, and then you have a lesson or even a theme. Not necessarily in a fable sort of way, but kind of like in a fable sort of way. Now imagine that you are a character in that fable. You know you're in a fable. You can control your actions. But you don't know what lesson you're going to learn is going to be. If you understand the lesson, then you can predict where it's going to go. But if you don't know the lesson, then you're stuck in a story where you will keep bouncing around so you finally fall on the right path but you don't know where the right path is. Oh, so it's like one of our labs in school. I don't follow. You know, there's a lesson. We know the class. We know that there's something we need to learn. But even if we're all given the same materials, we are learning something different to get to the same point. Some things come easier to others and some things come harder. Some people are learning things for the first time, others are relearning things. But no matter how much we understood before the lab, we are going to learn more in the lab. There will be a challenge for us, and we cannot predict what we need to study for, or even what to learn, because if we predicted everything before it was going to happen, then there would be something different to learn. So now we are in one of those learning labs. You're trying to apply old lessons to the new lesson, but because what is happening isn't exactly how it works in the old lessons, it is leaving you confused and now you wonder if you're not understanding things at all. However, you are understanding everything just fine. You just cannot predict what is going to happen because by predicting what is going to happen, it changes the outcome of what is going to happen. I finished for him, and I quietly wondered again, who the hell was Kel to grasp complex pataphysical theory and be able to sum it up, in, again, in an easy-to-understand way? I wonder if that has anything to do with the tragedy of the Hang King, I wondered out loud. What do you mean? Kel asked, while Fallen Grace flew over by... Dylan, Autumn, and Summer, while they talked about some of the costumes worn by the guests around us. Well, think about it this way. Tropes come from somewhere. Out of context, a trope can be simplistic or even easy to understand, such as there and back again. It's a story with tropes such as a main character being called to adventure by a wizard. He has a trait that helps everyone and that he himself didn't know that he had in the beginning of the story. Out of context, that has been done quite a lot. In context, he does things such as steal a magic ring, sneak by trolls, and escape from goblins, because his secret trait that he didn't know he had was being a burglar. Outside the context, the trope is easily understood. 
in context, though, there is a lot of dimension added to it. We have to sneak by monsters using disguises. We are given an ominous warning of a mask worn too long becomes the face. So clearly these masks will either possess us or change us in some way if they're on too long. However, when Justin references a story that none of us has even heard of, that means there's dimension and context to it. Context we don't know. Changes things like a MacGuffet into a Ring of Power. It turns star-crust lovers into Helen and Paris. Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar, all very different stories with very different twists and turns. So now, I don't know where this will go. I told Kel as I shook my head and looked down at my Harlequin mask. The weight was heavy, and I knew there was going to be a burden with it. But not knowing what that burden was, was heavier than the actual burden. I don't know where it's going either but that's a lot of the fun. Stories are fun because you can't always predict where they go. Part of the fun of going somewhere like a haunted house is because they're different each time. There's changes, actors trying new things, new scares are done, and they adjust it, often person to person. So all we can do is our best and have fun, and we will make it through. So don't try to predict what will happen next. And instead, just have fun with the next surprise, Kel said with some wisdom before he got immediately distracted. Ooh, they have green, he said as he grabbed the green backpack for himself. I smiled at his words and I grabbed a red and black checkered backpack for myself. And everyone except Fallen Grace grabbed a backpack. Nothing in your size? I asked her and she flipped me off again. Next time we're going to Grimsburg, she said, muttering to herself. Everyone was now prepared, so we made our way to the Hay Fort. The Hay Fort was at the northern edge of the countryside, and it also served as the entrance to the Hay Maze. The fort was four stories tall and surrounded by a half-meter deep moat that was full of jack-o'-lanterns. Each one lit and smiled up at us as we turned to each other. It was our last chance to sneak by the monsters. We need to be careful. When we no longer need the masks, we need to take them off. I told my friends and they nodded, all thinking the same thing that I was thinking. I looked down at my mask and I took a deep breath as I put it on my face and tied the straps underneath my hair. Kel put on his crow mask and it fit him well enough. He tilted his head and his voice sounded muffled underneath the mask. Autumn put on her silver mask, her voice unable to be heard from underneath the mask. Summer put on her golden mask and again her voice was muted, so we had to use sign and body language to communicate. It was Dylan's transformation that was the hardest to watch. Dylan was always nervous, he often had a hard time fitting in with everyone else, and he always protected his chest and he often fiddled with his ring. When the Hanged King's mask was put over his head, he stood up straight for the first time ever. I didn't realize he was so tall. I wasn't short, but now he towered over us all. He still spoke and he still sounded like himself, but his tone? He did not speak like a nervous undergrad. He spoke with power. Let's go, he said, and we followed. Falling Grace hidden in my shirt pocket as we headed into the hay fort. The first thing we noticed was that there were lights hidden in the hay to light it up, and we had two paths laid before us a sign pointing towards a direction that said truth, and one that said safe. Dylan held up one finger, then he pointed at me before pointing towards safe. It was obvious what he wanted me to do. I nodded as I crawled down the small path. As I crawled forward, I thought about my own thought process. 
I expected there to be a change I could feel, or at least notice. But as far as I could tell, nothing changed in my thought process. My actions were still my own, and every thought fit my own patterns. So that either meant that the mask was exerting a subtle kind of control, even more subtle than I could detect, which is terrifying, or the mask was just a mask, which is far more terrifying. I exited out of the path marked safe into another part of the countryside. It was isolated from everything else, but just like the rest of the countryside, it had food trucks, booths with face painting, plenty of drinks, and even stands for pictures to be taken. The difference? It was full of parents and their children. I could see it was full of normal children and parents running around. Clearly, there was no dark secret here. They just had a separate section just for the parents and the children. A part that is completely separate from the story arc where the children could have fun in peace. After a moment, my friends joined me and we were in agreement. There was no danger here. The children were safe. We were about to head back into the hay fort when I felt Fallen Grace squirm in my pocket. Look again. It isn't right. She whispered and I turned and again... Everything was completely normal, but still, she kept insisting, so I decided to look again. I opened up some of my senses, and that was when I realized I was still wearing the mask. For some reason, it was restricting my ability to see things, and I very carefully removed my mask, and I looked again as I peeked through without the jester's mask on. The park was a lot darker without the mask on. I could see that the stalls were overturned and there laid many bodies on the ground. In front of me, only a meter away, was the broken doll. Her head was twisted around completely. Her face was half burned, leaving only a single eye left in her head. Her hair was half ripped out and the other half was tangled up. Her clothes were torn and coated in bloody mud. Her legs were bent the wrong way, and her left arm was draped over a bundle in the mud. Her right arm was nowhere to be seen. The doll was not a doll. The enemy had made it here, and we had to leave immediately. Get back to the hay fort. This place is gone, I told everyone as I put my mask back on and we quickly crawled back into the hay fort. Now we only had one more path to go. Proof. As we crawled back in the hay fort, I noticed something we didn't see before. Underneath the dirt in the hay was a single mirror on the ground, so when we crawled, we had no choice but to see ourselves as we made our way forward. In the reflection, I couldn't see the jester's mask, just my own face smiling back when I was definitely not smiling. Mark's truth did not require crawling, but on the hay walls there were mirrors all over the hay, randomly interspaced so every once in a while you turn a corner and then see your own reflection, except it isn't your face you see, you see the mask you wear. We traveled in near silence as we made our way deeper into the hay maze. We expected fear and scares, but we did not expect that. It was like a war zone, and now here we were in the hay maze trying to find the crossroads. This was tougher than the corn maze. There we could head into the corn. And here there were hay to our sides, hay above us, and hay below us. When we made one right turn, we found stairs made of, out of hay, heading up, path to the right, and a way forward. Where do we go? Dylan asked me, and I looked at our choices. Forward led deeper into the darkness that I couldn't see if it turned or if it kept going forward. The path to the right, which immediately turned right again, so it would either lead to a dead end, or it would be non-Euclidean because we would have seen it. 
up the stairs led to a more of the three-dimensional hay maze. And of course, there was the way we came from, but we know that isn't the way out because that was the way we came from. Wait, there were four different ways to go. We can go up, forward, right, or the way we came. We found the crossroads. We found the crossroads. We just have to find the fifth way and we found our way out. I said excitedly, and we all started to examine the hay walls around us. There was dirt on the ground. There was hay all around us. And nothing else, not even a mirror. But once again, Fallen Grace squirmed as she said, Right there, right there, underneath the stairs, there's another stairway heading down. She said, pointing where I could only see dirt. Trusting Fallen Grace, I motioned for the others to also take off their masks, and sure enough, with our masks off, we could see that there was another stairway that led down, made out of wooden planks, that we could see that there was another tunnel down. Come on, we keep the masks off, we have another test. He said as I put the jester's mask away inside my backpack, as I traveled down the stairs. Each step echoed through the earthen tunnel as we made our way forward with myself leading. Each step forward in the darkness, I felt fear try to creep in, so I had to keep myself brave. I only knew one way to do so. Deep breath in, deep breath out. In the darkness, my hair changed length. Deep breath in, deep breath out. My skin itches underneath my jacket that I forgot I was wearing. Deep breath in, deep breath out. My fear is deep inside of myself as I step forward into the light as Red Prince and Mark Pierce is deep inside of myself. As I step into the light, the first monster steps forward into the light in front of me. It stood even taller than Dylan. The high shoulder collar was red, while most of the outfit was black and very formal. In one hand, they carried an axe, and in the other, a long whip made out of a human spine. And they had no head on their shoulders at all. Our first monster we had to convince that we were a monster was a Dulahan, a headless horseman that was powerful enough that if it said our name, it would kill us, and if it stopped moving, someone would die. One that drove a death coach made from human skin and bone, whose horse was just as headless as him and just as deadly, even among the many terrifying fave Hibernaria, Dulahan was uniquely horrible, being nearly impossible to defeat, only able to be scared off with gold. However, gold was not something I had, and scaring off the horseman wasn't the same thing as getting past him. We had to convince him that we were monsters ourselves while we had no masks on. I had to play this very carefully. May we please pass? I asked the monster politely. No fear in my heart, no hesitation in my voice, and no doubt in my eyes. I spoke with politeness, but in a tone that made it clear, I expected politeness from the Dulahan as well. The Dulahan did not hesitate before stepping to the side for us. Being polite, but acting as we belonged, was the secret here. If we acted in fear, or even doubt, that would have caused the Dulahan to sense that we didn't belong. By acting like we belonged, it allowed us to belong. As I passed, I saw the Dulahan's head sit on a shelf. The head blinked and whispered to me as I passed by. It's good to see you again, Red. We all missed you. He whispered in my ear as I passed by into the darkness, and my friends followed. The first test passed, trying to act tougher than the Dulahan or even try to intimidate it, 
would fail embarrassingly, and it would reveal the fact that you don't belong. When you get to beings as powerful as the Dullahan, they don't need to act tough. They don't need to intimidate. The only people who weren't afraid were the idiotic, or those that belonged. We continued down the darkness when another figure appeared from the darkness, stepping beneath a single incandescent bulb. The woman wore a paper surgical mask over her mouth, but it was not quite big enough to cover the rips in her cheeks, making her mouth a permanent smile. Even with her hands free, I knew she was still armed. She was very popular in Nippon, but she also was well known here. Often asking a single riddle that if answered wrong, she would either kill or she would make her foe go match her face. I will have three questions for each of you. Answer them correctly to go on. Only a monster could answer these questions correctly. So know that even if one of you gets a single question wrong, that all of you may not pass. The woman said as she pointed at Dylan first. What is your quest to find the center of the pumpkin house? What is a skeleton's favorite snack? Spare ribs. I have a name, but it isn't mine. You don't think about me while in your prime. People cry when I'm in their sight. Others lie with me all day and night. What am I? A tombstone, Dylan answered quickly. And the woman nodded as she removed a knife from her pocket to play with in her hands. Very well. Now you. She pointed directly at Fallen Grace, who left my pocket to start flying now that we made it past the hay fort. What grows stronger when hope gets weaker? Despair. What rises when the sun goes down? The moon. How do you spell candy in two letters? Fallen Grace thought for a moment before she smiled and answered, C and Y. Fallen Grace and the woman both giggled like they were sharing an inside joke. And after the chuckle was over, she pointed over to Autumn. The more I grow, the smaller I get. What am I? A candle. What can be touched but cannot be seen? A person's heart. Do you trust me? She asked Autumn, who paused before she answered. No. Somehow, beneath the paper mask, the woman smiled even wider. But then she turned to Summer. The shorter I am, the bigger I am. What am I? A temper. What can be seen but cannot be touched? A shadow. Do you trust me? Now it was Summer's turn to pause before she answered. Yes. This also made the woman smile wide, and I could tell from both Autumn and Summer's expression that they weren't trusting each other right now as the woman turned to Kel. What is a crime that no judge can forgive? Killing the judge. What are you? According to my father, a son of a bitch. According to my mother, a son of a bastard. So I guess that makes me a bastitch. What is the average airspeed velocity of an unburdened European swallow? 32.4 kilometers per hour or 9 meters per second. Kel answered with ease, and the woman put her knife away and just stared more at Kel. Seriously, what are you? What questions is too many? That wasn't our deal. Kel said as she sighed and she turned to her last victim. Myself. And I could tell from the twinkle in her that she was not planning on making it easy for me. To all things and men I appertain, and yet by some am shunned and disdained. Fondle and ogle me till you're insane. No blow can harm me, cause me pain. Children delight in me, elders take fright, fair maids rejoice and spin. Cry and I weep, 
Yawn and I sleep. Smile and I shall grin, she said, and it bounced around in my head for a moment. After a moment, I remembered a story with the same riddle, and then the answer came to me. You are a mirror, or more accurately, a reflection, I said, and her smile dropped for a moment just for a moment, and somehow her lack of a smile was even worse than having a smile, before it returned and she had another question. Rise and fall every day. My face is as pale as bone, red as blood, and as dark as night. I am reliable as time and as fickle as shadow. You can search for me all day and never find a trace. Yet you shut off the light and you will gaze on my face. What am I? The woman asked, her knife shining in the darkness. At first I wanted to answer knife, since it could be pale, red, or dark. Except something caused me to stop. Knives aren't inherently reliable and they don't hide during the day. Something as reliable as time and as fickle as shadow. Gaze on a face in darkness but not seen in daylight? Oh, of course, the answer is obvious now. The moon, I told her, and her smile was now a frown. I could hear in her voice, and I could see in her eyes. She was not expecting me to answer it correctly. Everyone else, she was smiling, except Kel. She was just confused with Kel, but to be fair, that was his normal state of being, being a force that confused all who surrounded him. She was treating me like I was a threat, and that only meant she would try and find any fault in me. Your final question, the one everyone is able to answer. What is your name? She asked me, and my heart nearly stopped. In this form I was in right now, I am Red Prince. An easy answer, but inside of myself I could feel doubt blossom inside of me. Doubt called Marceline Pierce. I wanted to ignore her, but that would be ignoring myself and her own wisdom. As the struggle played inside of myself, I could see the woman's smile start to return. She had me. She was certain. She was just giving me enough time to struggle so she could savor it. I wouldn't let her savor my struggle. I opened my mouth to speak when Marceline's voice screamed in my head, Stop. That's what she wants. Don't rush the answer. Let us answer together, not apart. She said in my voice, and I spoke in the dim light. My name is Red Prince, detective of River City. I said in confidence in the dim light as the woman lunged forward in the darkness towards me, only for me to step aside as she plunged her knife into the earthen wall, while I changed in the darkness. In the darkness, my hair grew again and my jacket disappeared as the last of the red prints slid back into myself. I stepped back into the light with long hair and my makeup returned. I am Marceline Pierce, I said simply as the woman silently cussed to herself. You may all go forward. Be warned, the last of us is the hardest to fool. So if you are not a monster, you cannot go past them. And I promise you that it will be even tougher than naming yourself. The woman promised as she slid into the dark, taking her knife with herself. We continued forward into the maze where there was a dead end. And when there, I heard confusion ahead as I made my, my way through the friend group. When I made it to the front, I saw the dead end was in a full length mirror underneath an incandescent bulb. Inside the mirror was just myself, my own reflection. At first, I was confused. I was expecting a monster inside the mirror, not a plain mirror, but then I made the connection. 
I saw the glint in the reflection's eye and a slight smile on her lips that wasn't my own. Oh, the final test. We are the third monsters. That's why it's impossible for anyone who isn't a monster to bypass it. Because if anyone is lying about being a monster, then they cannot fool themselves. You can lie to others, but lying to yourself is a lot harder. So it's a good thing that we made it here, I said before the reflection started laughing. <laughs> you sure have had it all figured out, haven't you? Just like you figured out that the masks will possess you, only to later realize they just change how the world looks around you. How someone like you would make it this far, I will never know. The reflection said, and I just shrugged. Playing a very dangerous game, but knowing I had to play it pataphysically. I saw the fact that the reflection in all the mirrors didn't quite match, and the fact it didn't reflect our masks, but if I let it think I didn't understand, then I would make it through. Okay, so you aren't what I thought, but we are still monsters. May we please pass through? I asked the monster in the mirror who only chuckled in my voice. What monsters? I see no fangs, no claws, no scars. Nothing that tells me you're monsters. I just see six scared children who deserve to wait in safety in the countryside, where the children are safe. The monster said, and I only shook my head. We are monsters. We saw what happened to the children without masks on our faces. We saw the truth rather than safety. What does that make us in your eyes? I asked the reflection, who only nodded. The mirror moved as we were allowed to pass, stepping out of the darkness into the tunnels and into the twilight of the rail yard. As we made it through, Falling Brace asked me, I don't get it. If we aren't monsters in his eyes, why does choosing truth over safety allow us to continue? What does that make us if we're not monsters? It makes us heroes. Heroes who get to continue on their journey. Five friends sit around the table. They are all unique as they are similar and only in ways that they have never considered. The voice that spoke about the countryside pauses her story. She walks around the table. The dragon blood candle no longer burns, and the one who brought it is now gone. There is silence among the friends. Excitement and fear fills them all. The ritual is happening exactly the way it should be but the reassurance that things are happening the way they're supposed to doesn't make the situation less anxious. Things can go exactly according to plan and still be a dangerous plan. A hand rests on the friend's shoulders, all of their shoulders at the same time. To Dylan, it feels familiar, the same hands as of his grandfather, a hand that was calloused and tired, but it had a lot of strength. A familiar ring rests on his right hand, identical to the ring on Dylan's right hand. Dylan smiles, comforted by this presence. Autumn feels her sister's parents' hands on her shoulders. The hands on her shoulders are soft as a summer breeze and as hot as a firestorm. The hands that know a lot of strength and power, but are also strong enough to be gentle. She knows these hands well, but in a way, it is always a bit uncomfortable to have them on her shoulders. They're supposed to be her parents too, but even if they're related by blood, her sister's parents never quite felt like her own parents. More like kind strangers that she sees every day. Summer feels her sister's parents' hands on her shoulders. The hands are icy and freezing. Practically skeletal and deadly. The hands are fragile, so brittle and traitorous they may shatter just by touching her skin. A type of weakness where it was just weak enough to be a threat, eager to strike the moment it senses weakness. The cold touch that always makes Summer's skin crawl, 
frostbitten and biting into her skin as her breath froze underneath the cold touch. Careful to breathe cautiously enough to avoid angering the hands on her shoulders. No matter how many times those hands touched her, she would always be frightened of them. Bell feels a small hand on his shoulder. Cold, clammy, lifeless. The hand of his brother. He smiles, feeling the small hand on his back, and he is comforted by all of the warm times that came with those cold, clammy hands. The amount of good in his life is thanks to his brother, but he is okay just listening and feeling the small hand on his shoulder. It is good to know his brother is with him now. Many people would find a reminder of their dead sibling as a dark memory, or at least bittersweet. But in Kel's eyes, those cold hands would always be a comfort, and he was glad to be listening with his brother at his back. As for Fallen Grace, hers was the strangest. She was expecting to feel her father's hand on her shoulders, or even her ex-friend Manic Dream grasping at her shoulders, and she tensed in anticipation. Instead, she felt a very delicate pressure on her shoulder. Her shoulder slightly untensed, not sure if it was a trick or something unfamiliar, but no trick, just a very delicate pressure on her left shoulder, a touch that she never felt in her life, but one that she felt she was missing her entire life. So much love and such a small touch, one that is delicate, not because she's delicate, but because it wanted to be delicate. She wanted to lift her hand to the pressure, and her hand twitched, only to feel a slight twitch. A bit of hair of her hair pulled back behind her ear, and Fallen Grace got the message. Not yet. Friends listened as they now smelled the caramel candle, listening to the voices behind them whispering in their ears. All but one of them recognized the voices behind them. All of them heard a unique voice, but all of the voices spoke as one. And all told the same story in the flickering candlelight as the next treat vanished. Fallen Grace hears the voice whisper softly in her ear, and she feels her heart ache in a way she didn't know her heart could ache. She's missing someone she's never met, and already she knows that she is out there somewhere. She listens raptly to the story as the candles flicker. Four friends remain. Two observers watch, both unseen but felt by all. The rail yard used to connect all places. After the event, it went from the lifeblood to the Empire to the lifeline of the Empire. Massive, marvelous machines still worked in the rail yard. Machines to fix trains, machines to provide power, machines to lift crates into and out of trains, and of course the factories to make all of the manufactured items. The factories still run almost nonstop, trying to make just a little more for the countryside, for the city collapses entirely. There are still survivors, still people who need to be saved from the event. The machines in the factories are dangerous, but it's the only way to get out of the rail yard is to sneak by them safely. And even though the rail yard is safer than the mine in the city, it isn't safe. The enemy has made their way to the rail yard, and they have begun to adapt machines to themselves. It takes time, and it takes patience, but they are merging with the machines. In some of the warehouses, you might find lights that are overgrown with flesh. The wires are replaced by blood vessels, where the workers are now the enemy, hide permanently into where they work, connecting metal to flesh that they pull from their own bodies, where if a body rolls down the assembly line, it is disassembled for parts, but it isn't allowed to die. The parts are kept by the workers until it is needed. 
If you are quiet, you may sneak by them. The workers care about their work and will harm anyone who tries to stop them. It isn't the workers you should worry about, but the overseers. Constructed out of metal and recycled flesh of the fallen enemy, overseers wander with whips made of spine and rust, eager to harm anyone who comes near them. Their eyes are mechanical, electronic flesh and amalgam. Nothing escapes their eyes. Whatever they choose to watch is something they can see. If they can see you, they can hurt you. Lumbering under a ton of flesh and metal, they will eviscerate a human in a single blow. And when they do, they will use your flesh in the factory and not even give you the dignity of death. The best way to avoid their eyes and their ire is to draw their attention somewhere else with a powerful distraction. If you escape the factory, you may find many other wandering beasts and creatures that now prowl the rail yard. You can see the enemy that used to be human or maybe animals before they drank the mutagenic water. A few have drank so much that they mer have merged with other living things into a massive, monstrous mutation. These shambling remains are made mad from the merged minds between human and beast, creatures in agony that seek to end their own agony and to spread it among others. If you see faces or voices you recognize, you need to keep moving. These shambling remains seek to spread their agony. They may not move quickly, but they have mutated the means to spit the brackish mutagen out of their bodies onto anyone who is nearby. You may find friendly monsters nearby, but most are busy. And if they know your end goal, they would do everything in their power to stop you from reaching your goal. There is a trick to using the rail yard to get closer to the city. If you go after the trains that are the most modern and the most powerful, they will not let you on board. Even if they think you're a monster, they're too busy evacuating humanity from the city. The monsters here are not so easily tricked, and they will fight other monsters to keep humanity safe. The biggest train they use is a massive train that can travel to the city and back in mere minutes. A massive goliath by the name of Skid Blood Near. So named because it can travel anywhere, and it will always reach its destination safely, and it can be safely disassembled when not in use. A useful trick when you are pursued by the enemy. You may be tempted to try the old train, more museum pieces than vehicles, but they still work, so surely you can use them in your mission to make it to the city. Except, the old trains have been taken over by the enemy, many of them disassembled and merged into the largest train, a massive behemoth that can travel on the tracks, or it can get up and walk away from the tracks. A terrifying, tyrannical titan of the tracks, the Dreadnought, so named because no weapon can destroy it and any who try to fight it will die trying. The Dreadnought is made from metal, flesh, machine, man, monster, and might. The Dreadnought patrols the tracks, and if you hear the screech of metal and mouth, hide. The Dreadnought hungers, and it cannot tell the difference between metal and flesh, nor does it care. It only cares about feeding and carrying more of the enemy from the city to the rail yard. If you see eyes of glass, the smokestack of bone, the teeth made from railroad spikes, and a cattle guard made from tongue, you know the Dreadnought nears. The Dreadnought is the greatest danger of the rail yard and makes most of the tracks dangerous to leave on. So if you want to escape safely, you'll need to get creative. 
there is a single track overgrown with weeds and grass. It isn't noticed by most, most, and the enemy will not think to use it because the track doesn't lead to the city. Not directly, at least. It leads to a small and remote radio station, one that transmits music, directions, and hope from the countryside to the city. This thin connection can only be reached by a very small train that connects the two. The train is so small that it only has an engine and a single car. A train by the name of Broad Bottom Bucket. The engineer on the train will ask for a favor in exchange for their service to reach the radio station. The engineer is a skeletal figure, one who has candles in their eyes, small tea candles, and maybe there is something familiar about the engineer to one of you. What the favor the engineer may ask will vary wildly. He may ask for you to help conduct his train. He may ask for you to obtain fuel for his engine. He may ask you a riddle. Or he may only ask for you to have a good trip to the radio station. Whatever the engineer asks from you, you will have to provide. Despite his thin frame and lack of muscles, he is plenty strong enough to throw you from the train down the tracks where you will never be found. The tracks to the radio station are often called the never found tracks. Not just because the tracks are hard to find, but if you're not on the broad bottom bucket, you will never be found. Not alive, not dead, not in between, not in pieces, and not whole. You are simply never found. Whatever fate lies on the never found tracks is wholly unknown, but it is fairly certain that it will not be pleasant. But if you can keep your hopes up and looking forward, you can see the radio station ahead, transmitting the message of hope. As long as you keep looking forward, you'll hear the sound of music and stories of heroism. As long as you keep looking forward, you'll know that there is a stop for the broad bottom bucket, and that you are led away from the known dangers of the rail yards, over the unknown dangers of the never found tracks, to the safety of the radio station. As long as you keep looking forward, you won't have to spare a single thought about the rail yard, nor everyone you left behind. If you look backwards, though, keep looking forward and you won't have to find out. When we made it to the rail yard, the first thing that struck me about this park was the smell. I had been to many places that smelled before. Abandoned buildings, literal toxic waste dumps, slaughterhouses, even factories, and real rail yards. The rail yard of the pumpkin house had none of that smell. It smelled like metal, sure. There was even the burning smell of rust and iron that it was functionally allergic to, but otherwise it smelled clean. No human waste, no smoke, no coal, no oil, no trash, not even the smell of food and grease. I know they couldn't actually make a place that smelled like an actual rail yard, but still, it broke the immersion for me some. We stepped out from the tunnel onto a wooden boardwalk. Around us were more wooden walls with painted doors, but only one way to go. Forward. Can you check ahead, Grace? Autumn asked me, and I responded by raising my right fist at her and with one finger raised, for I quickly raced ahead to check. Yeah, of course, they asked me to check first. I'm the smallest, so I'm the least likely to be seen. But that also means that I was always asked to go first. Yeah, it made sense, but it still pissed me off. It was automatically my chore because I was the best at it. Don't they see how unfair it all was? It would be like if I always asked Marceline to get takeout because she was the best at dealing with humans. 
or if I always asked Dylan to lift the heavy boxes because he was the strongest. Yeah, we all have things we're best at, but just because I was good at something didn't mean that I wanted to do it, or even that I had to do it all the time. So, a single finger salute as I scouted ahead. Just ahead of us, there was a T-junction. The path to the right had a sign that helpfully marked factories, while the sign to the left said countryside. I guess to give people a way back if they had enough. Still, even as I looked around, I didn't see anything that would slow us down. So I turned in midair and started to fly back, only for me to immediately fly into a web. Ah, Tavit, I cursed, as I pushed strands out of my face to see if the webs were real or fake. Sure enough, judging by how strong and transparent the strands were, they were real. For most humans, walking into a web may be a terrifying experience, but at least they're usually big enough to tear through the webs and swat away the spiders. At my size, however, spiders could be a genuine threat. At 18 centimeters tall, I had seen spiders both a lot smaller than me and also a lot larger than me. Struggling on the web, I saw a spider crawl from the corner of her web towards me. She had long yellow and black striped legs, and she crawled slowly towards me, with small claws on the tip of her legs grabbing strands of web that didn't have droplets of stickiness. Stop, let me go, and we can forget this happened, I told the spider in her language. Another gift from my father, a useful one, but not one that I enjoyed. I can speak any language on earth, even animals, plants, and insects. It did not guarantee that they would listen. Spiders aren't real talkative. They don't have vocal cords. They usually communicate by clicking their mandibles and by movement. Convey simple ideas like food, mating, and danger. So I guess it would be more accurate to say I was clicking in such a way that she could understand my intent. However, in most situations, it was just easier to say I can speak spider than to say I could make noises that spiders could understand intent, like a Lovecraftian god speaking to a lesser being conveying ideals that never occurred in their tiny minds before. Food on the web. Food struggles, she said back as she crawled closer. She was a very large and very beautiful spider, as long from end to end as I was tall. She would be a danger to most fairies and to almost anything in her web. Almost anything. Although judging by her response, the orb weaver spider wasn't a part of the pumpkin house. She was a genuine spider who genuinely thought that I was her food. That would make this next part both easier and harder. As I leaned forward in her web and used my flight as leverage to pull against her web, under normal circumstances, the silk would have gummed up my wings, where my jugum met my back, or maybe even gum up the space between my wings, causing my fragile material to tear if I pulled too much. Normal circumstances. I was far from a normal fairy, and these were not normal circumstances. My skin, muscle, and membranes were far stronger than that of a human far larger than myself. So a simple flap of my wings tore off the web, and I was free from the web where I could see myself reflecting in the spider's eight eyes. As I pulled her away, I could feel her disappointment. She lost her food, and she had to reweave her web. Should have let me go, I told her, as I pulled the silk off my skin and peeled it off the membranes of my wings. Up close to my wings, I could see the delicate black veins inside the wings that gave it the patterns and lines inside the wing. When light passed through the membranes, it gave a rainbow pattern for those below me. Something truly beautiful from my dragonfly-like wings from my back. However, the patterns generated through the wings were actually from my membranes and blood vessels in my wings. I was not too shy to remind people who complimented my wings for being beautiful 
that they were actually calling my black veins and transparent chitin beautiful. That it was the blood inside my body that made the rainbow and bright colors shine through. There was definitely something beautiful there, that the symbol of purity people associated with fairy purity was actually made possible through armor and blood. Still distracted by my thoughts, I made my way back to the group where Autumn, clearly, was looking impatient while Marceline only smirked. Autumn thought that she understood Faye and that meant she understood fairies and, by extension, me. This understanding might come in handy sometimes, but that often meant she stopped seeing me as Fallen Grace, the individual, and instead saw me as Fallen Grace, the trans Florian fairy. Well, there's two signs. One points that way, the other points the other way. I said unhelpfully, which caused a sigh from Autumn as she tried phrasing it in a better way to try and get me to respond in a way she could benefit. What is on the signs? Words and arrows. What do the words say? They say what the arrows are pointing towards. What are the arrows pointing towards? This way and that way. I said unhelpfully, starting the cycle over again, as Autumn took an exasperated sigh as she stomped forward to make her way to the T-junction. The left pointed back to the countryside and the right towards the factories. I vote we head to the factories, we have to make it to the center of the pumpkin house, and the factories are how we do that. I reminded the group while most people nodded. Autumn tapped her chin, trying to figure out if what I said was true or a lie. After a moment, she finally agreed to just go with everyone else. This night was going to be a long night if she was going to treat me like some winter court trickster instead of as an individual. The path leading forward was quite interesting. The walls were covered in graffiti that reminded me of the graffiti in post-apocalypse games and shows. I saw a dead sun painted on a few different walls pointing towards the story about the vampire star. I saw graffiti that said not to trust the symbols, and symbols warning of body changing mutation, hobo signs marking danger, even a few radiation and, and biohazard symbols. But one door we passed made me pause. I floated in the air, looking at the door as I felt a chill crawl up my spine. It was a simple chained shut door. There were no symbols on the door, and the door was clearly a real door that could be accessed, but it was not meant for the public to be accessed. Maybe it was an employee-only door. However, I had a strong feeling that wasn't the case. Sometimes you just know a door leads down a bad path. Somewhere that isn't meant for anyone to go down. Something so dangerous that your own curiosity is overridden by a sense of danger. What was it about that door that convinced me it was not meant to be entered? A single stenciled sentence in white over the black door. This is not a place of honor. A single sentence, a single line from a poem that everyone on the planet knew. A single line from a poem that was meant to be shared down the centuries. A line that is meant to convey the fact that the environment is poisoned, toxic, or radioactive. A danger that even a powerful civilization could not stop, only contain. At first, Marceline paused to see me admire the door, and before she could ask what it was about the door, I spoke. This is not a place of honor, I told her, and she nodded before we turned and kept going down the route before Summer asked. What does that mean, this is not a place of honor, she asked, and I explained the best I could. It's a warning meant to endure throughout the centuries, a warning of danger that is so deadly it will endure through thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of years. So long that the old languages, symbols, and even the warning itself will be lost throughout the centuries. 
Old symbols of danger can be used to become symbols of jest, such as the Jolly Roger, trefoil, and the biohazard symbols are used widely in fiction, so most people recognize it. However, it is also used in fictional settings, such as the one we are in, so in a few centuries, how will they tell the difference between a hazard made in jest versus an actual hazard? So, these lines are used to endure. They are told in stories that are meant to endure. Some stories in our history predate the time of Ash, and some go as far back as the Mesozoic era. So, some stories are used to reinforce the danger. A reminder that the line, this place is not a place of honor, is not something meant to be explored. It isn't a dungeon to don conquer. It isn't a mountain full of dragon gold. It isn't a pirate's treasure to find. It isn't something that is scribbled on a wall by artists being edgy. It isn't something that will come up by mistake. It is a singular warning, and one I will not ignore. I said with confidence, and Autumn only chuckled. <laughs> I thought there was nothing that scared the unshakable fallen grace. Aren't you supposed to be able to handle every challenge that comes your way? Autumn asked, and I bristled in anger. The unspoken part of that was, isn't your kind supposed to handle every challenge? calling me a coward for listening to a danger. Whether that was her intent or not, she was calling me a coward, and she thought the danger wasn't real. There was a real temptation to tell her to try the door then, but even I'm not a murderer. The reason I'm able to handle everything that comes my way is because I know what to face and what battles to fight. I will never enter a place that is marked as not a place of honor. It is an even greater danger than elsewhere. I will face judgment, the sunless lands, and even the bridge of trials before I ever enter a place marked as that. He said as I turned away from the door and flew forward. Why? It can't possibly be bad as judgment, can it? Autumn asked as her sister grabbed her shoulder and started to pull her along. It's worse than judgment. You can win judgment. You cannot win against a place like that. So, we will continue. Let us fight something that is much easier to, for us to handle, such as abominations of steel, mutation, and cancer. I said as the path led to a single metal door that had a sign over it. The King's Factory. However, the word King's was crossed out, so the only thing left was the factory. When I saw that line, I let out a chuckle when I got it. I looked around and no one else really seemed to get it, except maybe Kel, who saw the name and he started to chuckle. The factory, he said as he laughed, and I laughed along with him. Everyone else only stared at us like we were insane before, after a moment, it was over, and we decided to continue. Marceline stared at me like I was insane, and Dylan stared at Kel like he wasn't making sense. Yes, the factory. Is it an in-joke that we're not going to get? He asked before Kel tried to explain. The king's factory? Moloch? The king is Moloch? The factory representing the darkest aspects of industrializations, where the workers, the customers, and the managers are all in a deep ritual of bloodletting, sacrifice, deconstruction, and construction, where it was a danger to humanity and its very existence creates wonderful products, but it comes at the cost of blood and humanity. It was very metaphor made real, Hell tried to explain, and I nodded since I knew that story, but apparently no one else did. Well, it sounds interesting, but how does that help us? Dylan asked, and Kel shrugged. I have no idea. But let's go and be careful. As the door opened, I felt a chill fill my heart. An old evil, an old darkness inside of me that I thought I had conquered, was rising a bit inside of me. Part of me that understood what that door meant when it said it wasn't a place of honor. 
but still wanted me to sneak underneath the door without telling anyone. To simply disappear from the world and let my pain disappear. I flew over to Marceline's shoulder and I hugged her neck. Her warmth and heartbeat filled my ears. It was a quiet, unspoken thing to us. Despite how tough and strong I put on my exterior, even when I had bad moments, a darkness I called my bad thoughts. She knew I sought comfort when I sat on her shoulder like this. Something about what Autumn said hurt something deep inside of my heart. A precious brick pulled down that made me feel like I was truly nothing. Something that wasn't real and could simply disappear without being noticed. It's a good thing the slashed woman didn't ask me what is a crime no judge could forgive. I tried joking to myself, but it only made me want to cry. Despite my best efforts, small things reminded me of the darkness. The coldness inside my heart made the cold air inside of the factory feel positively warm. I could feel Marceline shiver as all I could do was focus on breathing. At that moment, all I could focus on was my own breathing as we went into the factory. Why is it always something like this? Something happens and I think I handled it. Then it just comes back like a snake that you think is dead, but it can still bite. Why did it have to be that door? Why did Autumn have to fucking say that? I took a deep breath and I opened my eyes that I didn't realize I had screwed shut when I saw the factory floor below. On the assembly line, I see people attached to the assembly line, working on strange clockwork devices made from bone and steel. The steel was rusted and the bones were yellow with age. The device is breaking before it reached the end of the assembly line. They didn't care about the quality of the device once it was beyond them. They only cared that their part was done, hating those before them for breaking the devices, not caring about those down the assembly line they were making the work harder for. They were tied to the assembly line by tubes, wires, and the substances inside. I could see tubes carrying blood down to them, and another tube removing blood from them, carried above. My eyes followed the lines above, and I saw a giant mechanical heart. Beers whirred, pumps churned, and red fluid pumped through the glass vials along with gray water. I guess was the mutagen. We had to get by the workers, and that shouldn't be too hard. We can stay on the catwalks above, and we can get to the door on the other side, Autumn said, pointing the way forward, which had more catwalks in a grid pattern in a door at the far end. Almost like a game board, where you have to move forward in a careful way without getting caught by something on adjacent pieces. We should watch out for the overseers. We haven't seen them, but they're supposed to be around here. Kel warned us, and Autumn kept pointing forward. We don't need to worry about the overseers. We already know that Adonsi lies. The warning about a mask worn too long becoming the face was completely false. So we know that she is lying, Autumn said before her sister corrected her. I don't think it was a lie. I think we understood misunderstood what she meant by face. Masks kept us from seeing what was actually around us, so by pretending to be something else, we can't actually face what is out there. The mask changes what we face until the illusion becomes true. So if she isn't lying but we misunderstood, we have to assume the overseers are real. If we're wrong and they aren't real, then there's no threat. But if we assume there is no threat, what happens if we are wrong? Summer offered while Autumn shook her head. Look, you don't know these things as well as I do. If Adonsi lied before, she's lying now. There is no way we misunderstood what Adonsi said. We just have to go through this area and we will be free, Autumn said as she confidently strode forward on the catwalks, taking the quickest route to the exit. Something is wrong here. I warned Marceline, who nodded for a moment before we followed after Autumn, in a much more cautious way. 
I flew away from Marceline's shoulder, looking around the catwalks. There was a lot of iron and rust, and it was harsh enough that I felt like I was surrounded by danger. It was like walking around a park that was full of poison ivy. You know it's there, and you want to avoid it, so you pay careful attention to it, it to try and avoid it. However, I was paying so much attention to the present danger that I did not notice what reached out from the darkness above and grabbed me. I let out a scream when I was grabbed. The iron felt like it was, was holding a too hot mug. My body wanted to flinch away, but I was captured and held in iron claws that wrapped around my torso as I was pulled up into the darkness. Below me, I could see my friends wander forward, not realizing I was gone. Help! I tried to scream, only to have a, another iron claw wrap around my mouth like a vice. The heat of the iron felt like it was making my skin blister under the touch. When I tried to open my mouth, the rust and iron made my mouth taste like blood. What the hell? When did the pumpkin house add threats like these? The Doncy was always so careful to make sure there was no real danger, and here I was pulled away into the darkness with metal that was harming me just by touching me. Pulled away from the light, I was suspended in darkness until I saw another light. It started alone, but then another light appeared, and then another. Soon, eight different points of light were in the darkness, all shining on me like spotlights. And as my eyes adjusted, I realized the lights weren't lights. They were eyes. The eyes of the overseer who had captured me. I couldn't easily see the rest of the face, but I could see gears, teeth, and open wounds that dripped blood and gray water down into, onto the distant factory floor below. The overseer was equal parts machine and flesh, but they definitely weren't living. Not anymore. Somewhere in the darkness, there was rattling as something was drawn forward into the light. A cage carried by a hook. I screamed again into the iron gag, not caring about the blood filling my mouth. The overseer would not let me scream. I would still scream. I was dropped into the cage. The restraints on my torso let me go, but iron shackles remained on my arms, keeping me from flying as the top of the cage shut. It was so much worse being in the cage than being in restraints. The cage was rusty, and the edges of each bar was so sharp, even so even if I touched the bars, I would be cut by it and getting rust and iron into my blood. You fucking bastard, why are you doing this? I asked, lifting up my hands to try and flip off the many eyes of the overseer. This drew no reaction from the eight spotlight eyes. The overseer still stared at me, and the gears still ground, and the blood and gray eye core dripped from the overseer into the iron heart below. My friends are too far away to see and too far away to hear. I would have to escape from this place myself. I turned from the eyes to try and see if I could find a lock or maybe a gate on my cage. There was no gate, nor a lock. The cage appeared to be welded closed, even above. But when I did look away, the eyes started rolling like they were ball bearings, as they now focused on my face. No matter where I turned, I would find myself facing the eyes. If I tried looking directly up, the eyes would roll up there to look down at me. If I tried looking down at the rusty floor, the eye would roll below the cage at an angle, so even there I couldn't escape. The stairs of the overseer. Maybe my friends will come back for me, but they don't tend to look up and I would definitely not be able to call out for them. I was stuck here, and I would not be able to use them to escape. 
Eventually, they would move on to get to the center of the pumpkin house before I would be released, but I would not get the prize in the center. He glanced around the cage. The rust and the iron may poison me before that happens, though. I would survive near it for a while, but even with my shoes, it will affect me for being too close for too long. It's practically radioactive being around pure iron and rust. I looked down at my shackles, and I glanced at the sharp edges of the cage. I was not going to survive if I stayed here long, but at the same time, I was certain I wasn't going to be helped. There was no physical way out for me. I only had one way out as far as I could see. I would have to make one myself. It was a choice now. I could let myself be slowly poisoned by inaction, or I could take immediate action and let myself be poisoned by it. I twisted the shackles in my hand, intending to break the chain between them. They were iron. They were poisoning me slowly, but they were still only iron. Iron can break. I twisted the shackles, expecting the weakest link in the shackles to break. What I did not expect to happen was the shackles breaking off my arms completely. Free from the shackles, I grabbed the bars of the cage where the sharp edges dug into my skin. The eyes all focused on me, all staring at me and my suffering, but the overseer took no action other than watching me. As I grabbed both bars and I pushed them apart in my hands, the sharp edges cutting into my hands, blood dripping from my fingers and palms, mingling with the iron and rust as it fell below. The burning filled my hands, my veins, and even my heart as the poison filled me, but still, I had to pull the iron bars aside. The overseer kept staring at me as my hands pushed the bars further and further apart. Iron was poison to me, but even poison has limits before it bends. And if you bend it enough, you can break it as well. Now with the bars wide enough for me to fit through, I stepped to the edge where the overseer could still see me. Standing on the edge, I let the blood in my hands gather for a moment before I threw the blood into the eyes of the overseer, leaving the lights red and blinding the overseer as I fell from the darkness into the light, letting my wings open as I flew forward over the catwalks. As I flew into the light, I realized that I was no longer burning. When I looked at my hands, they were no longer bleeding. I was fine, but still, why would a Doncy do something like that? That feels far more extreme than her normal Feralia scares. I found my friends down by the exit looking for me when I flew in front of them. Where were you? Autumn asked, and they pointed up. I found the overseer. Turns out. They're very much a threat, I said, pointing up, and the others looked up, finally seeing the spider-like overseer above. Now, finally in the light, I could see that the overseer was indeed something to be scared of. The creature had eight blood-covered eyes that glowed with incandescent light. The face still looked like it used to be human but the lower jaw was removed, letting the upper jaw drool, bleed, and drip icor from its mouth. The body was box-like, where inside you could see gears, pumps, and wires pull and move alongside organs like lungs, hearts, and wormy intestines. Exposed to the wound and powered by its own agony, it lurched forward on the ceiling. The legs were metal and bone, with the joints made from gear and cartilage. The glass skin showed hydraulics pumping fluid both flesh and mechanical through the legs, allowing the legs to move, and at the tip of each leg, where a spider's tarsal claws would have been, were human hands. Normal human hands that gripped the beams above, allowing the overseer to move across the ceiling of the factory. The abdomen was a very large iron cage, 
where two of the rusty bars were pushed apart, clearly where I was imprisoned earlier. Run, I told everyone, and they did not need to be told twice as they ran through the door before the overseer had time to chase us, or worse, drop down onto the catwalk. As I flew after the others, I had an idle thought that the darkness that followed me into the factory didn't feel so strong now. It was still there, but it wasn't suffocating me now. Outside, we made it to the scaffolds that were built over the many tracks. Stairs leading up and down to the tracks were clearly visible, but it did look like the only path forward was on the scaffolding itself. Anyone see the dreadnought or the skid blood near? I asked, and everyone shook their heads. Autumn decided it was a great time to speak up. Well, why are you even worried about them? The countryside was almost nothing like we were warned about, and the overseer wasn't even a threat. Autumn said with confidence while rage filled my body. The overseer threw me in an iron cage, and I had to pull the bars apart by hand as I was bleeding and poisoned by the metal. Just because it didn't threaten you doesn't mean that it wasn't a threat. I had to choose between poisoning myself and leaving or poisoning myself and staying. So please, Autumn, stop trying to be clever. When Marceline makes a mistake, she admits it. When Kel does something wrong, he just keeps along. I Kel along, Kel said, which, despite myself, drew a smile across my face. Even your sister can say she's sorry. Dylan apologizes all the time for things he never did. Can you just acknowledge the fact you made a mistake and we can focus on solving the next part of the rail yard together? I asked Autumn, who paused for a moment before she spoke. There's no wounds on your skin, so you weren't actually hurt. What do I have to possibly apologize for? I've not said anything wrong. She shrugged her shoulders while I felt my anger stew. But instead of saying anything else, I landed on Kel's shoulder. Sitting on it, grabbing a loop on the shoulder, as we explored the scaffolds. I wasn't going to make her apologize, but if we weren't going to see eye to eye, then I wasn't going to make it happen. Either she would make a mistake big enough that she would finally admit that she made a mistake, or she would never acknowledge it, and, I, and all I could do was sit with someone who was calm and observant, but was also able to avoid every bit of drama with almost blissful ignorance. Hey, if we're looking for the broad bottom bucket, why don't we head over to the one station that looks closed? He said, pointing forward to the furthest station, which had no lights and no movements. Why go over there? We're looking for a train that works, Kel, Autumn said before Kel offered his retort. We're looking for a train that doesn't draw attention. If the monsters are bringing people here and the enemy is trying to bring more enemy here, wouldn't they need functional train stations? We should try the abandoned one first, Kel offered only for Autumn to scoff. Fine. We'll start there and we'll make our way back. But mark my words, Kel. The broad bottom bucket will be at one of these open stations, she said as we made our way over the catwalks, and I could see below people at each of the stations, often alternating between stations with people and the enemy. Among the survivors, I saw a lot of refugees, some of them wearing a lot of clothes, carrying heavy boxes going to be told by the monsters guarding the way that they can't go with their boxes. Boxes full of game stations, valuables, and even extra clothes. Some of the survivors were hoping to use the items, but for most of them, they just didn't want to let go of their stuff. A lot of expensive items represent months or even years of work going into it. Leaving it behind meant that it was gone. Forever. Other items were a lot harder to let go. I saw a grown couple desperately try to argue with a horned man 
that they just wanted to bring a small teddy bear with them. The hole had nothing else with them, just the clothes they were wearing and the small teddy bear. I could see tears in their eyes as they tried to keep holding the small teddy bear with them. That broke my heart far more than seeing a teenager told to dump his laptop into the trash. A teddy bear is such a small thing, and yet it clearly meant so much to the couple. They didn't have time to grab a bag, couldn't grab spare clothes, and not even a water bottle. But they spared the time to take the risk to grab the teddy bear. It was definitely not due to how much the teddy bear was worth in centi. All the suffering they had faced, and it was made worse by the fact they couldn't so much as bring a single teddy bear into the countryside. That teddy bear was worth the world to them. Their world was falling apart, and they couldn't even bring a small memento of whatever that bear represented with them. And they were crying about it. Something about that hurt me deeper than the lines of people carrying nothing and staring blankly ahead. Sure, that was also scary, seeing the lines of refugees below us, but something about a single couple hurt deep in my heart. I couldn't imagine anyone caring about me so much that they would protect a memento of me with their lives. I had Marceline, and I was certain she cared about me, but the amount of love that couple had for their teddy bear... I was almost certain it belonged to their child, and it was a relationship of a very different kind than my own with my parents. We also saw train stations overtaken by the enemy, stations where blood and flesh covered the walls and where the enemy melted into the environment. I saw fleshy plants grow out of the ground. Some of them were like fly traps, however their teeth were human, and the inside smelled of death in their mouths big enough to hold a person. Whatever was happening with the enemy was not ending anytime soon, and it seemed that they would keep changing and mutating into a brand new biome. We did see the dreadnought in one of the stations. When we saw it, we froze in fear of the terrifying train. The train was a lot like the Overseer in that it was machine and flesh made together, but it wasn't one person, but many made into the Dreadnought. I could see many faces stitched into the sides of the train, each eye and face looking around them. The wheels were made from bone and it screeched on the tracks like steel, and the smokestack was something from a nightmare. The smokestack still admitted smoke and smoke that smelled like cooking pork. In the inside of the smokestack, I could see rows upon rows of teeth in the red throat like a garbage disposal that would consume entire bodies. And that was what it was for. We watched in horror as long lines of the enemy walked up to the smokestack dragging themselves, and sometimes others, to throw them into the smokestack. They fed the dreadnought their own bodies, and they kept feeding the abomination. When there was no more enemy to feed the dreadnought, it moved down the rails, traveling far from us before we continued to move on. We were quiet, but we were all thinking the same thing. What was Adansi doing? The pumpkin house was meant to be scary, but mass suicide to feed an engine of war was pretty hardcore for a Feralia festival. I made a promise that I would follow up with her at the center of the pumpkin house. The final train station was indeed quiet and dark. The tracks were overgrown with grass and wildflowers. The train was an old engine and a single passenger car. But the name on the side was the Broad Bottom Bucket. This was the right train. Hell was correct. Awesome, we found the train. Let's find the conductor and we can go to the next area, 
Kel said before Autumn corrected him. We're finding the engineer, not the conductor. The engineer drives the train. The conductor conducts the train. Pretty big difference between the roles, Autumn said as Summer tapped her shoulder. Hey, that was a bit rude, she warned her sister before Kel spoke up. I'm sorry, engineer. Let's find the engineer, then let's head to the next location, he said with a smile and a small chuckle, laughing at his own mistakes. Mistakes happened, and he accepted it with ease. However, that did not excuse the next thing Autumn said. Next time, don't say something that's wrong, even if you don't know it's wrong. Whether or not you know it's correct, that is called lying, and lying is bad. So don't say anything unless you're completely certain it is correct. Autumn said in a very authoritative way. And I saw something I almost never saw Kel do. He frowned. Kel was almost always smiling. Whether it was a tough teacher, a bad day, or even being in pain did not stop him from smiling. I had seen pictures of him after he was run over by the clown, and he was still smiling even with a broken leg. And here he was, now being told he was a liar for making a simple mistake, and it was making him frown. Someone who was as defined by his smile as anything else he did, and he lost his smile because of something one of his friends told to him. Oh, sorry, I'll be more careful next time, he said as Autumn missed the cue with Summer staring daggers through her. Yeah, make sure. We can't get through this if people keep making false statements, she said with no sense of irony. Maybe you should apologize to Kel, I said, and Autumn shook her head. Why would I do that? I didn't do anything wrong. Kel was right where the train was. We're here because of his hard work. If he said something wrong, that's an honest mistake. Making a mistake isn't lying. Don't forget, you told him the train wouldn't be here, and you're not calling yourself a liar. I challenged her, and she waved it off. Calling an engineer a conductor isn't a mistake. That's misleading people. How would I have known where the right train is? It isn't a lie for me to make a guess and be wrong, Adam said and I shook some of my anger out. She was literally too stark stupid to argue with. She would be hypocritical of others and excuse her own actions as mistakes out of her control. Still, as much as I wanted to scream, I saw some of Kel's smile return. That was enough for me to stop. Arguing with an idiot was just going to make me the bigger idiot. Well, let's get the engineer, Summer said while distancing herself from her sister, as she knocked on the door only for the engineer to open it. The engineer was a very tall skeleton, at least two meters tall. He wore a blue cap and blue uniform. His eyes had two different tea candles, and even though he was always smiling, he seemed to smile wider when he saw Marceline. He waved at her, and he looked over us all. He would have a task for each of us, and there was no way to predict what he was going to ask us to do. For you, I ask you, he pointed a bony finger towards Marceline, who stood straight. A bit of her persona, red prints shining through those eyes. She was confident, and she was strong. She had a great challenge with the riddles in the previous place, and she was expecting another great challenge from the engineer. What did she get instead? I ask you to have a good trip. It's good to see you again, Mark. The engineer nodded, and the light in the candles dipped to being more blue than red for a moment, like the skeleton would have cried if he was able to. Now for you, he pointed towards Dylan this time. There is a drink card on the train, and I want you to make sure that everyone who wants a drink has a drink, he said, and Dylan nodded. He was also expecting a tough challenge, but he was also relieved just to be able to handle the drinks. He pointed towards Summer next. You, you will be our lookout. Keep an eye out over the tracks and warn us if the enemy gets close. Summer nodded before the engineer turned his attention to Kel.
Kel met his eyes, and the skeleton tilted his head like he was confused about what kind of role to give Kel. There is a candle in the main car. If it goes out, you will relight it with the matches next to it. We need the candle to light the way, the engineer said. And the engineer now focused on me. Even though his eyes were only candles, I was certain he was focusing on me. He stared on me for a moment before he finally spoke. Final Florian, last heir of Sage, fallen grace. You've already paid many times over with the Overseer. There is no task I can ask you that is greater than that. Enjoy this ride with your sister, and please know that you have my deepest condolences and my most sincere congratulations, the engineer told me. Somehow, those words made me tear up as I flew off Kill's shoulder, and I bowed my head to the engineer, my hands behind my back. A sign of respect I haven't had for anyone in a very long time. When my head arose again, the skeleton only kept smiling as they finally pointed towards Autumn. As for you, the engine hungers for black stones, and you will keep the engine running. He told Autumn, who was about to speak up, before she shut up. She might not respect us, but she respected the rules of the house and the rules given to her by beings that are clearly supernatural compared to her. Still, as we made our way into the train, we each took up our roles. Dylan provided us drinks while Autumn worked in the engine. After a few minutes, the train began to move forward, and as it moved on, the never-found tracks, we thought we had found peace. Though, after only 30 minutes, Summer called us over to the back of the train. She saw something that made her nervous, and she felt it was worth warning us all about. We went to the back of the car, and we looked out of the windows. In the back, that allowed us to see both the countryside and the rail yard. Both were in flames. The fire burned so high that it eclipsed the tallest factory in the rail yard. It burned so hot that sweat began to bead on my forehead just from looking at the flames. And the screams. The screams were so loud and plentiful that we could hear them inside our train car. The spread of the enemy had gotten worse. Now the safety of the countryside was gone, and the relative safety of the rail yard was also gone. All those refugees, all those poor survivors who survived the dangers of the city to make it to safety, just as that safety burned. Despite myself, I thought back to that couple with the teddy bear. I hoped that they were all right, and I hoped that they still had the teddy bear. Sure, I helped in a broader sense that everyone was all right, but it was easier to focus on just the two of them. I didn't wish any harm on anyone, but rem but by remembering those two, it made it feel so much more real to me. They were real people that I saw. They struggled through things I could not possibly imagine. They escaped the danger I was willingly and going into. And all they had was a single teddy bear. I hoped that they kept that teddy bear and that they escaped safely. Surely there were other safe places beyond the countryside. I turned away from the burning countryside to our next stop. The radio station was not far ahead. The radio tower was tall, and I convinced myself that we were making a difference. We just had to keep moving forward, even if what was behind us was so horrible. There had to be answers just ahead of us. There is silence in the room as the caramel candle went out, taking with it the hands on their shoulders, and with that, falling grace. Dylan, Kel, and Summer wait quietly in the room. Curious, what is the next part of the ritual? In time, the air in the room warms up as the smell of pine fills the air, 
as the green candle burns and there is a quiet sipping noise, as Kel's treat is still warm and still comforting to the one who tells her stories. In silence, the smell of pine and feelings of Saturnalia fill the hearts of those who listen, while the warmth of the hot chocolate warmed their hearts and strengthened their resolve. A very strange reaction, since everyone expected it to get scarier as time went on. It was very strange to have a moment of respite in a story of fear. At least, it would be strange if one is unfamiliar with how to tell stories of fear. The voice speaks from the candles. Now three friends sit alone around four candles. Two unseen observers grow closer to the table, closer to the mystery. One unseen speaks, and the other unseen listens. Curious about who the other unseen observer is, and even more curious about who they are. Autumn, Dylan, and Summer listen attentively, wondering more about how the story was unfolding, and curious about what is at the very center of it all. When you arrive at the radio station, you'll be brought directly into the radio station. Your host, the enigmatic dealer Jake, will welcome you over to through the intercom. And now begins your harshest test yet. Dealer Jack expects kind guests, and he is quite easily offended, and he possesses most of the power in this situation. He will kill you easily by following his manners and rules. Each room in the radio station has rules. Some of them are easier than others. Solve each room and their rules, and a path will open up for you to reach the city. Dealer Jake is quite clever and crafty, but he can be outsmarted, and he can outsmart himself as well. Figure out the rules of each room and figure out how to bypass them, and you will move on to the next room. There are seven rooms in the radio station. While the enemy is outside, the rooms are their own danger. The first room, the entrance hall, has many locked doors. However, only one of those doors heads to the right room. All of the other doors head to nowhere. You can only knock on one door, and that is the door you choose to go through. Dealer Jack watches as you make your choices and your decisions. Be wise, but be cautious. He learns as you move forward. When you find the right door, you can head into the dining room. There is a very careful seating arrangement that Dealer Jack wants everyone to sit at. There are eight spots at the table, with Jack at the head of the table, and at the other end, well, that'll be for Jack to decide. Here in the dining room, you will be given rules on what you can or cannot eat. Everyone is served a menu on what they can or cannot eat, and they have to order carefully to not to violate the rules, and they have to eat something but they cannot violate Jack's rules, and neither can he. After the dining room, there is the kitchen. The kitchen only has one door, and it leads back to the dining room. The rules are strict about what items are or are not safe in the kitchen, but if you're careful, you can find the exit and escape into the center of the radio station. The booth. This is where Dealer Jack deals with his Jack. In this room, it should be absolutely quiet. Do not speak a single word and let the music keep playing. The song takes three minutes to play, and it takes three minutes and 30 seconds to open the door. The music will still need to be played while solving the puzzle. If the music stops, then the door is locked, 
and the music needs to be restarted. After exiting the booth, you will head to the trophy room. The lights are dim, and the trophies cannot be knocked off or out of their cases. You will have to wander through the trophy room without knocking any over. If any item is touched, the lights will weaken further, and anything that gets knocked down will completely destroy a light bulb. Destroy enough trophies, and the room will be dark, and the exit will be impossible to find. The penultimate room is the exit hall. Similar to the entrance hall, there's multiple doors. However, all of those doors are unlocked. Behind all but one of them is a horrible monster. They will knock, and they will try to get in. Only one door leads to the exit. Though the monsters may move, moving the door leading out. The final room is less of a room and more of a garden. It is outdoors and it is dangerously easy to reach by the enemy. You will have to walk down the trail and make your way out. Just be careful not to pluck even one blade of grass. And do not eat even a single morsel from the garden. When you've escaped the garden, you will make your way to the edge of the city. Here you will see the casino in the city. And it is here you will have to escape the city to get to the mines. You just have to escape those that were left behind in the city after it was evacuated. At the radio station, the train stopped. The end of the line and the building was a single-story white building with peeling paint and boarded-up windows. The tower on top was made from recycled steel and it almost looked like it would topple over if it wasn't for the cable was keeping it up. Fascinating. I wonder if it'll be warmer inside. I wondered out loud for a second. Everyone gathered up as we headed into the radio station. The foyer was full of overstuffed leather chairs and a very large painting over the fireplace. It depicted a knight in a helmet riding a horse and carrying a cup in his hand. The Jack of Hearts, or maybe the Knight of Hearts? Things that have to deal with the Arcana or Cartomancy were not my specialty. I was a lot more comfortable in things like laws and rules. Something else that made the foyer unique was the six different doors. Each one was made to resemble cards from the Hearts suit of cards. If there was an ace, all the way to six. The rules of this room. We had rules, didn't we? Thankfully, a hidden speaker in the room started to speak. Welcome, welcome, three times welcome to my home. I don't usually get so many unexpected friends, but thankfully for you, my heart has plenty of room. There will be six chambers to escape. Each room will have rules, and if you are expected to follow. The rules here are simple. There are six locked doors. To open a door, you have to knock on the door. The door you knock on will be unlocked. However, five of these doors contain a single enemy and only one door does not. The same door that leads out of the foyer to the dining room. You can join me there after you handle this room. Good luck, the voice said before there was silence in the room again. Okay, let's try and peek underneath the door and see if we see anything. Autumn suggested before everyone agreed and we laid our heads to the floor to try and see what was beyond the door. Unfortunately, the carpet was in our way, and we couldn't see anything under the small crack beneath the door. We couldn't even see lights beyond the door, so it seemed that wasn't going to work. Well, back to square one, Autumn suggested before I shook my head and said, actually, we're not back to square one. We confirmed that path didn't work, so now we know it won't work. So we can try something different. Try what, smart guy? Autumn asked before I gave my first idea. Let's listen to the doors. See if we can hear breathing or movement. If we can hear it, then we know not to go through that door. 
the only door we don't hear anything is the right door. I said, and Dylan, Fallen Grace, Summer, and Marceline all nodded along, agreeing, while Autumn tried to think of something better. Well, fine, but he'll probably have already thought of that, and he wouldn't keep the exit quiet, Autumn said as we all chose our doors. She had the ace, and I got the three of hearts. I listened closely, and I couldn't hear anything. After a couple of minutes, I removed my ear from the door, and I asked everyone else, Can you all hear anything? Everyone else nodded, and I pointed towards my door. This is the way out. There's no noise behind my door, I said before Autumn spoke up again. How do you know your monster isn't just quiet? Because everyone else heard something. If the problem was a quiet monster, we would have multiple doors with no noise behind it. Since our problem is five monsters and six doors, we just have to find the door that was different. This is the door that's different, so it is the right door. I said, pointing to the three of hearts. You don't know if that's true. For all you know, he has a quiet monster and a sound system to make the correct door sound like there's a monster behind it. Autumn recommended to the group's disbelieving ears. I stood in silence for a moment before I asked. What would you recommend we use to test the doors? What alternative are you suggesting? I asked her as she realized she had no alternative. She had no other method of verification to propose. If she did, she would have started with that method of verification instead of immediately telling me what I was doing was wrong. I'm very familiar with that method. People telling me that I was wrong without offering the right answer, expecting me to just understand what they wanted in their heads, when what they really wanted to say is they wanted to be the one with the right answer. We can have fallen grace check under each door, starting with the ace, so that way we know if it's safe or not, Autumn recommended, before the fairy responded with one word, no. Well, maybe we can force the door open to check it, she offered before the team turned away from her and gathered around my door. I took a deep breath as I knocked on the door. The knock echoed through the foyer as the door creaked open, and it revealed a long white hallway with various paintings on the walls. I saw paintings of roses, paintings of nude nymphs around a pond, paintings of Zeus sitting with his sister Hera and their children, paintings of Hao Yi and Changa, paintings of Eros with his arrows, and even a painting of Jophiel with her flaming sword. Maybe the host was a big fan of archery and warfare in general. These paintings were certainly beautiful, however, they weren't my style, nor what I enjoyed. Everyone else was admiring the paintings, though. I think they were confused by the painting of Jophiel. I thought it was obvious with the flaming sword and heart imagery in the background, but not everyone is into the same things I am into. So I waited for a few moments as we all admired the paintings. Dylan took the chance to get close to Summer while they both looked at Jophiel. Autumn also tried to get close to Fallen Grace, who took the chance to fly further from her. Marceline only looked at the paintings, then looked away like she was ashamed of them in some way. It wasn't my thing, but I don't think the paintings were shameful to look at. We continued down the hallway, where we made it to the dining room. At the head of the table, there was a suit of armor sitting at the chair. Not moving, and he held a single golden cup in one hand, and in his other hand, he held a realistic human heart. Still beating, but thankfully, with no blood. We approached the table carefully. There was a name plaque at each chair. Places were set for each of us. The name in front of the chair, directly in front of the knight, didn't have a proper name. It had two lines with adjectives instead. Venerable tranquility, the plaque said. We turned to each other, and none of us understood what that name would possibly mean. It felt important, but it also felt like it wasn't for us to understand. Maybe it was something that only Dealer Jack was supposed to understand. I found my place, and I sat there, and so did everyone else. Dylan was on my left, and Fallen Grace was on my right. 
There was a closed menu book in front of us and also an envelope. The envelope had our names and as we sat in silence, it took Fallen Grace a moment to realize a connection. She didn't explain to anyone else before she simply said, Fuck you, Dealer Jack. I just realized what you did. I looked around the table and I didn't quite get it. Sure, Fallen Grace was far too small for her chair, but she still sat in it. And she did sit across from Autumn. Maybe she was just upset about being across from someone she didn't like. I was sitting across from Marceline and Dylan sat across from Summer, who both seemed happy about the arrangement, and Marceline couldn't care less. Finally, though, our host spoke from inside the armor. His voice boomed across the room. He clearly had a lot of practice projecting his voice, and he was willing to do so, just to get his point across. Welcome, my guests. I'm glad you have figured out the foyer. And now it is time to figure out the next step. But before we do that, I wish to introduce myself. I am Disc Jockey, Dr. John D. Jake Dealer Jack. Though you may call me Dealer Jack, it's what most people call me. He said within his armor, still not moving, still grabbing the cup and the heart. Well, Dealer Jack, it is a pleasure to meet you. I hope you excuse me for not shaking your hand. Autumn started before the helmet turned to focus on Autumn. You are not excused, he said bluntly, and she was confused. Oh, I don't mean to be excused from the table. I mean to be excused from shaking your hand. She tried to play it off with a chuckle, only for Dealer Jack to respond bluntly. I fully understood what you meant, and you are not excused from shaking my hand. He told her as his left hand dropped the heart to the table as he reached his hand across to her. I could see blood on his armored glove and it was dripping down from his hands onto the table as he reached across the table. His left hand reached out to her. I could see the wheels turning in her head as she tried to think of a way out of the situation. Well, I'm sure we would all be honored to shake your hand, Mr. Jack. It would be a shame for me to go first, she said. Her hands clutched the tablecloth while Dealer Jack shook his helmet. Dealer Jack, Mr. Jack is my brother-in-law. I'm not shaking everyone's hand. I am shaking your hand. You wouldn't be rude to the host, would you? He said in a voice that hinted that there would be consequences for being rude. Now, with no other options, she reluctantly lifted her left hand out to him, a tattooed knot around her wrist, as she reached to shake his bloody hand. His hand enveloped her hand, and as she let go of his hand, the blood from his hand soaked into her hand. Even as she tried to wipe the blood off in the red cloth napkin, her hand remained stained with blood. Red-handed is a terrible thing to be caught as, especially in the casino. The blood of a victim still on your hand? That is pretty much admitting guilt before a trial, even if you didn't do anything wrong. So, I hope you watch your tongue next time before interrupting a host while they're speaking, he said as he picked up the beating heart that was now bleeding blood onto his hand while he spoke. He turned to us all as we sat in silence. Satisfied with our silence, he now spoke again. As I was saying, we have a marvelous kitchen here with wonderful menus. However, as you know, there are so many food taboos in this era. Food allergies, intolerances, religious exemptions, autoimmune disorders, and so many other horrible things. So, we will need to have a proper meal where everyone eats but you cannot eat everything on the menu. In the envelope, with your name on it, is your list of food taboos and the consequence if you break them. And there is a menu in front of you. Everyone's menu is different from each other's, meaning everyone has unique choices. Simple enough? Now here are the rules. Dealer Jack leaned forward. And even without seeing his face, I could hear the smile in his voice. No one can leave their chairs 
Leaving a chair will lead to you being sent to the countryside, or what's left of it. No one can fast from this meal. Everyone will order a drink, an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert. Everyone will drink something and eat something as well. Items may only be sent back to the kitchen at my request. And the final rule is that no one may swap the envelopes with their taboos on it. Are there any questions? There weren't any. Good. Now open your envelopes, he said as I opened my envelope. The list was relatively short, but reading it, it made my heart sink deep when I saw the foods and their consequences. Corn, I would get a nosebleed. Rice, I would get a migraine. Wheat, I would get a seizure for 30 seconds. Barley, I would wake up away from the pumpkin house. Seizures were definitely not something I was looking forward to, but these weren't just foods, they were ingredients. The supermajority of food and drinks had some variation of these ingredients. So I don't have to just avoid these foods and drinks. I would have to avoid anything that had that ingredient. When I checked the menu, the drinks on the list already had a few options I couldn't have. Thankfully, the means it was served and also the ingredients were listed, but I could already see things I couldn't have. Got chocolate, orange juice, milkshake, and even the apple juice all had corn syrup in it. There was beer served in a crystal stein, but I would never drink alcohol. Haunted house or not, I was never crossing that line. I had seen what it did to my brother and my father. I was never going to let it touch my lips. Also, the fact that the beer was brewed from wheat and barley, so my only options were water in a plastic cup, or coffee in a styrofoam cup. I closed my menu, making my choice. Fallen Grace practically danced over her menu before muttering and making her choice. Everyone else closed their menus before making their choices, as we set our choices to Dealer Jack. Everyone else ordered water. I was the only one to order a beverage. He nodded as we made the orders, and he kept sitting there while his staff worked on our drinks. Although, I don't know how long it would take to make five cups of tap water and one cup of coffee. Turns out the answer is way too long. While we waited, Dealer Jack tried to make small talk with me. So, Cal, did you enjoy the paintings in the hallway? I had each of them commissioned personally, he said with no small amount of pride, and I nodded, trying to be polite. Jophiel was definitely a favorite. The flaming sword is absolutely something pretty cool. Although I am definitely more of a fan of Themis or Raguel, I responded to his question. You do know that Jophiel is the angel of love, Healer Jack said to me before I nodded and the drinks finally arrived. The waiter from the kitchen was dressed in classic waiter attire. However, they had no body. As far as we can tell, they were either invisible or they were clothed serving the drinks to us all from the tray before they vanished back into the kitchen. I did know that, but I also know that she has another name, Dinah, which, as you probably know, means judgment, Taylor Jack finished for me, like he was biting into something by saying that. He didn't have water. He had wine poured into his golden cup, which he lifted to his helmet, seemingly smelling it through his armor before he offered it to me. You should try this. It is a very chocolatey wine with floral bouquets, he said as he tried to slide it across to me. I lifted my hand to refuse. I don't drink alcohol, I told him, only for his voice to get a bit louder in response. Alcohol isn't one of your listed taboos, he said, trying to convince me to drink it from his cup. I don't drink alcohol at all. He slid the cup back to him, and he sat in silence before he decided to answer. Fine, but if you won't drink it, then I won't either. He said in defiance before I pointed out the rule to him. Didn't you say that everyone had to drink and eat? Doesn't that include you? 
I asked, and he paused before he nodded. He lifted the cup to his helmet as he lifted the visor, as he lifted the wine cup to his empty helmet. He had nothing underneath his armor, only darkness underneath the armor, like a wraith. The wine slowly vanished into the darkness with no sound, just a quiet disappearance. I lifted the coffee to my mouth and I sipped it. I smiled and the empty armor focused on me while I drank my coffee. And all of my friends focused on me while I drank coffee. I don't know why everyone was staring at me as I sipped more coffee. When I noticed there was red in my coffee, as I lifted my cloth napkin to my nose, when I realized I was bleeding. Why am I bleeding? I asked the Knight of Hearts, who responded with a tinge of sadness in his voice. Styrofoam uses cornstarch as a separator. That way it doesn't stick to each other. But since it isn't a food, the ingredient doesn't have to be listed. He said while well, I kept the cloth to my nose for a few more minutes, until it finally stopped bleeding. No longer wishing to touch the cup in front of me anymore, he literally set it up where I cannot even be clever on the menu. Probably forced us into the simplest option or even giving us no options at all. You may open your menus again and find something to eat as an appetizer, he said as I opened the menu in front of me and things changed again. There was popcorn, caramel apples, cheddar sticks, and even scrambled egg toast. All things I cannot eat at all. I could see everyone else was looking over their menu. We all had different intolerances, so how were all of us having it where it was impossible for us to have anything to eat? And then I had an idea. A way we can bypass the rules but follow it in them at the same time. Hey, Fallen Grace, can I see your menu and I can show you mine? I asked her and she nodded. Flying off her open menu, I placed mine in front of where she was and I was able to see hers. Now my appetizer options included things like chicken soup, baked potatoes, jalapeno poppers, and even banana slices. Now I had a few options I could eat. See anything you want from my menu? I asked her and she nodded. And so I turned to the others. I think I found a way we can do this. We have to swap menus. The menus are attuned to what we can't eat, not to what others can't eat. So as long as we swap, men swap the menus, we can order food that we can eat. I said as the others swapped menus around, and Dealer Jack's expression was not seen, but I could swear his posture told me that he was smiling at our cleverness. We made our orders, and I had banana slices that I greedily ate up, while the Jack of Hearts slowly dropped peeled grapes into his helmet. Well, tell me, Kel, don't you love the story of Romeo and Juliet? Isn't it so wonderful that by the end of it all, they wound up together, even when they were from completely different sides of a feud? Personally, I prefer Hamlet. Although Romeo and Juliet does have its moments, such as the death of Mercutio and the desperate apothecary, I responded, and Dealer Jack shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Well, yeah, I guess Hamlet and Ophelia were cute together, although maybe he would have been better with Horatio? Dealer Jack said, and I shook my head. Nah, Hamlet wasn't all that kind to anyone. Even to people he loved, he was so obsessed with revenge, he killed the very people he was trying to protect. Although Ophelia had one very clever thing going for her, it helped her win in the end of it all, I said as Dealer Jack asked. What was that? Make everyone think you're crazy and don't know what's going on while they try to manipulate you. I said as I finally finished my sliced bananas and Dealer Jack cleared his throat. But isn't it so sweet that Romeo was listening to Juliet lamenting over him when she didn't realize he was there at the balcony? She listened, and he offered to swear by the moon, and she asked him not to swear over something as unfaithful as the moon. Jack asked, and I shook my head. 
Romeo was risking his life for another crush. Before Juliet, it was Rosaline. He sees Juliet from a distance, and he falls in love with her. And his actions lead to the death of his friend Mercutio and the death of Tybalt, and likely escalated the feud even further. Eve's dropping on a private soliloquy doesn't exactly scream compassion. It's a lot more creepy than anything else. Along with committing suicide over his crush's perceived death, caring for her, her could have meant that he could have kept on living, just knowing that she cared enough for him wanting to live. Her death doesn't mean that Romeo has to die for them to be together. The grand irony is death is eternal and life is ephemeral. You get one life, but you die many deaths until the last one. He could have kept living on, fixing the mistakes of the feud, living a happy life, even going as far to apologize for causing her death. He could have lived such a happy life that when he did die, he would have found her after judgment. Their happiness assured, and he would have had a life worth living because he had loved. If he made the decision to go down that route, then Juliet would have woken up, almost as if by miracle, and then they would have lived together happily. All he had to do was wait and be patient, not rush into decisions and think things through. Making a decision that you cannot go back from is never a decision that should be made lightly. And imagine how much more powerful a tale it would have been if he didn't choose to kill and die for her, but if he chose to heal and live because of her. That love was so powerful it inspires you to change and improve, not worsen the worst parts of yourself. Is it a great tragedy? Absolutely. It warns of how feuds can destroy and how even love can be corrupted and ended with it. However, too many people see the deaths of both Romeo and Juliet and think that means love conquers all, instead of seeing love as being corrupted and conquered. I told Dealer Jack, who nodded. I see you put a lot of thought into it, but haven't you ever loved someone who had died? Someone who you loved so much that even remembering who they were and the fact that you can't tell them anything anymore? That their absence hurts you in ways you cannot possibly quantify because a piece of yourself is gone forever? He said it like he was going to catch me in some kind of trap, and I nodded. I have. I have lost someone precisely like that. I lost my older brother at a young age. My parents have often told me that they wish that I was the one who had died. I am reminded of him every day, and I hurt missing him. I hurt so much that I don't even remember what it was like to be free of pain. And yet, I live. I don't simply survive. I live. I smile. I laugh. I cry. I scream. I eat. I sing. I dance. And I live. Every day, I smile. I smile to help others smile, and I smile for those who can't smile. I live, and I live happily. I know that he is happy that I live, and I know that spending the rest of my life lamenting over him is not how he wants me to live. He doesn't want me to die to be with him. Life is ephemeral, but death is eternal. Whether I die tonight, in a year, in ten, a hundred, a thousand, or even a hundred thousand, I will see my brother again. And when we do, I will have a lot to tell him. I said with my smile as Dealer Jack was silent before he answered out loud. Time to order entrees, and there is a new rule. You cannot trade menus with anyone else, he said, and I clarified. So the rule is, we cannot trade the menus. Is that correct? I asked him, and he nodded. So I opened my menu, and I made my order as the first thing on the menu. Spaghetti and meatballs. The others took a second before they did the same thing that I did. They all ordered the first thing on the menu, closing the menu. And I could see doubt inside Autumn and Summer's eyes. 
One of Marceline's eyes twinkled with trust, and her other eye twinkled with the Red Prince's recognition and intelligence. Very clever, Hodge, she seemed to tell me. Wall and Grace's eyes were too small to look at, but she trusted her sister, and by extension, me. That was reassuring, because that meant she was starting to trust me, and I know that Fallen Grace had no trust in humanity, which is more than fair. However, even though she couldn't trust humanity, she could trust a hero, even if that hero was human, that hero was her sister. Dealer Jack was very confused by her strategy. Cal Hodge, you do realize spaghetti contains wheat, right? I know, Dealer Jack. You do know the consequences of consuming wheat, right? I will seize for 30 seconds, most likely falling out of my chair, and I will be kicked out of the pumpkin house, ruining the whole trip, not even going to make it to the center of the pumpkin house. Did I get that wrong? I responded, and he tilted his head and shook it. No, you're correct, but what did you do? I ordered the first thing I saw on the menu. Why did you order the first thing on the menu? Because we aren't allowed to trade menus. There's no point in trying to figure out what is the one item on the menu I can have, when clearly all the items are made to catch us in our food taboo. I said before he dropped his hands on the table. Not everything is something you can't have. I don't get what you're doing. You should have tried to find out what was the right item or tried to figure out some clever way to get past me. I didn't realize that you were just giving up. You don't. You didn't seem the type to give up. He said and I rested my head on my hands as I turned to face Dealer Jack. And when he saw my face, he leaned back into his chair, like he was surprised by what he saw in my face. You really don't understand me at all. Who said I was giving up? I just found a way to win with the rules you gave us. Just because you don't see how, doesn't mean that I haven't won. I said, just as our food arrived from the kitchen. I got the spaghetti with garlic bread, and I saw Marceline got a big steak with no sauce and covered in crushed garlic cloves, garlic mashed potatoes. We took one look at each other, and I pushed my plate towards the Red Prince, and she pushed her plate back. Even with no physical changes, I recognized that look in her eyes. She was quite pleased with our victory as I tore into my steak, and the others all swapped their plates. No, 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 you weren't supposed to do this. I said the menus cannot be traded. You must have recognized what was happening. Wait, I didn't say the food couldn't be traded. Just the menus, but why order the first thing on the menu? You have no idea what everyone else is or isn't intolerant to. There was no guarantee you'd order something the others would be able to have. Dealer Jack said as I cut some of the juicy steak and I explained as I chewed. Actually, there was. Like you said, there was one item on each menu we could have. None of us share a single intolerance. There wouldn't be any fun in it to have six people unable to eat gluten. There's six of us and only four entrees on each of our menus. That is 24 different possible food choices. If I focus on my own menu, that's only a 25% chance I pick a food I can have. However, if I split my chances with everyone else, that percentage of getting food that I cannot have is reduced to only 12.5%. And the beauty of it, by sharing with my friends this way, reduces my odds of a failure to almost 0%. Everyone has a 75% chance of picking a food that I can have. But if we multiply those odds, the odds of all the foods chosen being one I cannot have, nine hundredths of a percent, nearly guaranteeing that I would have food, and with everyone else participating in the trading, those odds are shared. So now we are thriving. Just one last course to go, and we can move on, he said with a smile. Actual food allergies 
don't really work like that. Allergies have a lot of overlap. And ingredients are used in a lot of different ways. Wheat could have easily been in every one of my friend's menus on every single item. So I was putting a lot of faith into my friends and my own personal hypothesis. However, understanding that this was a game also meant seeing it as a game. When I saw Fallen Grace's menu, I saw that almost all of them had fruits. However, curiously, all of the ingredients were free of corn, rice, wheat, and barley. Even the chicken soup was curiously free of noodles and cornstarch. The menus are made to trick us, and only by trading menus and then the plates, we actually force the menus into working with us. Although, I doubt he will be tricked again. More specifically, I doubt he will be tricked the exact same way again. Very clever, but there is one final course. For the last course, any plate you order on your own menu cannot be traded with someone else's. He said, and I nodded before I confirmed it. We cannot trade our plate for another person's plate, is that correct? I asked, and he was about to nod before he rephrased his rule. No, whatever dessert you order on the menu cannot be traded with someone else's dessert. He said, trying to be clear, as I tried to clarify again. So whatever dessert we don't trade, it's for a different dessert. I asked him, and I could hear him growl underneath his armor. No. How about this? You can't trade food at all, he said, thinking that he now had a solid rule. So we cannot trade food, is that correct? I asked him and he nodded. No more trading food, he said as I nodded and my friends looked nervous, but my smile did not waver for a single moment. I already had my trap set and Red Prince saw and she calmed down. Everyone calm down. Kel has got this, she said, and I nodded again as I opened my menu. This time, I carefully looked over my options. There was chocolate pie, cheesecake, strawberries, and whipped cream, and peanut butter pails. I had my answer. I glanced over to Marceline, and she nodded subtly. I glanced at Fall and Grace, Summer, Autumn, and Dylan. They all seemed to be following my lead. I hope they are putting the same degree of care into their answers as I was. I will we'll have the strawberry and whipped cream, please, I said, and everyone else made their orders. Dealer Jack looked like he was only more confused. Do you think you're playing this game right now? He asked, and I shrugged. I'm playing it by its rules. However, whether or not I'm playing it right is truly subjective. Someone can play by the rules and still play it completely wrong. Hide and seek is meant to be sought after, but someone can hide forever, and that would be considered a wrong way to play hide and seek. I said, and Dealer Jack rested his helmet on his hand. You are so curious. You do remind me of Horatio, and I do hope you find that as a compliment. He told me before I chuckled. I guess that makes you the Hamlet of this story, I asked him, and he shrugged with a rattle. I like to think so. I like to think of myself as the hero of every story, and Hamlet is obviously the hero of the play that holds his name, he said with no sense of irony. I hope you remember in Hamlet what happened to Horatio, and more importantly, what happened to Hamlet. I said as his head dropped, looking down at the table. He forgot that having your name on the marquee doesn't make you the hero, and that Hamlet died, ignoring Horatio's warnings, and now he was here, trying to figure out what warning I was giving him. Well, I hope you have your own fun with the pirates, I said as the plates came out. Everyone had their desserts in front of them. And now I had a very deliberate action. I pushed my plate on into the middle of the table with an easy reach of everyone else, and everyone copied my own actions as we all took our own favorite morsels from others' plates. Why are you doing this? I said you cannot trade food, he said, and I nodded, taking a bite of strawberry from my own plate. We aren't trading, 
where there is no trading. We just put the plates in the middle and everyone is taking what they want. We ordered off our own menus, we didn't trade food, and we didn't skip a single course. And we stayed eat in our seats. So, what rule did we break? I asked, and he sighed before he shook his helmet. I guess you broke none, so you can head to the kitchen before trying to find your way out. Just remember, Kel, Horatio didn't escape unscathed, and neither will you. At least I'll tell your story, I told Dealer Jack as he slumped into his chair. Like his armor was now empty, and the door to the kitchen creaked open. I guess it was safe to leave, although everyone else hesitated to get up. So I had to stand up first and then walked into the kitchen. The kitchen was a lot larger than a typical kitchen. There were two different fridges, a pantry door, an oven large enough to cook an entire steer, and the stove had over a dozen different burners, and there was a large island with numerous utensils on it, mostly knives and forks. The wall was covered in posters reminding people of the proper cooking temperature of all kinds of food, from chicken to sugar, milk, and even things like ice cream. Any clue where their exit is? Autumn asked me while I shook my head. No, I don't see any way out, but I think we should try and find something that might be a clue on how to leave. Maybe check out the boards with the cooking temperature and we can find something useful. I said, pointing at the listed cooking temperatures while Autumn scoffed. Please, let's try the pantry door first. She said, opening the pantry door to reveal the pantry behind it. Awesome, so we know that's where the pantry is. Maybe there's a clue there. You can check in there and we can try other things, see if there's something we can use. Try and look for something that doesn't fit in with everything else. Maybe an outlier or an ingredient that doesn't fit. I told Autumn, who waved me off, as she walked into the pantry with Summer and Dylan following. Marceline, Fallen Grace, and myself looked over the listed cooking temperatures of various food items. One interesting piece that st stuck out to me was the boiling point of ice at negative 80 degrees Celsius. Science wasn't my strongest suit, but I knew that ice was a solid, so it doesn't boil. It melts, and even then it doesn't melt 80 degrees below when it freezes. That might be our way out of here. Let's check the stove real quick. Fallen Grace pointed out as she flew over to the stove, where we noticed the stove knob didn't just have positive temperatures, but also negative temperatures. This was definitely not how stoves are supposed to work, although it might be something we can use. Quick, let's find a potter pan and see if we can get some ice in there. I said as I first tried to pull open the fridge on the right, only to realize that it was locked shut. A four-digit combination lock on the doors. Thankfully, the fridge on the left was open, and the freezer has a tray full of ice cubes. Any pots? I asked as Marceline brought over a large pot that I quickly filled with the trays of ice cubes. Then Marceline placed the pot on the stove and put the burner on negative 80 degrees Celsius. The fire burned at a blue tone, but instead of heat, waves of cool air rolled off the flame and the pot filled with cold fog. And when I felt the cold air, I pulled back when I realized what it was. Dry ice, I told everyone as I slammed the glass lid on the pot, and I tried to adjust the temperature on the stove. Even with the lid on, the pot got some of the freezing cold carbon dioxide clouds still leaked out, and when it did, I could see words written on the glass lid, only revealed by the fog, but... It was always there on the lid. Don't bring dry ice to boiling temperatures, it said. And I realized we just violated that rule, even though we didn't know the rule existed. We have to get it back into the freezer, Fallen Grace said, as she flew over to the freezer. However, when she tried to pull it open, it would not open. 
that was sealed shut. This time the magnets moved on the fridge. Once it was just random letters, but now it formed into a brand new rule. Each fridge can only be opened once. How are the others doing? I asked as we headed to the pantry. Inside the pantry, Dylan was reading over the ingredient list of flour, while Autumn was seething in a corner, refusing to speak to anyone. We found a clue that says we need to find a passcode on the ingredient list. It said that it would open the fridge. Dylan pointed at a single whiteboard that said exactly what he said. Curiously, though, Autumn was sitting away from everyone else, not even trying to help. Are you okay, Autumn? I asked, only to have Dylan answer. Don't bother with her. She won't try to help us. She's convinced that we're doing it wrong, Dylan said as I turned to Autumn and back to Dylan. Autumn was convinced you were doing it wrong, so she opted to do nothing instead of trying something different. I asked and Dylan nodded. What's the problem? He asked before I asked. Who are you? And what did you do to my friends? I asked Dylan, who only looked confused. What are you talking about, Kel? It's me, he said, lifting both of his hands up, revealing the fact that he had no ring on either of his hands. Autumn is a lot of things. She is not someone who chooses to do nothing. She would rather do the wrong thing than do nothing, even if doing nothing is the easiest thing to do. Summer also would never let anyone else speak on her nor her sister's behalf. She would rather represent herself in court than let someone else speak on her behalf. And of course, Dylan would never go anywhere without his ring. He would die before he let go of that ring. I told the stranger, pretending to be Dylan. He tilted his head, then he kept tilting and tilting his head hanging upside down and his smile spreading wider and wider as the illusion fell apart. Coiled around me was the body of a large serpent, the head hanging upside down from the ceiling. The underside of the jaw had a single word written on it, exit. The coils squeezed tighter and tighter around me, but I refused to struggle and this confused the snake. Why don't you struggle? the snake asked, as the orange and black striped snake mouth grew closer to me. Because you didn't notice that I was the only one who entered. I told the snake as it opened its mouth, only to have a pot of full of evaporating dry ice thrown into its mouth. As the mouth was full of freezing carbon dioxide, the snake struggled and loosened its grip on me, me, and from the coils, Dylan, Autumn, and Summer were visible again, while in grace proudly posed, having thrown the pot into the snake's mouth. I think I know the code out of here now, I said as I pointed at the word on the snake's jaw. Exit, 3948. Is everyone all right? I asked, and when we got the affirmative answers... I headed to the fridge where I dialed in the four-digit code, and it opened the door, revealing a completely unrelated room. A room that was the DJ booth. It was big enough for all of us, and the song playing was on a tape on a radio. A simple song with violins. The tape had a digital display showing how much time was left on the tape. Less than three minutes. The door across the room had a timer with 3 minutes and 30 seconds. There was a single crank that looked like it was attached to the door. Autumn went over to the door and she spun the crank. It spun easily, but no matter how fast she spun it, the timer only counted down one second at a time. Still, there was no way the timer was going to count down to zero seconds before the song was over. I looked over the choices on the cassette player. My first and most obvious choice was to click pause on the music. The music is paused, maybe that means the song doesn't end. 
So I paused the tape and the music stopped. Autumn kept spinning the crank, but the timer was stuck at three minutes and four seconds and it would not count down. I saw that there were two minutes and 16 seconds left on the tape. So I tried a different option. I clicked rewind to see if that would work. The, t the timer on the tape went back up and the timer on the door moved back to three minutes and 30 seconds. The crank was still moving forward, the tape back at three minutes. I kept it paused for a moment as I thought and I looked at all the other buttons, most of which I don't recognize, but I assumed was similar to what a disc jockey would use in a radio station. Hmm, I don't know. Does anyone else have any ideas here? I asked, pointing at the many buttons and switches there. Dylan, Marceline, and Fallen Grace took a great glance, but they all shook their heads, not sure what to do. Summer and Autumn, however, touched the buttons. They turned to each other, and then Autumn answered. Here, this knob is playback rate. It is at 100%. Reduce it to 75%, that should give me enough time for the music to play until the crank gets solved. So turn it down to 75%, and then when we tell you, press play. Summer told me, and I nodded, turning down the knob to 75%, and then Autumn and Summer stood at the crank. When they nodded to me, I pressed play, and the music came out of the speakers slowly. The timer on the radio ticked down slower than normal, but the crank still counted down second by second. After 3 minutes and 30 seconds, the tape had 30 seconds left on the timer as the door opened. The door opened into the darkness, but the timer on the tape continued to count down even with the door open. Clearly, we would get separated easily. We quickly walked into the next room. In the low light of the next room, we heard the voice of Dealer Jack. Welcome to my trophy room. There are plenty of trophies on the walls. Touch one, though. The lights will dim. Break a trophy and a light gets broken. There are several doors that lead out of here, but each door is lit by a light bulb. If the light bulb is broken, the door will not open. So, if the lights are too dim, you may not find it. And if the light bulbs are broken, you cannot get out. So, be careful with my trophies. Unless you want to become a trophy, Dealer Jack said with a chuckle. And now this is going to be a physical challenge. Let's stick to the middle of the walkway and hold hands. Now, let us get through here slowly but carefully. Dylan said as I held his hand and Marceline grabbed my hand, with Fallen Grace on her shoulder, with Autumn and Summer following behind. In the low red light of the bulbs, I could see shelves with glass figurines all around us. Every single glass figurine was a different jack-o'-lantern. Every single one of them has a different expression. All of them focused on us, their empty glass eyes staring at us. At first, I thought the mouth opening was just an illusion of the low light filtered through the glass. Though, after a moment, I realized that all of the mouths were identical. They were wide open and getting wider, like they were all silently screaming at us. That focus and fear haunted something deep inside of me as Dylan made his way to the door. The dim red bulb over the door showed us that it was one that we could enter. Dylan carefully opened the door, and as he opened the door, the silent screams of the jack-o'-lanterns were no longer silent. They were shrill, and it felt like a drill inside of my skull as we plunged through the door to escape. When we made it through, we paused for a moment while in the foyer. Oh, I thought that was too easy until the end. Adam said, and I nodded. I think he was expecting us to make a mistake, and then the screaming would have gotten worse and worse, but... Now we're in the second-to-last room, I responded. One of these doors is the way out, and the rest have a monster behind them. Unlike the first room, the monsters will move around, so that will be harder. How will we find our way out?
and Summer answered. I think Hikal had a great idea earlier. We can all listen to the doors. But unlike before, we don't rush through at first. We wait until the monsters shift, that when we know we have two minutes to enter the exit. Summer said, and Autumn immediately agreed, and we agreed as well as we went to our doors. Behind my door, I could hear movement. It was a metallic slithering sound, like a mechanical snake, except there were eight of them, and I could hear the scratches and the mechanical noises along the door as they tried to get through the door. Doncy went all out for the biotechnological monsters this year, a unique idea compared to the old-fashioned monsters and creatures from folklore. Still, I listened to the mechanical snakes as they shifted away, and they slithered away. I heard another noise behind my door. There was a consistent ticking behind my door, like from a mechanical clock. It was persistent, and despite myself, I couldn't help but imagine what was behind the door. I saw in my mind a large mechanical monstrosity, made from gears, wires, and pistons in a humanoid form. Rough mechanical teeth, sharp gears, and crushing pistons in its mouth, all eager to destroy me in a second. Has anyone found a door without noise? I asked everyone, and Autumn raised her hand. There's no noise at all at my door. I think it's safe to go through, she said, and she opened it as we all followed. The hallway outside was made from cobblestone as we followed and we arrived out in the garden. The night was dark and cold. The moon above was orange. The garden itself had croaking toads, crickets, crunching caterpillars, and even the cause of crows. There was a lot of life in the garden. The garden was growing roses in all colors. They were styled into a rainbow, even in the color purple. A color that I've never seen before outside of politics. Despite myself, the flowers were beautiful to see. The fence surrounding the garden had many electric lamps on the top to light the way as we made our way out of the garden. Every step felt electric. I expected there to be a monster, a trap, or even a snake with every step on the cobblestone path. But nothing happened the entire time. Near the exit, there was a pond. In the middle of the pond was a mossy rock with a lantern. On top of the lantern was a gray toad. On top of the gray toad was a white frog balanced like a hat on the toad's head. On top of the frog's head was a black pointed hat, like a witch's hat. It was a very simple sight, but we all paused to look at the sight together. Out of all of the amazing and impossible things here, we were looking at a pond that had a rock with a lantern, with a toad, with a frog, with a witch's hat. Life was quite interesting like that giving such simple but wondrous pleasures with such a sight. At the exit, the gate was unlocked, but taped to the gate was an envelope with my name on it. I opened the envelope. The only thing written on it was, with regards, the Knight of Hearts. And inside the envelope was a rose with a stem. The thorns did not cut my skin, and it was apparently still alive. The petals of the rose were two shades of green, with a single shade of white, a shade of gray, and even petals that were jet black. Touching the petals, they were real petals, and no paint on them. The colors on the rose matched the colors on my flag pin. Thank you, dealer Jack, I said to no one in particular. As I tucked the envelope and the rose into my backpack, as we made our way to the casino. Just beyond the gates, we could see the doors that led into the casino. There was only darkness outside, and when the doors opened, there was light and warmth flooding out of the doors. It was flooding out of an oven. Although we had no other way to go other than forward, 
I was not looking forward to the casino. Three friends remain, three candles still burn, and the darkness grows stronger. Under their feet, they can only feel air beneath their shoes. In the light of the candles, there is only the table, the chairs, and the voice in the darkness. They sat in silence while the voice waited. Waiting for what? No one knew. Finally, the voice spoke again. The scent was one that was not quite easy to identify, but the voice seemed to bounce between summer and autumn, being just a step behind the two sisters, but also out of sight while the voice spoke, guiding the last three friends through the journey in the casino. They waited in silence, listening, but the anticipation of the sisters was what filled them the most. They wondered about who was going to be taken next, and their anticipation clouds their judgment from the story that tells them about Vandenberg. The city of Vandenberg was where the event hit the hardest and where most of the enemy lives. As contaminated water from Morris's mine leached into the water supply, it rendered most of the city's population into the enemy. Then the monstrous protectors also arose to protect the people and led them to the countryside. Even after all of this time, there are still people living in Vandenberg. There's two types of people in Vandenberg. Those that serve the overboss of Vandenberg, Mr. Pyre, and those that don't. Mr. Pyre was once the casino manager of the Fair Verona, the largest casino in the city. Now, though, he is the enigmatic and hidden boss of Vandenberg. His men travel through the city looking for supplies and for people to bring back to Fair Verona. It is in the casino that survivors can gamble for additional supplies. However, money is worthless in Vandenberg, so people gamble with chips, supplies, and their own lives. Mr. Pyre has a lot of jobs to do, and he always needs someone to do them for him. If someone has no supplies to gamble with, they can give away a very special pontoon chip. It is gray-colored and where it once represented a hundred thousand centi, it is now worth something that is far more valuable. A person's life, their freedom. This chip is given to everyone entering Vandenberg, and it is the one that is most easily lost throughout the city. Someone is always trying to steal their freedom back from someone else. Most of Mr. Pyre's men are people who now owe their entire lives to the overboss of Vandenberg. You can usually tell who does or doesn't owe their lives to Mr. Pyre by the shock collars around their necks. The shock collars allows Mr. Pyre to control the, his men even when they turn after drinking the water. A lot of Mr. Pyre's men has drank the water to try and escape their fate. They change, but the collars remain, sometimes even merging with their bodies, making these monsters much worse, since they serve Mr. Pyre, and they are not as easily distracted as other members of the enemy. Surely, it must seem easy at this point. All you have to do to stay safe is to keep your chip close to yourself and sneak through the city without getting caught. Except the only way out of the city is to head through the Fair Verona Casino, and the Fair Verona is the last open business in all of the city. You enter Vandenberg through Fair Verona, and you will leave through Fair Verona, one way or another. The access to the tunnels is exclusively to the highest level of gamblers the elite echelons who exclusively trade in chips worth human lives, 
who gain and lose decades of water and food in a single round of pontoon, and where they tip barely a glass of water to those who deal the cards and who bring the drinks. It is these very elite gamblers that you have to join and beat in the final game to get into the tunnels. Though, if you do beat them at the table, are you going to stop? Or are you going to keep going? You just struggled from the bottom and made your way all the way up here. Would it really hurt to play another game or two? Maybe you can cash in a, a chip or two to get dinner. The first real dinner you've had since going on this quest. There is plenty more for you to gain. All you have to do is keep playing and keep winning. You might hear the cries of those who lost everything, who once dreamed that they would live the life that you have now for even a single night. Now they are serving you food and drink. Maybe you'll recognize them. Maybe you won't. Maybe these people who are serving you drinks will once have been the very same high roller elites that you beat in cards just last night. You might feel something in your heart when you see them cry. You may even feel sympathy, knowing that if the dice rolled just a little differently, or that if the cards were dealt differently, that you would have been the one serving drinks. Don't let sympathy ruin your place in fair Verona. You honestly think that anyone here who is serving you would, ha would have had a moment of sympathy for you if they were the ones who won? And all you have to do to keep your place of comfort and wealth is keep winning. Every night there will be a new up-and-coming stars who are trying to take your place. You may see other rivals return, but most of these faces will be new. Those willing to put everything on the line for the easy life that you have won. And all you have to do is keep winning. After all, when you're the king of the mountain, you're far above everyone else. However, everyone beneath you is trying to pull you down. And if you do fall, you will learn just how far it is to fall from the top. And when you finally hit rock bottom, you may find yourself serving those exact same gamblers that not too long ago you were looking down on. It may be tempting to try and be stoic, but it may be best to play on their humanity and sympathy. You only need one more chip, one more chance, one more shot, and surely you can make your way to the top again, and you can live through the Morris's mines. Unless you decide to see how far your luck can take you again. After all, you are so wise and so careful. Surely you've learned from your mistake last time, and you can live the good life forever this time. How many times have you said that all you need is one shot? And when fair Verona is your only shot? first thing I notice in the casino is the noise. The sound of bells, cheers, constant chatter, and even the distant sound of the one-armed bandits spinning. In most other circumstances, it would have seemed like a normal casino. Except in this casino, there was almost no one around. The pontoon table had the dealer and two players. There was a fortune wheel that had four people sitting around it, and there was a single bored man at the front of the casino. The man saw us and he approached us. He was dressed in a worn down red and orange suit with golden buttons. He saw the six of us as he pulled out six different gray chips as he handed one to each of us as he explained briefly the rules of the casino. You need something of value to gamble in this casino. Since you're coming from the streets of Vandenberg, the only thing you have of value is your own lives, your own freedom. There are prices made to be paid for our many fabulous prizes. 
and even our grandest prize, the entrance to Morris's mine. It is valued at five of these chips per person, the docent said with a smile that didn't reach his eyes, and I could see underneath his shirt collar is an electric collar, similar to those used on prisoners and gladiators. Thank you, everyone said to the docent as six chips were handed out, and Marceline pocketed both hers and her sister's chips as we looked over the many different tables and games that there were to play. We need to get the chips as quickly as possible. Odds favor the house, and the longer we play, the more likely we are to lose. I said while well, everyone awkwardly nodded, but Kel decided to correct me. Well, every game will favor the house, but we shouldn't make any rushed choices and try to win the games that we have the best chances at. If we play cautiously, we might take longer, but at least we'll be able to play more. Maybe we can go to the counter and exchange this chip for multiples of smaller varieties. That way we can take a loss if it happens, but we can also can win. He recommended while everyone nodded, but I sighed. Again, Kel trying to do things the safe and logical way. When will he learn that we can't not beat this casino by being logical? You go do that. I'm going to try and win a game of pontoon, he said while Marceline tried to get me to stop. Autumn, you're going to walk right into a trap. Kel is right, and you we should listen, she said before I raised my hand to silence her. Just because you and Kel were right about the countryside and the radio station does not mean that you'll be right here. These stories require an understanding of the esoteric and folklore of the Fae, and quite frankly, both you and Kel are as exoteric as they come. There's no way you would understand how any of these tests are supposed to work. I told Marceline, who clenched her hands into fists before letting out a sharp exhale, and she turned to leave. Hell, Fallen Grace, and Dylan all following her. Summer stood by me the entire time. You do realize that was extremely rude to them both, right? Summer asked me, and I shook my head. It isn't rude if it's true. Marceline has a special book and some practice. Learning magic doesn't make someone magical. You have to be born into it, or at least raised into it. Dylan has an inherited magical artifact, and that's it. Without it, he's a dead man. And Kel is even less special than both of them put together. Why did you invite him? I asked Summer, who turned to face me at the same time I turned to face her. I didn't invite him. I thought you invited him, she asked as we both thought about it for a second. Well, either way, none of them were born special, so it doesn't matter. They don't understand this world the way you and I do. Just because they got lucky a few times doesn't mean that they understand this. They should stop trying to lead and leave it to the magical experts, like you and me, told Summer, who crossed her arms. What about Falling Grace? She was also born into this, and you're not treating her any better. Hell, you wouldn't have even known about the pumpkin house if she didn't tell you. You weren't exactly born into magic either, Summer said while I turned away from her. I hate to admit it, but she was right. I was not born into magic. I was just the unlucky human baby that was swapped out for a changeling. The same changeling who was standing across from me. She got to be the lucky child, raised by humans with the powers and abilities of a fae. I was an unlucky human raised by fae with no abilities to speak of. I was raised with strange rules, stories of magic, and stories about why people deserve to be punished, and how much birthright meant. I meant something because I was part of the Argentum family, only to realize I wasn't a biological part of that family, and that one of the other families had the actual fey part of that family. I gained a sister, but ever since then, I know everyone is talking behind my back about how I had nothing special about me. No magic, no blood, no connection to the Fae, other than my knowledge. 
So here I was trying to use my knowledge to help us forward through the pumpkin house, and I had nothing to offer anyone. I bet they were talking about how useless I was to each other, but I was certain that I was right. I had to be right here. I made my way over to the pontoon table where the dealer was wearing a mirrored angel's mask. The other two players looked exhausted and defeated. Their haggard faces barely glazed over the table and their cards as I sat down with Summer by my side. You need to win playing this game. I'm going to win more than my chips worth here, and it depends a lot on you not playing this game at all. I warned her as she nodded standing next to me. I placed my gray chip down on the table while the dealer glanced my way. Their expression was inscrutable while the other players woke up a bit to see what I did. So they also placed a single gray chip into the pool while the dealer offered the same. If this is your only chip, do know that if you lose, that you will lose your freedom now owing it to the casino. You do realize this? The masked angel dealer asked. I could see on their back broken bones sticking out of the rack, where their wings used to be. The only remaining evidence of their divinity was the mask that had reflected myself and my sister in the face. I nodded. I am aware, and it is the only thing I have to gamble, so please, let me gamble with it, I told the dealer who tensed for a moment before nodding. Four gray chips being bet on while they shuffled all of the decks together. In casinos like this, it was more common to shuffle four or even eight decks together to avoid card counting or other means of cheating. A standard deck of cards has over eight times ten to the power of 67 variations. More variations than stars in the galaxy. Eight decks shuffled together. 3 times 10 to the power of 910. More variations than atoms in 10 different universes. So card counting or other means of cheating were not possible. Not with the angel looking over me, and not with other invisible means of keeping me from cheating. The only way to win is fairly, and the casino made it virtually impossible to win fairly at all. So the trick with games like this is not to merely play the cards, but to also play the other players as well. The cards were dealt out, with my card being dealt first. The other two players were then dealt, and the dealer played his first card face up, a jack of spades. A massive advantage towards the dealer, especially with my own cards. A two of hearts and a two of diamonds. I signaled to the dealer to give me an extra card, and he dealt me a five. The other two players laid their cards down on the table. So now I only had nine, and I had to get to 21, or at least as close as I could without going over. I signaled for another card, and I was dealt an ace of spades, and I laid my cards down face down. The value of the cards were 20. It was close enough to 21, and I wasn't going to risk another ace to get a perfect 21. Taking an unnecessary statistical risk was a terrible way to play. All I could do was hope that no one else had 21. The dealer flipped over his hidden card. It was a five of hearts. He only had 15, and the other players flipped it over. One had an 18, and the other had 19. The one who had 19 was clearly quite happy with it. However, then I flipped my own cards over, showing that I had 20. All four chips were pushed my way, and I grabbed one chip, and I laid it on the card dealer's side. Here you go, a tip for such a great game. I told them, and even with a covered face, there was hesitation. Their electric collar underneath their shirt barely visible as their hands gently brushed the gray chip like it would turn to smoke if they touched it. Giving tips to the card dealer is a common courtesy. However, such a large tip, one that represented freedom, was something that was practically never done. I had essentially given the card dealer their freedom, 
and with no way to see their face, all I could do was hope that my message was clear. Playing the players is a skill that is easily overlooked, but it is hard to remember that the house is playing the game also. But in games like this, the house is represented by a player. A player that can be bluffed, persuaded, or even bribed. Following the conventions of the casino, all I did was give a tip to the dealer. A tip so large that he cannot ignore it. The value isn't in money, but in the dealer's freedom. How many times has this angel watched people make bad choices? How many bad choices did this angel make to end up where they were? How many selfish people gambled away their freedom? Some winning, but most losing, never considering for a moment that the dealer was also a person, never considering the fact that they are trying to win blood, life, and even freedom from the dealer. How many times did the dealer watch their value of the freedom gambled on? Dozens, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of times? How often did someone show the fallen angel enough kindness to free them? Or did they see them imprisoned at the table and figured the punishment had to be just because they were clearly a fallen angel? When you're seen as a monster, people will assume any cruelty directed towards you is just and fair. Though odds are most of the players didn't even consider that much. They just saw their cards, and they tried to win more than they lost, only winning enough to keep playing and to gamble again. The only way to win is to know when to quit, but I couldn't quit yet. The angel took the chip from me, slipping it into their pocket. Can we play again? I asked, and they nodded, as I slid two gray chips forward, pocketing the last one into my pocket. The card dealer slid two chips forward, and the other players muttered, but they slid all their chips forward. Now the last of their chips, and their freedom, on the line. But the invisible hooks in their mind pulled them forward. They won games before, and they are convinced they just need to gamble more to win more. I did not feel as sympathetic to the players as I did to the angel dealer. The car dealer was a fallen angel, someone worth sympathizing with, who likely had a tragic reason for being stuck here, especially for being such a powerful being. The players, they were only human. They made their choices to be here. Whatever happened to them was because of their own choices. No one made them come here. No one made them gamble. They could choose to walk away at any time. They would get their lesson soon enough about gambling. Sooner or later, they would be punished, and all I can hope is that they were punished by me. The dealer dealt himself a king of hearts. The card I dealt with had five of spades and an ace of spades. I signaled to be dealt another card, and sure enough, I was dealt a seven of diamonds. Thirteen. It was far from perfect, but I would need to be dealt another card. I signaled for another card, and I was dealt a six of clubs. Nineteen. It would have to do. I looked up for my cards. The other players also signaled for new cards. But seeing the way their shoulders slumped, they probably went over 21. I looked over at the dealer, who then dealt themselves another card. A nine of clubs. It was odd they dealt themselves another card. It would leave a high probability of losing. I smiled as I laid my hand face down on the table. My intent was clear to the dealer with my tip. I just gave them back their freedom, and I would be guaranteed my own freedom. After all, if I just gave the dealer their freedom, surely they wouldn't want anything wrong to happen to me. That was how stories like this happened. I give someone their freedom, 
and so they help me keep mine. Our cards are flipped over and my heart sinks. The other players are over 21 and I have a 19. However, the hidden card of the dealer, a two of diamonds. They had a perfect 21. They collected the chips and the other players went pale as some mean looking men tapped them on their shoulders and escorted them away from the table. Two of my gray chips are taken, leaving only the last chip in my pocket as the fallen angel took the others away to put back to the house. Why did that happen? I thought I played the game right, I asked Summer who whispered back to me. They aren't under any obligation to give you special treatment. Even if you do something kind for someone else, doesn't mean they'll be kind back. Some people can receive all the compassion in the world, and they will only ever know greed in their heart. Sure, you gave them their freedom, but that doesn't mean that they'll want to make sure you keep yours. You don't have anything to offer them, so to the dealer, you're just another player. That's okay, because it isn't an indication of your character, it's an indication of theirs. You would give them freedom, but they would willingly snatch yours away. Summer whispered to me while I shook my head. That doesn't make sense. Only humans are supposed to be selfish. Everyone else is supposed to be fair and good. I played fair. I did something good. So something good was supposed to happen to me. I whispered back while Summer shook her head. You did good, but anyone can be fair or unfair. Being human has nothing to do with that. You did something good. They did their job. Now you know the kind of person that they are. Use that to your advantage, Summer said to me, only for me to shake my head again as I took my last chip out, staring at it for a moment before I whispered to myself. I knew the dealer was going to do that. I would have never given them their freedom. I said as I placed the chip down. When I did that, I saw tension in Summer's eyes. Her hand on my shoulder squeezing a bit too hard for just a moment before she let go of me. You got this. Just remember to play the game. Don't expect kindness nor favoritism. She said as I focused on the cards, tears just behind my eyes as I looked at the cards dealt to me and the dealer. They didn't act the way they were supposed to. These kinds of stories were always about someone doing something nice to get something nice in return. That was always what happened in these stories. So if that wasn't what was happening here, then... oh. It had to have been me. The dealer was esoteric, supernatural, a being of higher ethics than I could ever hope to understand. I must have done something wrong. Of course, it was so clear now. They were dealing with higher ethics, and clearly I fell short of the correct expectation, so they took my chips as punishment. Maybe it was because I was expecting kindness instead of freely giving it away. Of course, since I was expecting something in exchange for giving something, that meant it wasn't truly a kindness. So clearly, I deserved to be punished for breaking an invisible rule that no one else could see but the angel in front of me. My cards were lucky again. A ten of hearts and an ace of diamonds. A perfect twenty-one. In any other circumstance, I would double down, but I only had my own freedom to gamble with. Although I was tempted to ask Summer for hers, I couldn't ask my sister to give up her own freedom to boost what I was going to gain. It wasn't right. She was fey, and I was human. I had to earn my own way through the pumpkin house. 
I laid my cards down as the dealer flipped over his cards. Perfect 20. I flipped over my cards and he slid over another gray chip my way. Even though it was twice what I had just a moment ago, it felt hollow, like a bitter salve that was meant to ease the burn of losing the two. I had four gray chips for a moment, just enough to earn my way into Morris's mind, and now here I was, trudging through the games, to try and earn my way out again. But before I had a chance to gamble again, the angel dealer lifted their hand. I'm heading to break. Try a different game, they said as they quietly left, and I was left at the table. Just me and Summer. This is going to take forever, he said, pocketing both of my chips as I looked around the casino, trying to see what other games I could play. I could see the others trying their hand at penny arcade games and low stake games, trying to earn their way slowly but safely. It could take hours or even days if it happens at all. What games can we earn a lot of chips quickly? I asked Summer, who pointed at a triple fortune wheel. Most fortune wheels in the seven cities have 38 slots, numbering from double zero to 37. They're supposed to be perfectly balanced, so all have an equal chance to be chosen. However, the triple fortune wheel has two additional twists on it. The person doesn't place one bet, but they place three. As the ball rolls down the first spinning wheel, it then falls into a slot marked by the crouper. As the ball then falls into the wheel below, they begin to spin again, falling into a different number, before again falling down into the final wheel below. Each wheel has 38 numbers, 36 possible bets to be chosen per wheel by placing three different guesses on the numbers. You had to accurately predict the numbers three separate times. The odds of predicting all three numbers correctly, one out of 46,656. Most casinos also allowed for bets between a sequence of numbers, and some even allowed for bets of whether it would land on red or black. Fair Verona was not nearly so fair. It was only on numbers and the odds, on what I did or didn't get correct, that would dictate what I did win. These are very long odds. Are you sure you want to do this? Summer asked me as I nodded. I don't have to win everything. I just have to win at least one. One to 36 odds will still pay out enough gray chips for all of us to head to the Morris's mine. As long as I choose one correct number, I have three chances. I told Summer, who shook her head. Yeah. One to 36 chance to win is just another way of saying 35 to 36 chance to lose. That's not how statistics work. That is exactly how statistics work. Your odds of success are just your odds of success. There isn't a chance of a draw, nor a chance of a partial success. You either win or you lose. The other games will take longer, but they will be safer with smaller wagers. Summer implored me before I put my two chips down on the table in front of me. All of the chips that I had left. Please don't, she said to me as I made my selections on the tablet in front of me. Three different panels with three different sets of numbers. So I chose my lucky numbers that itched in the back of my head. I had no real reason to choose these numbers, but I still had them. 13 on the first wheel, 17 on the second wheel, and 5 on the final wheel. Oh, yeah, that was another factor in the triple fortune wheel. So you could choose the right number, but if you chose the wrong wheel, you will still lose. 
Oh well, yeah, that greatly reduces my odds even more. I probably should have considered that. The wheel spun, and I noticed that the angel dealer, who just left their job dealing at the pontoon, was sitting at a completely different chair at the same fortune wheel, gambling their gray chip at the same table I was. This wasn't right. I gave them their freedom. They're supposed to be free. Break away and fly away from the casino. Why did they choose to keep gambling? Maybe there's some trick or reason I don't understand? I don't get it. I thought only humans get greedy. That only humans made bad decisions. Well, they want to gamble against me now. I hope they still win something. The ball began to spin on the highest wheel, just at the same height as my eye, as it spun against the wheel, both spinning in opposite directions. It spun and spun as the grouper watched and we all watched. The ball finally fell down the first hole. Thirteen. I already got a win. That would be seventy-two grade chips for me. More than enough to get everyone into the Morris's mine. The ball kept spinning on the wheel below. Before, I didn't need it to fall through any other holes. It would be enough for me as it is now. Although, I still wanted to see if I was going to win anything more. The next hole it plunged through was 17. My winnings increased even further. 2,592 grade chips were now mine. If I was inside a casino in the Seven Cities, I would have been a billionaire worth over 259 billion centi. One of the wealthiest individuals in the history of humanity. And there was still one more wheel to see. There was no way I could possibly win this one as well. Still, I was on the edge of my seat as I saw the ball spin over the final wheel. Over and over it spun, and then finally it fell through the final hole. Five. I won. I didn't just win, I won all three wheels. My initial gamble of two gray chips became 93,312 chips. Out in the seven cities, that's over nine trillion centi. Everyone's eyes were staring at me as the crouper collected the chips and my winnings were counted out. If you please step aside with me. These are a lot of winnings and we want to make sure that they're given to you safely. The crouper said as he guided me away from the casino floor and from my sister. I followed eagerly. That many chips? I was going to have no trouble with any other challenge, and the others will definitely see me as their best player. I was guided into a quiet part of the casino, where the crouper opened a door and pointed me inside. The owner is just inside. I'm sure he will explain everything to you, the crouper said as I walked into the dark room, inside the door shutting and locked behind me. Despite the situation, I was certain I was safe. Dangerous things only ever happened to other people. All of those cautionary warnings only ever happened to other people to people who were dumb enough to let those things happen to them. I was too smart for something like this to ever happen to me, so therefore it would never happen to me. A single light fixture turned on. Underneath the light was a very tall man. His eyes were shiny as can be. His hair was slicked back. His collar stood up straight, and it was as red as can be. He had a bushy mustache underneath his nose. Directly behind him was a mirror. 
The mirror was large enough that I could see that it was only that the only figure in the reflection was myself. The overboss of Vandenberg, Mr. Pyre, cast no reflection. Hello, Mr. Pyre. Pleased to meet you. I am Autumn Abigail Argentum. I'm sure you've heard all about me, I said, extending my left hand towards him, as he only rudely stared back at me. Ah, yes, the little red-handed murderer who won at the fortune wheel. Did you really think that Fair Verona is the kind of place where we let murderers go free without any punishment? He asked as he leaned over me. His eye teeth were very sharp and prominent, even through his closed mouth. He kept staring at me as if he was expecting me to answer. I'm not a murderer. I've not killed anyone, he said indignantly. I don't know why anyone would think of me as a murderer. I'm not a bad person. I've not even done anything bad at all during my entire time inside the pumpkin house. Mr. Pyre stared at me for a moment before he grabbed my left hand and lifted the hand to my face. The blood from the dishonest handshake of Dealer Jack still stained my hand, and it was still red. You're red-handed. You haven't even tried to wash the blood off your hands. The very blood on your hands stained the cards and the chips that you play with. If I give you those chips you won, then the blood would have soaked every single chip inside of the casino. I should take your winnings and leave you to die out in Vandenberg, he said as he leaned back, letting go of my arm and making a steep tumble with his hands. However, I believe in second chances, so I will give you a chance to prove that you aren't a murderer. You said that you're an Argentum? As in the Sunset Republic Argentums? He asked, and I nodded. If he knew my family, then surely he would know that I am a trustworthy person. Well, all you have to do to prove that you're an Argentum. Surely, such a powerful Fay family would produce only powerful children. So these tests will be easy for a Fay like yourself. He said as my heart pounded in my ribs like a bird trying to escape a cage. Yes, I was an Argentum, but I wasn't a Fay. I was the only Argentum who wasn't a Fay, so any test of Fay abilities weren't going to work on me. But what other choice did I have? I had to prove myself not a killer. Fine, but if I succeed, you let both myself and my friend into Morris's minds, I told Mr. Pyre, who only chuckled. That's fine. But just know this. If you do not succeed, you will be treated as any other murderer. Toss out of fair Verona, and you will never be allowed to return. He said with a chuckle as the door behind me unlocked. I hope you enjoy it, but just so you know, we don't do things part way in this casino. This test will be a lovely show for everyone in the casino. So, your friends will get to watch you show everyone how wonderful you are. A simple show, but everyone loves to watch a royal show us presents up. Mr. Pyre said with a smile that was equal parts challenging and cruel. I will show you what an Argentum can do. I said as Mr. Pyre led me to the stage in the casino's theater. As he led me ahead, two guards followed behind me, giving me nowhere to run as I was led to the theater. The theater seats were all full. In the front seats, I could see my friends. They all were beaming up at me with pride. On the stage was a table with two candles on it. Mr. Pyre stood in the center of the stage as he spoke to everyone. Welcome, everyone, to the great magic show. 
we have the amazing Autumn Abigail Argentum of the Sunset Argentums, a powerful Fay family with not a single weakness in their entire extended family. She has been accused of being a murderer, but she will convince us that she isn't a murderer by proving that she is an Argentum. So please welcome the amazing Autumn, Mr. Pyre said as he pointed towards my direction and I walked on stage, waving to the audience with confidence, imagining an invisible string pulling my spine up straight through my head as I made my way to the table, waving to the cheering audience. I enjoyed the cheers, and for a moment, I forgot the danger that I was in. I forgot that I was being tested. At that moment, I just was happy to be acknowledged, to be cheered, that my friends were all cheering me on and believing in me. I was an Argentum, and any obstacle would fall before me, and those cheers brought a genuine smile to my face as Mr. Pyre raised his hand and silence fell across the audience. I know, I know. How can you possibly have a test of magic without having someone to test your magic against? Sadly, there is no one in the pumpkin house anywhere near Argentum's level. So, I beg your forgiveness, Abigail, but you will have to deal with the Magician of the Arcana, the first trump card of Cartomancy, the heart and soul of the Pumpkin House, one who goes by many names, the Magus, the Juggler, the Artisan. However, most of us in Fair Verona simply know him as the Magician Il Bagatello Rider, he said as a cloud of smoke appeared in the middle of the stage, and from inside of the smoke stood Rider. He wore a single circlet of white gold on his head. He also wore white robes and a red duster over it. He held a candle aloft in his right hand, and his left hand with six fingers pointed below. When he appeared, the cheers and clapping were far louder than it was for me. Here I was, facing the magician of the arcana. Even if I was magical, this would be a tough test. And now, it was one of those moments where you already know you've lost, but you're going to do everything you can to try and make it a tough win. Now for our first test, both of our performers just have to light the candle in front of them. As you can all see, the candles are here. They may both use any tool in front of them, Mr. Pyre said, pointing to both tall candles in front of both the magician and myself. There were matches lighters, and even a flint and steel in front of me. But the magician had a simple test. All he did was lower his candle to the wick of the candle, lighting the candle in front of him. No magic required. This test was practically insulting as I picked up the lighter, and I lit it in front of one, of everyone. The flame was visible to everyone as I lowered it to the wick of my candle. Except the wick wouldn't light. It would start to blacken and smolder, but it wouldn't light. What is the matter, Argentum? Is your candle not lighting? Maybe try your magic to light it. Mr. Pyre said to the laughing audience as I lowered the lighter to try and use the match to light it. The match lit easily as I lowered it to the wick, only for it to not light still. Every match I brought close to the candle went out before I could even try to light at the wick. Oh, 
looks like you had a bad lighter and an entire book of bad matches. Well, that only leaves you two options. You can use the flint and steel, or you can use your magic, Abigail, Mr. Pyre said as I lifted the flint and steel, and I struck it over and over, trying to get the sparks to reach the wick. Sometimes they would reach the wick, but it still wouldn't light. But I did notice something interesting. My candle was melting, and it was, in fact, melting faster than the flame from Ryder. Now was the time for being clever. If I wasn't clever, then I would have to admit loss. I have lit this candle with a flame that cannot be seen nor felt. However, you know it is there because, as you can see, my candle melts, and in fact, melts faster than Mr. Ryder's. I said, pointing towards my melting candle, and Mr. Pyre narrowed his eyes. But before he could say anything, the room erupted into cheers and collapse. Far more cheers for my little trick than for the magician lighting his candle. And as the cheers rang through the theater, Mr. Pyre swallowed his comment before he clapped me on the back. Exactly something I should have expected from an Argentum of your caliber. Now, let us do something a little flashier, a little more spectacular, Mr. Pyre said with barely concealed malice, but I barely noticed as I let the applause and cheers wash over me. That was the trick to this challenge. I don't have to be better than the magician. I don't even need to fool Mr. Pyre into thinking I was better. I just had to convince the audience that I was better. That was already halfway done for me. He told the audience who I was, and already people want to see me succeed. For our next trick, we need you to do a simple test of strength. To avoid breaking anything important, we will start with soft materials. Let's say balsa wood, Mr. Pyre said as two assistants dressed in beautiful sequins and feathers brought out two planks of balsa wood. One was given to the magician and the other was given to me. It smelled like what I thought balsa wood would smell like. It was cold and smooth to the touch as I felt the material, as Mr. Pyre yelled for us to break our wood. Mr. Ryder snapped his plank easily, and the next plank brought out was made out of oak, as Mr. P Ryder also prepared to snap it. I tried to snap the balsa wood in my hand. It did not break. It did not bend. My hands stung as I struggled to snap it, to break it, or even to get it to bend just a little. And yet the balsa wood was unfazed. There was a gasp in the audience as they saw me struggle to break of the weak wood. I tried breaking it over my knee, only for my knee to sting and I almost bent over in pain. While I struggled to snap the balsa wood, Mr. Ryder moved on to iron bars that bent in his hands like they were made out of rubber. His strength was clearly much greater than my own. You can't even break balsa wood? I thought that Argentums are strong, Mr. Pyre said as I tried to break it with my foot and pulled it up with my hand. And still, Mr. Ryder stood there, silently, judging me, unable to break the wooden board, while the audience whispered, and then as they whispered, they began to boo at me. It started with just a few in the back, but as it spread, soon it felt like the entire audience was booing at me. 
When I saw my friends in the front of the row, they weren't booing at me, but I could see disappointment in the eyes of my sister. When I saw that disappointment, something in me broke as I let go of the balsa wood and it shattered on the stage. Well, you finally broke the balsa wood. Let's see if you can break some tougher materials, Mr. Pyre said as an oak board was brought out. The audience still booed at me as I picked up the board and snapped it between two fingers on my left hand. I barely noticed as an iron bar was brought out. Where Mr. Ryder made the iron bar bend, the bar shattered into iron dust as I dropped it onto the stage. The boos from the audience continued. Although you both have proven yourselves quite strong, I'm afraid Mr. Ryder did them all first, so I will have to give the win to him. Don't worry. There is another chance for you to prove yourself a true Argentum. You've proven your mastery over fire and strength. Now our final test is a simple one. You will have to hit a target with a knife. Surely a simple test for one as accomplished as yourself, Mr. Pyre said as there were two targets brought onto the stage. The magician stood on one side of the stage as he waited for me to start. The boos in the audience stopped as I nodded and I stood next to the magician. I blinked away my tears as I tried to focus on this test. This was my final test. I had to focus on hitting the target. Everything was dependent on me winning this. All you need to do is stay calm and accept what is happening, and you got this, Mr. Ryder whispered to me as I shook off the advice. I couldn't focus on my failures. I had to ignore my failures. I had to get past this. I was the greatest. I am Autumn Abigail Argentum. I am always one of the best by default getting the best grades in class, being the best at sports. I was always the most popular. I was strong. I was powerful. I had to focus on being powerful if I was going to win this. Mr. Ryder threw his first knife. It hit the target, but it was fairly far from the center of the target. He nodded as the audience did some partway applause as it was now my turn to throw the knife. I had thrown knives for school and as a hobby. It wasn't even the hardest target I faced. So I held the knife by the blade as I pulled my hand back and I flung my arm forward, letting my wrist flick while my elbow locked. The knife flung forward, but the target must have been a lot farther than I thought. The knife didn't even make it a quarter across the stage before it fell to the ground. Well, that was a great throw if your target was the stage. Next time, Abigail, aim for the target. Who knows, if you actually aim for the target, you might get closer to it, Mr. Pyre said unhelpfully to an audience that laughed at his words. I could even see Summer covering her mouth at the joke. She was trying not to laugh, but you could tell she was laughing with everyone else. My cheeks flushed as the magician lined up his next throw. He got slightly closer on the target, but he was still far from the brilliant center of the target. I don't know how he managed to do it, but he got a much better score than I did before. Now I had to try and focus on getting closer to the target. I took a deep breath and I pulled my arm back. The muscles tensed as I put all of my strength into the throw. I aimed a lot higher as I threw the knife across the stage. And still the knife didn't even make it halfway across the stage. It slid across the floor and came to a stop when Mr. Pyre stepped on the blade 
causing it to stop moving forward. Well now, stabbing me won't fix anything. But don't worry, you have one last chance, he said as the audience was silent, while the magician lined up his next shot. He threw with all of his might, and still, the knife barely hit the outer edge of the target. Even the magician struggled with this test. Although it was my last throw, my last chance. There was no way I was going to win. I wasn't good enough to be an arcana like the magician. He was a being so powerful that he didn't die. He only reincarnated. Immune to judgment, he laughs at putty things like time, entropy, and death. A power so great it would take a cardomancer to control or even use his power. I was no one. I was a normal human. A nobody that was taken in by a powerful family without their knowledge. A parasitic bird. That was what I was to the Argentums. And that was what I was here. Nothing special about me. And I was going to prove it to everyone. I didn't even bother trying with my final throw. I lifted my hand and flung it forward and let the blade go. I didn't even expect to get a meter ahead of myself. Instead, the blade flew straight and true. It flew with power I definitely did not throw into it, and it hit the center of the target. Not quite the exact center, but far closer than any of the magician's throws. He glanced towards the magician, and for the first time he made eye contact with me. Hi, Sue Technin? The magician asked me in Argivian, while I shook my head, indicating I had no knowledge of that old language, before he switched to Ingovanek. Fel Quen, he said, like telling me then fall queen, meant anything to me. I am certain it had something to do with that old Albion playwright that Kel was going on about earlier, but if he was going to make a reference to me, he should have used a reference I would understand. He bowed deeply, and there was applause in the audience, before suddenly there was silence. Not silence like the crowd stopped, silence like the television was muted all at once. I turned to the audience, and the theater was empty, leaving only my friends in the front row, who looked around, not sure where everyone else went. Now it was just the magician and myself on the stage. No props, nor anything. Just me and the arcana. Somehow, being alone with the magician made things far, far more intimidating than being alone with Mr. Pyre. Well, Abigail, I'm certain that you must know what the tests were now. They were illusions meant to be impossible to pass? I asked the magician, who nodded with a chuckle. Indeed, someone has been brushing up on their Ostman Moor. Everyone and every test in the theater has been a trick. The candle you tried to light? He produced the two candles from his sleeves, and I could see that they weren't white wax like I thought. They were transparent and very cold. I could feel the cold from them as he held the candle close to my face before he pulled them away having them drop to the floor, breaking into many pieces. The candles were made of ice. You cannot burn ice. Burning water may be possible, but certainly not ice. However, I was impressed by your ability to trick the audience into believing that melting ice was melting wax, and that you lit an invisible flame, the magician said. But if the audience was an illusion, then I didn't fool anyone. 
he told the magician, who lifted a single index finger, wagging it at me like I made a mistake. Not everyone in the audience was an illusion. You convinced your friends, and that was more than enough for me. A small audience is still an audience. Although I do admit the boos were all me. Your friends never stopped cheering you on. Although I did have to cover that up for your next tests. Can you guess what it was that you were breaking on the stage? He asked, and I thought about it for a minute. When I was confident and I was willing to do anything to break it, the material was unbreakable, and yet when I put hardly any effort into it, it shattered easily. What kind of material gets stronger when you use more force, but it gets weaker when you lose less force? I can only think of one thing. Was it myself? Was I trying to break myself on stage in front of everyone? I asked the magician, who stared at me for a moment before he laughed. Yourself? Well, not quite. You have the right idea. It is a bit more conceptual than that. A bit more inside of yourself than yourself. So I will give you a hint. The strongest beings on earth would struggle to break these blocks, unable to even crack at the slightest, while the weakest beings would break these blocks just by breathing on it. The magician said as I thought about it a bit more. What does a strong person possess that's stronger than their strength? What does a weak person possess that's weaker than their weakness? I twisted the terms in my mind, trying to think conceptually. Still, unlike Kel and Marceline, I don't think conceptually very often. Metaphysics only gave me a headache, so I stuck with regular metaphysics. Is it their confidence? I asked and the magician chuckled. So close. Someone who is powerful and knows they're powerful will have a lot of pride in themselves. While having a lot of pride doesn't necessarily make someone strong, it does make their pride stronger than themselves. Someone who knows their own weakness, who possesses good humility, will be stronger than their own pride. So, I had to have the audience boo you, cause you to weaken your pride, until it was weaker than yourself. You will face many obstacles, Autumn. However, your pride will hold you back far more than your anxieties. Knowing that you are stronger than your pride will help you push yourself to new heights. However, you will need to master pride before you let it push you where you cannot escape. The magician warned, and I nodded, thinking I finally understood. I was so confident and so proud, and when it vanished, even when I broke those unbreakable items, there was no warmth in my heart. There was no warm and fuzzy feeling from winning. I barely acknowledged it, and I know deep in my heart, I don't want to ever feel that way again. I will need to be stronger than my pride, but I will not let my pride go. Not completely. And for your final test, we both faced the same obstacle. That target is something very few people will ever achieve. Weak, strong, wise, idiotic, magical, mundane, exoteric, or esoteric. Very few make that target. However, if you think about it, I am sure you know what that target was. Even though you didn't hit it, Perfectly, you got far closer than I, and trust me, that is a far greater achievement than anything you've won in this casino. He said as I thought about it for a moment. It was like the pride challenge, but it wasn't pride holding me back. I lost most of it in the challenge before. It was definitely inside me. I stopped thinking of myself as an Argentum. 
I thought of myself as just another human, just another cautionary warning in the fairy tales, just another fool who's way over her head, someone who thought she had everything figured out, only to be outsmarted at every turn. It wasn't feeling bad that did it. If it was, then I would have hit the target on the first try. I started seeing my mistakes, and I realized that they were mistakes. I was no longer justifying my actions. I realized that I hurt Kel, Falling Grace, and even Marceline and Dylan, who practically felt like they were made of granite. I was acknowledging my mistakes. There was a word for it. It took me far longer to come up with the word than I cared to admit. I was raised to always think of it in negative terms. Only weak people admitted mistakes. Only kiss asses said they were sorry. Only losers knew defeat. Only failures failed and only humans needed to learn their place. Finally, the correct word came to mind. A word that was so rarely used, and the context was always negative, that I didn't think it would ever be used in something like this. Acceptance. The targets were acceptance of my limits. I asked the magician, who nodded and smiled. A genuine smile not a smile of performance. Indeed, acceptance is something that is very difficult for people to acknowledge, let alone ever learn. It's easy to keep hearing about constant growth, constant strength, constant change. It is far harder to accept things as they are. You certainly won't need to all the time, but as you saw, even I struggle with accepting things the way they are. When you're born into power, it's far easier to say that you just change whatever you want. Accepting who you are, your limits, and your humanity, well, congratulations, Autumns. You and your friends deserve to head into Morris's mind. Magician said as the curtain in the back lifted, revealing a steel door. Although I think you will have a lot to tell your friends, he said as he walked off the stage into the darkness. After an awkward few seconds of pulling everyone onto the stage, we made our way to the door, but before it opened, I opened my mouth. I want to apologize for how I was acting tonight. I wanted to carry the team. I thought that if I was right, we would have fun, that we would get through easily, but I have been wrong so many times. And I think, no, I know that I have said things that have hurt you all. I am sorry. None of you deserve to be treated that way. I will do what I can to step back and let things happen. However, I know that I will have struggles, times where I make bad choices, times where I feel so conflicted I don't know what is or isn't the right choice, times where I say something far harsher than what is needed, Times where I believe I know best. Times where I cannot let go of my pride long enough to listen. But I will also do everything I can to make sure that I will learn and that I will listen. That I will loosen my pride. I will let go of some of the invisible strings in my mind holding me to impossible standards. I will do everything I can to untie these impossible, invisible strings from those around me, from the people, the situations, the circumstances, and for myself.
I know it is hard to accept what I am doing as genuine when I have made many mistakes, but I will earn your trust the long way by showing you that I care about and love you all. As proud as I am, as bound as I am, as rigid as I am, and as callous as I am, I do care and love you all far more than you know. So, I hope we can make the best out of the rest of our night, I said as the others nodded. Apology accepted, Gal said with his trademark smile. I am certain we will have a good night, Marceline said, her eyes bright with the fires within. Sure, I accept it. Just be more careful next time, Dylan said as Summer just nodded. No words needed to be said. Falling grace was the hardest. I acknowledge your apology. However, I do not accept it at this time. If and only if I see changed behavior, I will accept your apology then. This time, your apology is acknowledged. However, I am not accepting it. So you will have to live with that guilt. For now, she said. I nodded and I caught a reflection of myself in the middle door. Yeah, I understand what you mean, I told her as I knew that I didn't accept the apology of the girl in the mirror. Not yet, at least. However, I still had a feeling that there would be a day where I could look in the mirror and I would see myself as I am, not as a failed copy of my sister. Let's see what's in Morris's mind, Summer said as she twisted the doorknob, and she opened it, revealing the industrial darkness inside. There is silence as the river sunset scent disappears along with summer. Autumn lets out a sigh, not necessarily out of relief, but of knowledge. She now knows it wasn't her, and she can wait her turn with the anticipation much worse than the actual act of being taken. The steel in her piercings itches as she now smells her own candle. The smell of deep ocean fills the darkness with the last two treats left as the voice speaks. Speaking from one of the chairs, where if Dylan or even Autumn turned to look at the source, the voice switched to another seat. But if they're careful and only look out of the corner of their eyes, they can dimly see a humanoid figure sitting on the seat, sitting on all of the seats. The friends are now surrounded with many figures who all speak with one voice, but only one speaks at a time. In this darkness, only the candles offer warmth, and one speaks unseen, and another observes unseen, far more curious, as the voice continues their story, and Autumn's turn is finally here. After escaping Fair Verona, you can make your way into the Morris's mine, a mine that is quite old. For centuries, the gold in this mine kept Vandenberg wealthy, and the original owner of the mine is still around, Mr. Pyre. The gold helped keep the casino open, and wealth is something that Mr. Pyre covets above all else. As Mr. Pyre dug deeper and deeper into the mine, something deep inside was released, something that made its way into the water, poisoning and changing first to the miners, and then making its way into the city. The changes were so quick and without warning that all of the miners were changed without even a chance to warn anyone else. The mine was sealed off by the government, well, they had the chance, but Mr. Pyre kept his personal tunnel into the mine open, though the reason why is not known by anyone. 
The mine is very dangerous. To enter it, you will need a full environmental suit and your own supply of oxygen. The mutated water isn't just liquid here. It is also a gas in the form of steam, mist, and condensation that falls from the ceiling. It will mutate anyone who is exposed in mere seconds. The water is purest in the mine, undiluted, and close to the source of the event. So the enemy that lives in the mines are the most dangerous you will encounter. You will find miners who were mutated in their own suits, exposed through small tears or even by taking off their respirators for just a few moments, exposing their insides to the mutation, causing them to change into the enemy. Now merged with their suits, tools, and even the mine itself, they now continue to mine deep in the darkness. They no longer seek gold, metal, wealth, nor secrets. The enemy in these tunnels are seeking to unleash more of the source that has caused the event. Because even now, the source isn't fully unleashed you will be given a chance to fully seal away the source that caused the mutations. It will not undo everything that has been done. It likely won't even be noticed for a long time, but you can sleep well knowing you kept things from getting worse. And if you've seen the source, you will understand why it was important to seal it away. The lowest level of the mine you will find a shaft that goes even deeper. At the bottom of that shaft is the remnants of a dark tomb. Surrounded by water, the tomb acts like an island in the underground river. Black steps are made from a material that is nearly unbreakable and, impo and impossible for human hands to shape. These steps extend far below the water. For how long, no one truly knows, because none who have tried to explore it have ever come back. On the top of the dace is a sarcophagus, over four meters long and carved with many horrifying prophecies of the world ending in many horrifying ways. A promise of what would happen if what is trapped inside ever gets out. Four chains hold the sarcophagus lid shut, and they are held down by nails made out of the same nearly unbreakable material. It is here the miners are hard at work, spending weeks just trying to loosen one single nail, and if given enough time, they will succeed. And as for where the mutagen comes from, at the back of the sarcophagus, there is a single hairline fracture, barely the width of a human hair. And yet from this crack, a watery black fluid drips out of the sarcophagus and leaches into the water around the dace. All of this death and mutation is because of a single crack. A single crack that killed an entire city and nearly wiped out humanity. Can you seal the crack? Or maybe you can find another way to keep the miners from loosening the prison or widening the crack. But don't get too close to the sarcophagus. What is inside cannot get out, but it hungers greatly and its power is great enough to manipulate those around its prison. If it knows you're nearby, it will convince you to feed yourself to itself. The sarcophagus has a single opening big enough for someone to slide in, and if you do go inside, you will see what lives in the sarcophagus. Though to call it living would be misleading. It is neither living nor dead. The darkness inside of the sarcophagus is too small. What is inside of it is far too large. It has many teeth. It has many more eyes. And it hungers. The source always hungers and it always feeds. Every death of those eaten is repeated over 
and over for all of eternity. Every time a fresh new hell as the source consumes your essence into a more and more basic form until there is nothing left of you after countless deaths. How long will this take? I cannot say. The source is still eating the very first thing that ever fell in its maw. The source's power is great and it is ancient. Before the sun was ever formed, it was trapped in the sarcophagus. And if it is ever released, the planet, the solar system, and even our galaxy are far too small places for the source to exist in or even care about. If you manage to seal the source away, then you may find a single boat that leads away. Ride the boat and you will be taken far from the Morris Mine. Following the underwater river, you can see in the dim light of the boat's lantern, you can see the water clear from black to blue, and then clear as the world around you heals and you make your way home. When the river takes you out of the mine, you will make your way to an isolated house. This is the only way off the boat because the river ends here and the yard is surrounded by tall fences. And the only way out is to go into the house at the center of it all. The first room just beyond the entrance was a locker room. There were seven different lockers, each with our name on it. The room, however, did not actually smell like a locker room. It did have the smell of rust and iron, however, it did not reek of sweat, fungus, hormones, and anger. And then again, I only had a secondary school locker room to compare it to, so maybe not all locker rooms smelled that way. Still, the feeling was there. It was set, not the actual place. Most of the pumpkin house had that feeling. It felt like it was a place made to look a certain way. However, what it actually was, it was something very different. It was still entertaining, but it was also felt a bit distracting at times. Like watching a movie and understanding how all of the effects work. Sure, it can still be entertaining, but you still find yourself thinking about the effects rather than what is on the screen. The lockers were lockers, and the names on them were just written ahead of time for us. Sure, it might be difficult to write the names ahead of time, but that was why there was so much time spent on Autumn's test. It gave them time to set up the equipment. I opened the door with my name, and I found an odd-looking rubber suit. There were layers in the rubber, and metal at the wrists, calves, and neck were made of brass, so it was easy for me to grab. The front was made to be stepped into, and sure enough, even with my shoes on, I could step through, leaving plenty of space, though at first it did leave my hands, head, and feet exposed. Thankfully, the diagram on the inside of the locker guided us through how to tuck our hair into the rubber hood before putting on the respirator and then the safety helmet, and then finally we put on our boots and then the gloves last. Even if this locker was false, this personal protective equipment was clearly legitimate. It even had an emergency air supply on our back with a portable AC and equipment on our belts. The diagram also told us to leave our backpacks inside the lockers with the promise they would be returned to us. So we left our bags inside. Weirdly enough, the suits were designed to fit us all perfectly. They even had one perfectly sized for Fallen Grace, and there was no way in hell they would have randomly guessed this. Did Adonsi use some of her omniscience for this, or was this some other trick? The equipment was clearly real, and even though the magician's power is great, he was supposed to be an illusionist, and a master at sleight of hand. I examined myself in the mirror. Goggles, respirator, gloves, and reflective rubber made me unrecognizable underneath the equipment. There was a large number one on my arm, and there were numbers on the others. Number two on Autumn, that I was near certain that the house was using to just mess with her just a little bit. 
She always wanted to be first, and by assigning her second, they were making her close to the first, while also denying it to her. A little insult that would have been invisible to others, but clear to both Autumn and myself. Kel was number three, and he was having trouble putting on his goggles, so Dylan, number four, was trying to help him get the goggles on, while Marceline, number five, watched trying to offer advice, and Fallen Grace, number six, was sitting on Marceline's shoulder, strapped in as she was trying not to fall over laughing, while Kel somehow got his goggles on the back of his head. Always something with that guy, but he was having fun. Although it was the seventh locker that was strange, the name on it was difficult to read. Because it was written badly, but because it wasn't written with a true name. The, na the name written on it felt fluid and false. It was made to be recognized by the one who it was made for, but it wasn't their true name. They didn't think of themselves this way. It wasn't what they were named, and it wasn't what they called themselves but it was made for them to recognize it when they came here. Although it was strange to have a seventh locker, there were only six of us here, although the dining table was set for seven. The woman in the maze was expecting seven people, and there were seven seats in the train. My first thought was we had someone unseen among us, although nothing I could see through my second sight showed anyone following us. Not even nobody special was following us. Although there are plenty of things in the world that are hidden from sight without being unseen, having a second sight was not the same thing as seeing everything. Microscopic life was still unseen to me, along with things that moved below or above us in both a metaphysical and pataphysical space. Then, of course, there was time, Someone or something could just as easily be watching or even following us from the past or from the future. It is hard to think of the past as a living thing since it has already passed, but it still lives as the roots of our world, often having unseen effects on the present. And then the future is the branches that are yet to be, so even if a future isn't guaranteed to happen, does not mean that the future isn't watching us right now. Still, why the seventh suit when there are, there's only six of us? There was always six of us. I felt a tap on my shoulder and I turned to see Autumn. In her suit, she was muffled as she tried to speak. So after a moment of trying to be heard clearly, she switched to Imperial Sign Language. Why stare there? She asked with an exaggerated shrug to show she was confused. Sign language usually depended on very expressive faces or movements to indicate tone and emotion. Inside these suits, all we had was body movement to show what we meant. I signed back, weird locker. I said with my own shrug to indicate I was also confused about why it was there. That done, we turned away from the locker, with the suit inside being numbered 7, as we made our way back to the other. Kel's suit now on properly, he showed us the button on the belt for the radios. Now these are through the earth or TTE radio signals. They use low frequency radio waves through the wires in the mine that allow us to communicate. Please note, though, these messages are not at all private, so anything we say will be heard by anyone in the mine that has a radio. So anything that needs to stay private, try to use ISL. And please don't remove your equipment. We have to stay safe, Kel said, and we nodded as the door to the mine squeaked. My turn to lead, I said through the radio, confident that everyone in the mine heard what I said. I had to give everyone a chance to hear it and to prepare their scares. The door was iron with a large locking wheel. I quietly thanked the fact I was wearing rubber gloves. I traded a silent glance back to Fallen Grace. Living in the exoteric world pretty much guaranteed you were living in a world that was never built for you. Certain metals burned and even poisoned you when you touched it. 
The rules were built on different assumptions. Even customs on what is or isn't polite is all based on assumptions that don't apply to you. Asking for names and providing names casually at every first meeting was borderline suicidal for someone like myself. So it's painful for it to be expected in everywhere I go. So my glance back to Fallen Grace was meant to convey the fact that we were both outsiders here. So at least we were both outsiders together. I couldn't tell if Fallen Grace was looking my way, but I was certain that she was thinking the same thing I was. I spun the door lock until finally the seal broke, and there was a rush of air as I pulled the door open. As I opened it, Autumn held the door open. I stepped through, and my first thought about the mine was the ceiling was shorter than I was expecting. It was barely a few centimeters above my helmet. The stone above had lines of wires stapled to the rock. There was a single light every five meters, giving enough light to guide the way forward, but leaving darkness so that something could hide inside of it. Flipping on the light on our helmets, I led forward, Autumn holding my hand and everyone else holding hands through the darkness. Going first through a haunt has a lot of downsides. Anything that can scare you will get to you first before anyone else. Although a good haunt like this one will also have unique scares for those in the middle and the back of the group. The legend told us about a lot of the crypt, but very little about any possible scares beforehand. As they led us forward, we made it to a large chamber that was clearly their refuge station. You could tell because there was a large aluminum sign announcing it as such. The chamber was large with various steel beams holding the walls up and steel fencing to keep any stray rocks away from the chamber. A good mine will have multiple refuge stations to act as a place for miners to hide until help arrives. A way of making a dangerous job safer, but most assuredly not safe. I spent so much time looking above that I forgot to look below before I felt the group behind me pull back for a moment, so I looked down to see what everyone else saw. There were miner suits left behind. The shiny rubber was smeared with something brown that I was glad I couldn't smell through the respirator. There were no bodies left over, but that didn't make things any better. They left their suits behind, and because they weren't torn at all, it meant that they removed their suits before they were killed or taken. In one of the gloves, I saw a leather-bound journal. I opened it, and I quickly read it over. Every single page was full of names, hundreds of names, just their name, age, and their role in the mine. Maybe an attendance journal? at least until the final pages of the journal, where there was an answer about what happened here. October 1st, 2758. There was an explosion in the lower level of the mine. Per the emergency response plan, we made our way to the refuge station. We are waiting for rescue, but no rescue has arrived. The doorway leading out of the mine is sealed from the other side. We keep trying to call Mr. Pyre, but he only has one message for us. Keep working. October 3rd, 2758. The water in the sinks and showers have turned black with some, from some kind of pollutant from deeper in the mine. The change was sudden. Those who showered in the dirty water developed boils under their skin, and they cannot wear clothes. We can see movement underneath the boils. Something is swimming underneath their skin. We tried popping some of the boils, but it only spreads the black pus around. Anyone who, start, who touches it also starts to develop the rash, and the boils form soon after. Mr. Pyre's voice still comes through the radio when we try to call, and there is only ev ever one response. Keep working. 
October 4th, 2758. Those who are infected have made their way deeper into the mines. They leave their suits behind and they keep muttering about how they need to work. I don't know what they're doing deeper in the mine, but the water is getting worse. Even when it's aerosolized, it gets in our lungs. It causes changes on the inside. I watched as someone had their lungs fill with the water, coughing up the viscous mixture of water, blood, and pollution. A few of us are wearing the suits, but it's inside of us all now. I know it's inside of me. A boil has formed on my shoulder, and when I look at it in the mirror, the boil opens its eye, and it blinks at me. Whatever this mutation is, it's getting worse, and I can hear the call beneath the mine. Whatever it is, it's connecting to me, and it wants me to release it all the way. I tried putting on my suit, but still the water must have gotten inside. I cannot remove the suit. Not anymore. The clasps have corroded and rusted. When I try to force it open, I bleed through my suit. I can feel through the rubber. My nerves have grown into it. When I tried cutting off the suits, my skin beneath was rotten and bloody. My pickaxe is merged with the glove. I cannot let it go. I know that the voice beneath wants me to use it to release it. October 5th, 2758. I am the last one here. I can no longer resist the voice. I think the world above is worse than below, and I have to let it out. It promises to fix everything if we just let it out. So, I will let it out. The journal ends there, and I carefully leave it where it was. Mr. Pyre ordered the miners to keep working after the event, and it took mere days for everyone to change into the enemy. And this is where it all started, and they had the most time to change. The Overseer and the Dreadnought were already terrifying, and they didn't have two weeks of practically living with the mutagen. I pointed the way deeper into the mine, and I led with six following behind. The lights here continue to not be very strong, but I could see evidence of the dirty water dripping from the ceiling and the walls. Condensation was not unheard of in mines, although most condensation was not the same color as blood. We passed from the light into darkness as our steps started to crunch and squish at the same time. It was better not to look at it. I stepped through the darkness and into the light, where I saw more water, both black and red, drip down from above. The wires above buzzed and pulsed at the same time, leaking the fluid that should have shorted out the electric wires. I noticed the walls were twitching with movement beneath the stone. Something moved underneath the stone. Maybe it was digging. However, my senses told me something else. It told me that the mine was breathing, and that what I was feeling beneath the stone was the pulses of the mine's blood vessels. I turned a corner, and the lights ahead were soaked in blood. Casting red light below, I could see something coating the walls. Stepping forward, I could see there was more graffiti on the walls, more names inscribed on the walls, names, ages, and their job titles in spray paint, all of which gradually being washed away by the dirty water, leaving it barely readable. The event wipes away their names, their individuality, and their humanity turning them from people into another casualty of the event. A crisis so severe it shaped our entire world. A crisis so powerful that people changed their lives around it, forever changing the world into before the event and after the event. And yet, here we were, 
so many victims that we can never learn them all. Their memory forever reduced to a name on a memorial, wiped away by the very thing that caused them to be memorialized. The tunnel led to another chamber. Instruction lights at the edge of the room lit up the entire chamber. The floor was made from rock and stone, but the real story was above us. Dangling above us were numerous coffins, suspended above by tree roots, holding the dangling coffins above us. I could see a few coffins had holes in them. Inside of them, I could see bones. We're beneath the crooked cemetery, I said over the radio, and the seven others nodded solidly. This wasn't made after the event. The enemy would not have had an interest in setting up construction sites beneath dead bodies. They could only affect the living, and there was no trace of the enemy here. Mr. Pyre must have found more to mine here. He did not care about disturbing the dead where they lay. He only wanted to gain more. So here we were, the bones of the dead suspended by only by the bones of the trees long dead above. The apparent exit was a gate carved from stone. It resembled the columns from Argiv, and above the gate, written in sulfur, was an inscription in Old Latin. Most of the inscription was carved out by the miners, probably trying to get the silver for their boss, but they did not have time to remove all of it before they headed further or into the mine. Spem deponite. Abandon hope, I said through the radio, and behind me, five others in their minor suits followed along. The others remained behind. I know that they have been following us. They were quiet, they were cautious, but I know how many people were in my group. I didn't say anything because addressing them would have made paranoia and distrust much worse. But as long as they didn't mess with us, I didn't say anything. I walked through the hell gate first, followed closely by my sister and the others. Here, things changed quickly from the mine. The electric lights got much further apart, most of them flickering and weak in the darkness. The ceiling was also much higher, so we could all walk without hunching over. And unlike the mine, these tunnels weren't just carved with mining equipment. These were made out of limestone, and as far as I can tell, there was not a single seam nor tool mark. I touched the wall with my glove, and even through the glove, I could feel the shape of shell and bone underneath. As tempting as it was to say that they were that they carved the tunnel out of limestone, that was not how it felt. It felt more like the stone was formed into the shape. Across millions of years from the bottom of the ocean, these tunnels formed, and from those millions of years, they were formed around something in the middle, something I am certain was the center of this event. We continued down the limestone tunnel, and as we did, we passed by alcoves. They each held statues of strange things. The first we passed was of something that was insect-like, shaped perfectly out of the limestone. I could see the three-meter-tall statue. It had six legs, and the body was shaped like a spider's abdomen, with a symbol like an omega on the body. The thorax was like a centipede, curving as it went up and up. The arms were like that of a mantis, sharp even as a sculpture, and open and eager to consume its prey. The head was the most disturbing part. It was carved to resemble a human woman, her eyes closed and her hair very long, practically down to the ground. The next statue was similar to an angel, similar in the way that the face was smooth and featureless. 
The wings were plentiful and blocked out the body, leaving it unclear if the statue had a body at all, or if it only was wings. The statue did not touch the ground, and we moved on carefully to get away from the statue, careful not to attract the attention. These statues unsettled me far more than the twisted dolls of the maze. Those were made to represent victims of a tragedy. These beings were the cause of them. The final alcove we passed by was the simplest. It stood at only two meters tall, the same height as a human. It was shaped like a person, but no features were visible. It was covered in a sheet made of limestone, not looking dissimilar to a ghost or a funeral shroud. I could see hands peeking out underneath the sheet, and the feet were also peeking out wearing sandals. It must have been a statue of a ghost, since it was covered in the funeral shroud. That was actually where the trope of ghosts wearing sheets came from. The old stories told about ghosts appearing in their funeral shroud or funeral clothes. The stories became popular enough they spread throughout the world, and then ghosts in sheets became popular enough and safe enough to make the ghosts appropriate for children at Feralia. It is interesting to think about because people love to complain about how the monsters of their generation are made into the friends or misunderstood creatures of the next generation. The classic undead serial killer goes from a haunting and hunting in a lake to the next generation's campy camp counselor teaching children about bullying and the importance of swimming. An existential threat of radiation and disharmony returned from the dead haunts the lost generation of the 2720s, becomes a video game antagonist in the 2770s for children aged 8 or older, where plants fight the living dead. Just an existential threat representing a giant cultural anxiety that was felt by most of the planet, now something that is easy to understand and conquer. A lot of people feel angry about this, seeing an old fright reduced to a joke, not realizing this has always been the natural progression of fears. Making a joke out of something that used to scare you or even scare others, sometimes what it represents is no longer a threat. And sometimes what it represents is still a threat, but you wish to face it, so you make it a joke. Even knowing all of this information, facing the statue of the ghost in the funeral shroud struck terror into my heart. Millennia of fear of death, ghosts, and spirits returning after death filled my heart as ice filled my veins, and I walked by the statue. As I did so, I took a deep breath before I turned to face the group. I could see everyone looking towards me as I held two hands out. My left hand open, fingers splayed out with my palm facing myself, while my right hand was in a fist with only the thumb sticking up like a knife. My right hand and thumb bounced a few times, miming stabbing myself with my thumb. And the others saw it and they nodded as they turned back to face forward. All I had was a feeling, but I trusted that feeling and I shared it with the others and they were all in agreement. We were in danger and the danger was shown by that statue. I am pretty certain we were going to have to deal with the ghosts of the mind soon enough. We traveled forward to another large chamber more construction lights were here, and I looked up and up as I saw numerous statues in the chamber. All of them are statues of the figures in shrouds, and I could not see the ceiling of this chamber, just a never-ending spiral of ghosts that went up seemingly forever. The way forward seemingly being a spiral staircase in the center of it all, leading down. More limestone steps shaped by unimaginable forces that shaped all of this place from one solid rock. Unimaginably powerful forces that sculpted these statues and this chamber. 
that the miners discovered, and still they went deeper into the place that warned them to abandon hope as they came closer to the end. Adansi, what have you done? Why are you like this? I asked no one in particular, not even bothering to put it on the radio. She always did something scary for the pumpkin house, but why did she carve something like this? This far bypassed the classic story about haunted mines, and now it was something else entirely. A level of horror I didn't realize she was capable of. A dread that only deepened as we continued. I made my way to the stairwell, where I found the first imperfection of the entire limestone temple. Carved into the first step was a single sentence written in common creole. The writing wasn't chiseled. It looked like it was written by running a finger through the stone before it was set. Like signing wet cement with a finger before it had a chance to cure. Except limestone didn't work that way. And even if it did, then this would have had to set millions of years before humanity ever evolved. That alone was terrifying enough. But what was written was somehow more haunting. I miss my family, the message said. The only imperfection made millions of years ago before the language it was written in would ever be discovered, and that was the message? I shuddered as I made my way down the dark steps. Like everything else in the limestone temple, it was not lit. We must be getting close to where the center of it all was. I ran my hand on the left wall as we passed more and more alcoves. These alcove statues weren't ghosts, nor the monsters we saw before. They were people. Each one of them is carved from limestone, every face unique, clothing worn from every era, every age, every gender, every race. The only similarity between them all was the fact that inside their carved sockets, instead of eyes of limestone, was eyes made from gold. The shiny gold followed us and glittered even without the light. We passed them as I felt the eyes follow me, as I began to notice imperfection and damage in some of the statues. One of them, a woman in a long dress, had her head missing, revealing that the statue was solid throughout her head, nowhere to be seen. Another was a figure with the arm broken, and the statue looked like it was nursing its broken arm, the broken bones visible inside the broken off part, along with the muscle and tissue, all made from limestone. So strange that there were so many ghosts above, and so many people down below. Almost like the idea of life and death were reversed. Death above and life below. Although I had no proof that any of these figures were based on real people, or even if they were supposed to be alive, they could just have easily been memorials for the dead, formed millions of years ago before humanity evolved. Yeah, there was something strange happening here. As I made it further, I found flecks of paint in the statues, Soon, those flecks had more and more paint on it. Eventually, the statues were completely painted in a way that looked disturbingly human. I passed by a man in his fifties who had smile lines on his face. His golden eyes watching me as I stepped by, trying not to disturb the statue, fearing he may be an actor. I passed by a young child. Her skin burned so severely, I had no idea how she was supposed to be alive. Her golden eyes cast down, sadly, not even making eye contact with us, but still following us as we made our way further down. Every statue was a wonder that I wished we could take a picture of, but we had to continue. Whatever these golden eye statues represented, I could feel it deep in my bones 
that there was power in this place. These statues weren't just made to look pretty. They were the focus and locus of something powerful. Something that even now was watching us. And all I could do was hope it would not try to scare us. The landing on the bottom was in front of a painted statue. The most detailed statue yet. It depicted a young girl with dark skin, wearing a very large hat with ribbons, in all colors, including purple. Her dress was painted in smeared and red paint, showing handprints and fingerprints across her dress of yellow and white. The front of her chest was open, and we could see her ribs and her internal organs, covered in a layer of slimy-looking blood. Her heart and lungs were still, but it looked like it could start beating at any minute. Her brown eyes underneath her hat lacked any shine, but still the eyes felt like they were following me. Wait, brown eyes? All of the statues down here had golden eyes. This statue wasn't a statue. As the others got down where Marceline saw the young girl at the statue, she fell to her knees and even through the respirator, I could hear her crying. She was sobbing at the feet of the statue. I could see Fallen Grace trying to comfort her while we turned to each other as we were all confused why this one statue broke her down so much. We had seen worse things in the countryside in the rail yard, so why was one statue with one girl with one exposed heart too much for Marceline? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. What could have done this to you? I heard Marceline say through the radio to the silence of the statue and the group. I then noticed in front of the statue were seven candles and a single long lighter that could we could use in our gloves. Marceline glanced back up at the statue and the candle as she grabbed the lighter and lit the first candle before lighting all the others. The candles now lit, she began to sign to the statue, something she did not want to share with the entire mind, but despite this, I understood what she was saying. I think she wanted us to know. Hello, little sister. You were my hero. Perfect, strong, enduring, and compassionate. I have failed you. I have her with me, but I think I will lose her. I was never the hero. Marceline signed to the statue, which mystified me until I heard static on the radio. At first, the words were too soft to hear, but then gradually it cleared as I heard the voice of a little girl, a voice I never heard before, and yet when I heard her voice, it sounded like how I thought of my inner voice, a voice I never heard made real, and here it was on the radio. You don't build an ark after it starts raining. You don't bake bread before it finishes proofing. You have failed no one, least of all me, the voice said before the static cleared. I blinked behind my goggles and I realized I was tearing up from those words. I blinked away the tears and slowly Marceline stood and we turned around making our way out of the stairs onto the dais of the temple. In the very center of the dais was the sarcophagus. Symbols and words carved all along the sides of it, clear for everyone to see. While I did not understand all of the warnings in the languages I did understand, were all of the same warning. Do not open. The chains over the top of the sarcophagus held it down to the pillars at the edge of the dais. At each end, I saw the miners work on the chains, or what was left of the miners. Those with PPE were left barely more than skeletons of bone and iron. Their rusty bones creaked with every movement, banging away at the chains trying to break the chains. Those who were still wearing their PPE were given a chance to mutate into something else. 
I saw something that was used that used to be a person crawl forward on arms and legs made of rubber and flesh, eight spindly limbs with no hands nor feet that had a large mouth in the respirator, but no eyes behind the goggles as it gagged and spat something yellow and viscous on the chains, presumably a type of acid. I also oddly saw a miner with most of their equipment on, but I could see their skull through their goggles. They saw me, so they flashed a, me a thumbs up as they went back to the anchor, trying to release the source. They must have thought of us as more of the same because we all wore the same uniforms. On the sarcophagus, I could also see the source of the darkness that polluted the water. On the steps leading up to the sarcophagus was a single thin stream of jet black oil that seeped out of the sarcophagus. Without the oil, I never would have seen the crack at all. The oil fell to the water in a super thin line. So much death, so much destruction caused by such a small leak. It led into the water, and I could see that it turned all of the water surrounding the dice into something dark and polluted. Maybe this water was fresh and pure, but the leakage must have made it into the groundwater, and then it was pumped up into the aquifer that supplied Vandenberg with water. I will seal the leak, I signed to everyone else, only to have Autumn signed back. How? I removed one of the tools from the belt that was supplied to us. A single roll of duct tape. Did I believe that it could permanently stop the leak in the sarcophagus? Not really. But the story given to us by Adonsi seemed to imply that stopping the leak would allow the sarcophagus to either regenerate or repair itself, blocking the source from leaking out leading to the eventual end of the event and the eventual extinction of the enemy. Although I know that there had to be a risk, so I walked up those steps alone. Even as I made my way up those steps, the enemy did not notice me. To them, I was just another miner, another worker, another person trying to free the source. I wore the same clothes, I walked the same way, so clearly I was the same as them. Now in front of the crack, I could see the top of the sarcophagus, and the legend did not give it justice. I saw inscriptions of gold and silver showing a powerful and dark shape spreading across the earth, and spreading across the solar system, and spreading across our galaxy consuming it all. I saw on the sarcophagus lights going out, a near-infinite universe consumed under an infinite darkness, a power so great that it seemed impossible to contain, and something as insignificant as a sarcophagus. And yet, here it was. Where the head of the sarcophagus should be was a large dark hole, just big enough for me to crawl into if I wanted to. Around that hole were depictions of orbits and planets, forever flying around the never-ending black hole that seemed to get closer and closer to me. I did notice something inscribed over the hole leading into the sarcophagus. Almost an afterthought, but it was something that I could read. Clips, I said to myself, and I felt myself start to return to the present. I became aware of the fact that it was crawling on top of the sarcophagus, less than a meter from the black hole in the sarcophagus's face. Eclipse must have been the name of the entity inside of the sarcophagus. That knowledge made things a little easier. I became aware of the fact that the sarcophagus was trying to pull me into itself. However, having its name reduced some of its power, and gave me some power over it. There 
is power in names and being able to name that's what something is. A lot of people like to think of it as a magic word that can be said that gives complete control over something. And that is usually not how it works. On a much smaller scale, it is a way of acknowledging something and being able to see it. Throughout history, people struggled with diseases, illnesses, evils, and ordeals that they had no word for. They didn't understand why their parents were gone. They were gone. There was no word for death, no concept, no words for grief, no words to reassure what was happening because they didn't have the words to address such things. They just knew that they were gone and they had no other concept to explain their pain. So they couldn't explain it with the others. They couldn't heal from a wound that they couldn't see, let alone name. People felt so alone in history because they didn't know what they were. They just knew that they were different from those around them. They didn't have words for things like autistic, queer, neurodivergent, traumatized, disabled, or even unique. They only knew that they were different from those around them, so they assumed it was something wrong with them since they had no words to identify themselves other than being different or wrong. Massive events can occur in life and people can refuse to name it or what happened, preferring a polite silence over a rude addressing. All this time, all these struggles, we never bother to even think if the source of the event had a name. The cause of these horrible mutations was an eldritch being named Eclipse, whose blood was contaminating the world. Now with the entity's name, I found the crack, and I pulled out the duct tape, and I taped over the crack. One layer, then two, then three. Enough of a layer that I was certain it was fully contained. I could see that the oil no longer leaked from the sarcophagus, and after just a few seconds, the last of it beaded away into the water. The water began to clear, just slightly, but I could see the healing was beginning. Eclipse's blood could no longer flow into the water. It would take time to get better, but now at least, it was no longer getting worse. The other miners no longer worked on their tasks. They sat where they were, no longer attempting to free Eclipse. They could no longer hear the call of the Eldritch Beast, so they no longer had any purpose. Maybe in time the corruption will clear from their minds, freeing them to make their own choices. Or maybe it would never be free, and they it would only be another casualty of the event, never getting the chance to be human again. I made my way to the others, where they stood by a very long boat. The ferryman on the boat was underneath a dark cloak. The cloak wasn't pure black, but it was a dark midnight blue with true darkness underneath the hood. Pure darkness from which smoke gradually leaked out from underneath the hood. Like the ferryman was smoking. He grabbed a long pole of the same unbreakable metal that the chains were made from. His arms were skeletal, the bones yellow and cracked with age. There was gold filling between his cracks that made him also an amalgam of both bone and metal. Still, there were seven seats for us in the boat as we sat in five of them, with Fallen Grace still riding on her sister's shoulders. We sat in silence as the ferryman moved us further and further down the dark river, as in the dark tunnel, the only light from our headlamps. There was silence for a while before finally Dylan spoke up over the radio. Did we even do any good? The countryside burned down and we aren't sure that we saved anyone, he said before I responded over the radio. Dylan, it's easy to see everything we did wrong. However, that doesn't mean that inaction would have been a better choice. 
The event started regardless of our actions. People were hurt regardless of what we did. The only thing we did was stop the event. We have given the world a chance to get better. I know people love to point at people trying to help and say, they're no hero because people still got hurt. It's easy to say our actions caused more damage than good, but and we should be careful of our actions. However, being careful is not the same as not taking action. We did not harm anyone. We took action and we stopped the event. Yes, we will need to mourn those that are lost. The countryside, the rail yard, those lost in the casino, and of course all those poor miners. If you think that you are doing the wrong thing, by all means, examine your actions and see if there is a better action you can take. However, don't think that inaction is always the best answer. If we did nothing, do you think the event would have ended? No. Do you think that there would have been less casualties? Definitely not. Did we do anything that you considered wrong? He asked and he thought about it for a moment before shaking his head and signing. No. So, why do you think we didn't do any good? I asked him and he answered. I cannot help but feel like I should have done more. That if I managed to do more good, that we could have done better. I know it's a paradox, but I always have a feeling that I need to do better. A little voice always screaming in my head that it's not good enough. That there's always somewhere to improve, and it pushes me so far and so much. It feels like I've done nothing at all. I can spend 10 hours at work, and when the day ends, I feel like I should have done more because they're shorthanded. I can get 4.0 grades, and I feel like I should have done, should do more because teachers are offering extra credit. So it's technically possible to get above a 4.0. I can get everything done on my list, and at the end of the day, there's more to do. So yeah, logically, I know we did the right thing. It was just a bad thought that slipped out, he said as I slid up next to him holding his rubber glove hand in my own. Hey, Dylan, we did good. And besides, we still have one more place to explore together. It'll be your turn next, and you'll get a chance to lead us all, I said as I snuggled against him in our minor suits, which definitely made it awkward. But I like to think I comforted him in some. We continued in the darkness for a while longer our lights occasionally glancing over the wall drawings. I saw a story made in paint of a young girl falling down a hole, walking upside down in a new world before going back to her old world and bringing others down to her new world. The final part of the story showed everyone standing upside down with her and the world above was covered in ash and darkness. A strange story that sounded familiar somewhere, but I will have to ask Autumn when the trial ends. When we left the tunnel, we were in the middle of a moat that surrounded an old two-story house. The far side of the river was surrounded by iron fences. The house itself had no iron fence. It did, however, have a massive yard full of carved pumpkins each one with a different expression, each one lit inside by candles of many different colors. I saw candles with lights inside that were red, orange, blue, green, and even purple. I forgot how much I missed the color purple. In the Sunset Republic, the color isn't banned, so it's all over the place, usually in places that people don't think about it at all. In the Seven Cities, however, it is banned for anyone who isn't royalty. So the very fact that there were purple candles and pumpkins in the pumpkin house was an impressive show of how powerful this place was, if they didn't fear the Vigilees or Bonnie. When we finally arrived at the shore, the ferryman pointed to crates not far from the shore. Thank you, I said to the ferryman as the others echoed the sentiment as we made our way to the crates. They had simple directions on the crate. Put our mining equipment into the crates. 
So we peeled off the suits and put them into the crates as we turned to face the pumpkin house at the center of the pumpkin house grounds. There was a path through the pumpkin lanterns, however, it was clearly not made to be a quick path. Dylan gripped my hand for a moment as we stood there in anticipation. It's your turn to lead us. Now lead us through the pumpkin house. None of us know anything. You're the only one who knows anything. I whispered to him as Dylan took a deep breath before he let go of my hand and he stepped forward, leading us through the pumpkin patch. Funny thing, at least to me, Dylan knew me as Summer, which wasn't my true name, but close enough that I recognized it. And Dylan's name that he gave me wasn't his true name either. It was close, but not his true name, not how he thought of himself. I don't know if he is aware of that or not, but still, it was so sweet of him to give me his false name, even if he wasn't aware of the fact it was his false name. There is quiet in the room. Only Dylan remains, and only his candle remains. The last of the wax is almost burned away, and all Dylan can hope is that his hand candle burns long enough for him to join his friends. The last snack was eaten, and he waits in silence. Unable to feel the speaker's presence, he waits, and he's hopeful as he waits for the presence to speak. The last candle blows out, and he is alone in the darkness, and still no voice speaks. Dylan, for a moment, is sad that it is the last one left behind, and he was not given a chance to join the others. But then a dim light appears. Not very bright, but it is green, and it gives Dylan a slim bit of hope. He watches as the dim green light flies over to his candle. A small lightning bug is now resting where his candle was. No scent, but the lightning bug provides the same level of light as Dylan's candle. And as the lightning bug gets comfortable, Dylan hears the voice speak again, directly across from him. He sees a young girl with a very large hat with lots of ribbons speak with the wisdom of ancient ages, a Adonsi. He had heard of her in many stories, and here he was, sitting directly across from the child of such legends. In that moment, though, he was just her audience, and she was the, just the storyteller. Dylan sat across from her, listening to her story as she ate his soul cake. And a small lightning bug provided the only light source in the entire room, while Adonsi, the goddess of Lockhart, spoke a story to Dylan, the keeper of the sentinel. The house is surrounded by growing pumpkins. The field is fertile, and there's plenty of pumpkins. Maybe even some to take home if you speak to the host of the house. On the front porch, you can see a candy bowl requesting for you to take two candy sweets. But inside, you can see lights. But if you knock on the door, you will only have the door open with no one inside. Inside the foyer, you will see a large room with paintings showing many strange people. Some you may recognize, some you may not. All of them are important to the pumpkin house, even if they're not important to you. You can travel upstairs, traveling up the stairs that you swear could not be so long, and when you finally reach the top and look back, you will only see 13 steps behind yourself. The hallway you are in is full of paintings and mirrors. Though they are hard to tell apart with the paintings looking like yourself, but their expressions don't quite match what you are feeling, so you may wonder if it is something wrong with yourself, or maybe something wrong with the paintings. The wise know that it is both yourself and the paintings that have something wrong. 
with them. If you see yourself in the mirrors, it appears that your face is even more twisted than you remember. You can never quite control your expression. You feel something is wrong with yourself, that there is a monster inside of that mirror that is eager to take you out if you only look away, or worse, if you look too long. Except these mirrors are just mirrors. There is nothing special about them. How you look in them is how you look. And if you feel you look like a monster, that isn't the fault of the mirror. If you make it down the long hallway, you will make it to the bedrooms. Rooms that blend into one another where it is difficult to tell where one room begins and the other ends. You will hear something like someone is following you and trying to avoid being seen. But no matter how hard you try, you cannot ever find out if there is someone watching you in the bedrooms. You may think that there is a curse on the beds, or maybe there is some reason the bedrooms are unsafe. But there is nothing keeping you from simply falling asleep on the beds. You can keep going, and eventually you will find your way out of the bedrooms and make your way to the library. The library is very large. It is so tall that the ceiling cannot be seen, and there are lights hanging from the shelves themselves. The ladder and the stalls lead up seemingly forever, and they may actually go up forever. There are no guests in the library, and the books are written on every subject ever written, and those that will never be written, but not those that may be written. Those books are stored elsewhere. There are plenty of comfortable places to sit and read, alcoves that look over scenes from all over the world. You can read a book quietly overlooking an active volcano as it is erupting over a frozen landscape. You can read in a solarium where the glass above is on the bottom of the ocean, and you can see the dim lights of those who swim in the darkness so completely that they never see the light. You may even find a place to read where you can always see the rain, and the glass will cool you to the touch while the blankets warm you, giving you a perfect place to rest and relax. Is there a trap in the library? Perhaps. Or maybe the library is just a library, just another stop on your way to your destination at the very center of the entire pumpkin house. Ah, yes. What is it that you seek at the very center of the pumpkin house? What is it that you seek after all those trials and tribulations? What was promised to you at the center of everything? What was worth outsmarting the monsters of the countryside? What was worth almost being eaten by the dreadnought? What was worth going through every impossible rule set by the DJ and the radio station? What was worth gambling away your very life and freedom in the casino? What was worth sacrificing yourself to the source? What was worth traveling through the pumpkin house for? I know you very well. I know people like you very well. I have met people like you since before the time of Ash. I have sent people like you on quests during the Age of Myths. You wouldn't go on such a quest without some kind of payoff at the end. You could have done a lot, conquered the impossible, both outside yourself and within yourself. So what is your prize at the end of this all? Is it money you desire? Surely there's easier ways to earn money. A lot easier things. And honestly, I would be personally insulted if you sought me out for money. Is it power you desire? Surely you realize by now I have a lot of it. 
and that the pumpkin house has quite a bit of power? You must think that I would share it with you if you make it to the center. No? Then what is it you do desire? What was promised? Oh, that is a high price indeed. What was promised? I never made that promise. You must know that, though the one who made that promise was correct. I can grant it to you. It would have been easier if you asked for power, wealth, or even magic. What you seek, what was promised, is something I do not give freely. You will have to make it to the center of the pumpkin house, all of you, to be delivered what was promised. But I can tell you this, if you do make it through everything, you will gain a great prize. So I wish you luck. Adonsi stands from her chair, and she stands at a far greater height than she logically could. She leans down and blows on the lightning bug, causing it to fly away, leaving the room in darkness. The last friend is gone. There is no light, leaving only Adonsi, the one who was speaking, and the unseen observer. The trail leading up the pumpkin house was very peaceful. I could hear crickets, the frogs, and the calls of various other animals that made their home on an island full of pumpkins. Orange and black moths flew around in the night, attracted to the flames, but never quite getting close enough to burn themselves on the candles. As we got closer, I saw small things run through the pumpkins. I paused for a moment, thinking it was a threat, but then Summer grabbed my hand and she pointed in the shadow between two different pumpkins. From underneath those pumpkins, something peeked out from beneath the vines and glanced up towards me. The dark eyes shone in its dark fur. Two long ears stood up nearly straight, carefully listening to any possible threats. It took a few steps closer to us. The nose sniffed in the night, standing on four legs. The rabbit examined us before it got closer to us, just a meter away before the bunny stopped, then flopped onto its side, revealing the white belly in the dark fur. The rabbit was relaxed around us, showing us its belly and showing us it was comfortable. We crouched down to look at the bunny, careful not to pet it, because we weren't sure if it was okay to pet. After a moment, I heard more rustling in the vines as I saw other rabbits approach us. These were very small babies that approached us before flopping next to the mother bunny, all just lying there in front of us. Out of everything that we faced so far in the pumpkin house, why did we encounter a fluffle of rabbits in a pumpkin patch? There was no scare here, no test, no sudden change, just fluffy bunnies bouncing in the wood. We stood there watching the rabbits for a moment before they got up and walked back into the pumpkin patch. That is a little strange for everything, isn't it? I asked everyone who nodded except for Marceline. Something is different, she said as she pointed to where the trail ended. At the end of the trail were several electric lanterns. They were built to resemble old gas lanterns, but thankfully there was a switch and there were fully charged batteries as we made our way to the house itself. The porch was decorated in a very classic Hallow's Eve way. Masks sat on the wall carved out of wood and decorated to scare spirits. We saw masks not too dissimilar to our own. We saw masks carved with laughing goblins, screaming ghouls, and in one very interesting example, a raven. The masks hung from the walls on the outside and on the porch banister were more carved pumpkins. Pumpkins that had one face pointing out into the yard and the other facing back to the porch. The side facing the porch were screaming faces with triangular eyes and teeth, a bit of red paint to make it look like they were bleeding. The sides that faced the house were much friendlier. 
The triangular eyes were facing down, and the mouths were smiling with rectangular teeth with no red paint at all. A few of the pumpkins even wore straw hats, making them look more personable and approachable. The shutters and curtains were both closed, making it impossible to look into the pumpkin house. The door itself was decorated with cobwebs on the top and a bowl of candy in front of the door. There were two notes, one note on the door and the other on the bowl of candy. The candy asked us to only take two pieces of candy. The door told us to knock before entering. If this was a test, I wasn't going to fail it. I reached down and grabbed two different aluminum wrapped sweets. Opening the foil revealed I got myself a brownie. I took a bite from the brownie as I knocked on the door. Just a moment after I knocked, the door gently creaked open. Just inside of the doorway, I could see the parlor. There was a large fireplace with a roaring fire. Seven chairs set out, and I could see paintings on the walls. As I stepped inside the door, it slammed shut behind me. Before I had time to process it, Summer knocked, and the door opened again. Apparently, the house would only let us in one at a time. While I waited for the others to come into the house, I looked over the many paintings on the walls. There were many strange paintings. I saw a painting of an old man in all black with a white beard, but when the flames danced just right, the old man was a grinning skeleton in all white with a black shadow behind him. His eye sockets had candles in them, shining bright in the darkness. In another painting, I saw a man on his knees trying to propose to a woman in a light blue dress. When the lights flickered, I saw a tall, headless figure in a black and red doublet with a hatchet decapitating the kneeling man, still brandishing the gold ring like a protective object rather than an offering to get to someone in love. A rather dramatic change of circumstances. There was one painting that wasn't of a person, but rather of the moon, Luna. The moon was full and bright with a figure in shadow in front of the moon. The figure was entirely shadowed, but I could see their arms outstretched to their sides like they were presenting themselves. And when the flames flickered, the painting changed again. The moon was no longer bright, it was dark and entirely in shadow. The stars and darkness were inverted, so you only knew the black moon was there by the absence of light. The stars were blotted out, but the figure before it was still visible. Not made out of light, but just made out of a lighter darkness, so you could barely see the figure in the shadow of the black moon. Now with everyone inside, we took our time looking around the parlor. There were dozens of interesting objects and curios. It was a mechanical solar system that was geocentric with the sun, moon, and stars all rotating around the Earth in three different directions, creating a very confusing solar system. Definitely a fascinating curiosity that would be something I would want to see in my room. There were also multiple dolls around the room, all were stored in iron cages with nails in the dolls' heads, necks, and hearts, presumably to keep the dolls from wandering around. I had seen similar dolls before, once in a very run-down and shitty bar in the Brannan district. I saw Autumn reach out for one before I called out, Don't touch anything here. As long as we don't transgress, we cannot be punished. So if we mess with these items, it's going to create problems for us in the future. Let's just admire them quietly before going upstairs, we said as we continued on, looking over the many items. The tables were full of small figurines made out of bronze, obsidian, and crystal. Figures of pumpkin-headed fig figures doing everyday tasks in a Feralia village. A lot of work into such a small display. 
It was something made with love and willingly shared with us. Not too different from the grounds of the pumpkin house. Now satisfied with all of the amazing curios and curiosities of the parlor, we made our way to the stairway. The wood was stained and well cared for, almost golden in hue. The banister was white with the chandelier above, reflected rainbow hues down to us. As I stood on the first step, and sure enough, just like the legend, there were only 13 steps on the stairway leading to the second floor. An oddity, certainly, since there should be no logical way for 13 steps to be enough to reach a second floor. And yet I could count the steps and I could see it connect to the second floor. I took the first step, not even a creak on the stair. They took another step, and then another, and another. Step by step, I kept climbing the stairs, and yet the second floor never got closer. Took a look behind me, I was still on the second step. My friends were still behind me on the ground floor. When I tried calling out to them, I could not hear my own voice, nor could I hear them, even though I could see them trying to yell and wave at me. Realizing that there was a problem, I turned around, now trying to make my way down. Although now there wasn't a single step before me, somehow there were 13 steps between me and the ground floor. And I felt dizzy, like I was kilometers above the ground floor. How was I only at the first step? And now I was just below the top of the stairs. I shook my head and I felt the wisdom of Sentinel whisper in my ear. Take the sword, break out of this illusion, I heard in my head, but I have gotten better at tempering the ring's desires. This wasn't actually a threat, it was a game, a haunt for us to solve. Trying to fight my way out would not work and almost definitely create bigger problems for me. I would have to solve this. I began to make my way down the stairs, every step brought me down. And yet, there were always 13 steps in front of me. It was disorientating to try and figure out where the disconnect was between me taking the step and the new step being created, but I couldn't figure it out. You're in a trap. You will be destroyed if you don't break out, Sentinel whispered to me in my own voice. I still resisted it, but it was harder. It was terrifying, and this didn't feel like a game. This did feel like a trap. I glanced down at my friends who were still waving at me, and I waved back weakly as I took a deep breath. It's a game. There is a way out. We know this, I said to the sentinel in my head. I had trusted my friends and in the fact that this was just another part of the house's haunt. Still, when I thought about my trust in my friends, I could hear Sentinel whisper in my, my voice, I don't trust them. You cannot trust them. It is harsh dealing with intrusive thoughts in your own voice, saying things that you don't believe, but you still feel like there is a part of you that also believes in it. Moments like this are hard to deal with when you have something like the Sentinel, so it helps to have an anchor. Something I can have both myself and Sentinel agree on. You don't trust my friends? Fine. But do you doubt Adonsi? I know you've dealt with her before, I thought, and the cold rage of the ring died down. There was no vocal response, but there was the action. Sentinel doesn't trust people. It doesn't trust my friends. Well, it doesn't even trust me. However, it trusts Adansi. Pumpkin House is old. Sentinel is older. And Adansi was older still. Let's try something crazy, I tried to say out loud, only to have no noise still. I couldn't hear my friends, and they couldn't hear me. But I had an idea. Something very crazy based on the story Adansi told me. The stairs always appeared like they had 13 steps ahead of me. However, how many steps were actually behind me? There was only one way to figure it out. I 
took a deep breath and took a step backwards. There was a pop inside my ears like I was adjusting to a new air pressure. I could hear again I leaned over the banister to call out to the others. There's a trick to going up these stairs. Once you make it to the second step, turn around like you're going to go down, then step backwards. There's some kind of illusion. One of the magician's tricks, maybe. But it was definitely intense, so don't be afraid to shut your eyes, I said as Summer made her way up the stairs. As soon as she made her way to the second step, she kept walking up until the step before the landing, where she turned around and took a step backwards. So that's how it looks from the outside. How did it look from your angle, I asked Summer. It was like you just froze on the second step. We kept trying to talk to you or even touch you, but every time we tried to step on your step, we found ourselves back on the landing. Then suddenly you went up to the top and turned around, but you still wouldn't move until you took a step backwards. I'm just glad you're okay, she said with a smile, and I nodded. The others soon followed, and now on the second floor, there was only one way forward, the hallway. The carpet was a lovely shade of scarlet with blue wallpaper covered in rose patterns full of red petals and green thorny stems. They were painted so well they looked like they could prick me just by touching them. We walked down the hallway, looking at the many paintings and mirrors that we passed. I saw a painting of myself with it, with my black widow on my face and I passed by mirrors with the spider smeared, but still there. Then as we continued, the paintings changed in tone. I saw a painting of myself with my mother and grandfather. I was smiling brightly in front of my grandfather's house, but both my grandfather and my mother were frowning, tears in their eyes. When I saw that painting, I saw the mirror next to it, there was a frown on my face. When I tried to smile in the mirror, the reflection did not smile back. He kept frowning, and I could see he was very slightly shaking his head. He would not smile for me. I tried to move on, and as I moved on, the paintings only got darker. They didn't keep a consistent theme. There was one painting of my grandfather's house, empty except for myself in front of it, Still smiling because my cheeks were torn back, forcing my face into a permanent smile with tears in my painted eyes. The mirror next to it was smiling. I don't like it when my reflection smiles and I don't. The painting after that showed the sentinel in his armor. He stood strong and heroic across a blasted landscape. Every building was knocked down, Ash fell from the sky like snow. There was only ash, dust, rubble, and sentinel standing tri triumphantly with a lipsed moon in the background. Victorious over every enemy, because there was nothing left to conquer, everything destroyed and only he remained, making him the greatest by simply being the last survivor. The painting had a single caption on it, The Last Hero of Grave by Dylan Dyson. I could feel a twinge of desire deep inside of myself. Something inside of me wanted to overcome everything. Doing it this way would finally silence the sentinel ring. I turned from the painting, focusing on my feet as we made our way to the bedrooms. I kept telling myself that it was the ring that desired violence and desired grave. That part of me that desired to see the blasted world, with the smell of burnt pork, ash, and the taste of death. That was the desire of the ring. It wasn't me. It wasn't a part of me, so I didn't need to confront it. Just keep it away from myself. Just another intrusive thought. The doorway leading to the bedrooms had a massive engraving in the wood that showed us a massive night. 
Their helmets hid their face, and their armor had streaks of rust and dents on the plates. However, the sword was shining and sharp, held aloft in their hands, pointing upwards towards a star directly above. Their heater at their feet had a single diamond in the middle of it. So I think it was supposed to represent the Knight of Pentacles, also known as the Knight of Diamonds. I tried the doorknob and it opened with ease. As I opened it, I tried to think what the knight might mean and what it might mean to me. Did it have something to do with that painting of the last hero of Grave? I did not understand Arcana nor Cartomancy at all. All I knew about the Knight of Pentacles was it represented youth. Although that did not help me here, the bedroom beyond was a pretty standard bedroom. Desk in the corner, a bed in a different corner, a lamp that was on, a wardrobe against the wall, with another door to the right. The only thing that separated it from most bedrooms was the fact that there was no windows and also the fact that almost everything was upside down. The bed, lamp, desk, door all bolted to the ceiling with a chandelier on the floor, pointing towards the ceiling like gravity was pulling it up. The wardrobe, on the other hand, was on the floor, just beneath the door. Well, this is an interesting choice. Not going to lie, I would not have chosen that bed frame color with the wardrobe, Cal said, pointing it out, and I nodded, quietly agreeing with him. Blue-green bed frame with a red wardrobe was a very strange choice, or a bedroom supposedly made for someone in college. Although everyone had their own tastes, it was definitely an odd enough choice and one that I would not have made. I think we can get climb on the wardrobe and get to the door above, Bill said as I helped him get on top of the wooden wardrobe as he tried to open the door. Except the door did not wiggle and the doorknob did not move. Kel tried a few more times on before he knocked on the door. There was no hollow sound. It was as solid as the wall. There is something written on the door. Give me a second, Kel said as he ran his hands across the door as he read the words that were written there. What is the greatest thing you can do with power? He read out loud to us as we all turned to each other. Control it? Having power isn't the same thing as controlling it, Wallen Gray suggested as she flew around as Kel called from above. Measure it? You have to understand what power you have before you can try to control it, Kel suggested before Marceline made her request. Protect it? You have to keep it safe from danger before you can try to measure it, Marceline recommended before Summer made her guess. Grow it? You have to grow power before you can get to the point where you can protect it, Summer said as her sister made her choice. Have it. You have to have power before you can grow it, protect it, measure it, or even control it, Autumn said as the others nodded, and that didn't quite feel right either. They were thinking about power as an object, and what is something you do to the object, not something you do with the object. That is confusing, so let's use an analogy. Think of power as a tree. You can have a tree, you can grow the tree, you can protect the tree, you can even measure it, and you can even control the tree. However, that is all actions you do to the tree, not something you do with the tree. So by thinking of power as a tree, it made it a lot easier to think about the riddle on the door. I felt my grandfather's words guiding me through it. It was like all of the times when he and I would make Samhain costumes together. He would explain what he was thinking, and he would let me ask questions and explain my thoughts. However, he would also patiently let me figure out the answers when I needed to. He would guide me through the questions and through the thoughts, but he would not give me the final answer. Sometimes it was frustrating for me, and I definitely know it was frustrating for him, 
but it helped me make the necessary connections. The key words here are with power, not do who you do to power, not do you you what you use power for, what do you use with power, what is the greatest thing you can do with a tree. Trees can grow food, they produce fresh air, they can be used to prevent soil erosion, they can produce lumber, they produce shade, there is no one thing trees do. There is no one thing that power can be used for. Wait, I am not thinking it through properly. Not what does the tree do, not what do you do to the tree, what is the greatest thing you can do with the tree? The only thing I could think about was bringing my friends to my favorite tree on campus. It was an old apple tree that had been growing since the days before the empire. It was comfortable. There were apples growing for snacking, and it was good shade during the summer, and it had plenty of light during fall and winter. The tree was somewhere we liked to, to gather together. It was somewhere I enjoyed, and the first thing I wanted to do once I discovered the tree was want to share it. And then I realized what the answer was. Power can be measured in lots of ways. It is often said that knowledge is power, but knowledge is also worthless when it's hoarded. When it's sealed away, it is not given a chance to grow, not given a chance to help others. Like a tree, by protecting it from the world, it dies. It isn't safe. Control is another way to see power. Having control over our country, having security is often seen as another form of power. However, too much control, too much security, can also become virtually meaningless. Like a login process that requires multiple passwords, an email, a text message, and a phone call, just to check a two-word message. It is far too much control that renders itself meaningless. Like a tree that has so many different weeds growing over it, so everything is suffocating and nothing is thriving. Measuring power is difficult, but a popular subject. It's often a popular subject between people to ask who would win in a fight. Who is more powerful? Who has more measurable power? Who has the biggest tree? Who has the most tree? Who has the most trees? Whose forest is the healthiest? Measuring the trees, measuring the power, has its uses, but like everything else so far, endlessly measuring things did not do anything with it other than tell you how much you have. Growing power was also a very tempting option. Power and also be measured in wealth. As you accumulate wealth, you can grow in power, and as you reach a certain point, you grow wealth with greater ease. You have so much wealth, so much power, that merely the interest gathered on it grows faster than you could possibly spend it. The tree is grown so large that it can never be cut down, no matter how fast you cut except that it also chokes out all life around the tree, leaving everything around that tree dying. The power becomes cancerous as it keeps trying to grow. Having power, some people measure what they have in power by what they have. You have a tree, you have a forest, you have a house, you have a mansion, you have a vehicle, you have a nice car. You own land, you own an empire, you have an assistant, you have a council, you have a hulk, you have an army, you have something, you have power. People love to measure their power themselves by what they have. While having something isn't inherently a bad thing, measuring yourself by what you have is nearly antithetical to being noble. Having a tree means nothing more than you have a tree. The greatest thing you can do when you have power, it's also the greatest thing you can do when you have a tree. The greatest thing you can do with knowledge, wealth, control, and protection.
something that I remember being taught by my mother and grandfather many times, something I feel that many people have been taught, but then either forgotten or ignored. Having power was like having a tree. Keeping it all to yourself isn't noble. Hoarding it isn't kind. There was only one answer. The greatest thing you can do with power is share it. Even if not everyone you share with it is noble, that doesn't make it a bad action. Sharing it keeps others from abusing it and keeps it from abusing you. I said as there was a click from the wardrobe and it opened beneath Kel, revealing another hallway leading somewhere else. That's wonderful, but now we have a brand new problem, Kel said as I looked through the tunnel. And what is that, Kel? I asked him as he responded. I'm scared of falling. Can someone help get me down? He asked as Fallen Grace flew up to him and grabbed him by his shirt, picking him up flying through the air. This tiny fairy holding Kel, who had to weigh at least 50 kilograms, hovering in the air as his stomach was revealed to everyone and was held up by his shirt. Two things. One, why didn't Fallen Grace fly up to check the door? He asked her as her voice called out to us much louder than someone as small as her should have been. Why didn't you ask? She said to everyone. Good point. And second thing, he began before he slipped out of his shirt, falling directly into my arms. Yes, what was the second thing? I asked him while Fallen Grace flew down, holding his shirt. I was going to say I was slipping out of my shirt, but I think everyone knows that now. He said as he awkwardly put his shirt back on, still cradled in my arms. Things like this usually happen to Kel. He was somehow both the luckiest and unluckiest person I had ever met in the history of the planet. He had free tuition to college because he was ran over by a unitard-clad clown on a unicycle. He regularly fell into my arms like something out of a tingle romance but he also had no interest in romance nor relationships. So it was just always an awkward moment until it happened often enough that I just accepted as inevitably going to happen, and he accepts it it's going to happen. His brother died at a young age, and that very same brother visits him once a month and for every Yule. His sister is an accomplished hunter in Albion who regularly checks up on him, and she only got contracts through people she was dating. Kel, how often are you going to fall into my arms? I asked him as I finally set him down. As long as you're always there to catch me, he said, not realizing how flirty it sounded. I giggled at the statement, though. Even here, in the pumpkin house, at the center of a pataphysical nexus inside Lockhart, he still had some of the oddest luck I have ever seen in my life. We entered the next bedroom together with Summer close by, as this bedroom was just a different version of the same bedroom. The bed, wardrobe, and desk were on the wall in front of us, the chandelier over us but sticking out of the wall pointing towards the bed. The door was also on the floor leading down below us. The lamp was sitting on the floor in front of us and also something that was out of place compared to everything else. Okay, who wants to check out the lamp? I asked as Autumn stepped forward to the lamp. It was off and shaded. Nothing special about the lamp as far as I could see. It looked like any other lamp in the dorm rooms. When Autumn turned the lamp on, instead of light coming out of the lamp, the chandelier stopped glowing, and we could see glowing words on the walls. Emitted from an unknown source, but still, it offered us our next question. The words of light in the darkness asked us all, What is the measure of a man? We read it over together, and there was silence for a moment before Fallen Grace spoke up. Well, you don't want my answer, but I've yet to find a man who can measure up to me. Fallen Grace said to the snickers of Autumn, Summer, and Marceline, it took both me and Kel a moment before we laughed as well. Funny as that was, I don't think the answer to this riddle was a joke. It felt like the answer had to be something personal to us all. 
Measure of a man is his honor, Autumn offered to the silence of the room. A few clicks of the lamp sounded like she was trying to turn the lights back on, but the room stayed dark and the words stayed on the walls. The door stayed locked and that was either not the answer she was looking for or she was waiting for us all to answer. A measure of a man is his strength, both of character and body. Summer said, offering the obvious answer. The same kind of answer that would have been given during the Great War. The same kind of answer that would have been given when the Argivians invaded Persia. The same kind of answer that would have been given during the Age of Ash. Still, there was no way forward. The measure of a man is his wisdom, Marceline said. Her voice echoed the word wisdom in the darkness, like she spoke with two voices. But after a moment, the echo faded and there was silence again. The answer was still not taken. Finally, it was Kel's turn to answer. Even though it was dark, I knew he spent the time thinking it through to give the answer that worked best for him. He was an unusual young man, but he was a man. He knew what answer worked best for him, and he was waiting for his chance to speak. A true measure of a man is his adaptability his ability to change, grow, and thrive in new situations. Bell said in the darkness, his words passed through it all. It felt closer, but it was still not the answer Adonsi was looking for. It now fell down to me, and I thought it through. Fiddling with my ring, I thought back to my grandfather. He often talked about what it was to be a man, what it was to be a good person, what it was to be an individual, and what it was to be part of a community. We often talked about it underneath the pink, blue, and white flag on his porch. I remember all of those times at school when I would be told by students and teachers that what I did was wrong or made me feminine in some way, that masculinity was something that could be lost if not strictly adhered to that I had to be stronger, stoic, smarter, swifter, so much more than I was, and it was always more than what I had or what I was. I remember a teacher bragging about how many hours he spent repairing an old car and how he casually brought up the fact he would often start working on it before his kids woke up, and he would still be working on it until after they went to bed. The other boys in the class were so impressed and loved seeing the pictures of the cars. Pictures he kept on his computer and pictures in his workspace. He had no pictures of his children, none of his wife, just him and his car. And the kids thought it was amazing he was working on the same car for over 10 years and he had been away from his children for so long. I remember checking the bottom of my shoes only to be sent to the principal's office. I did not even know why. I was only told I was not behaving appropriately. The principal called my home where my grandfather had a meeting with the principal. In less than five minutes, he took me home and we spent the entire day baking and cooking. I found out years later that apparently the principal was told that I was violating the school's strictly gendered dress code by checking the bottom of my shoes like a girl. To everyone at school, masculinity and femininity was always an action, something you had to do strictly to get it right every time. The way you walked, the way you held your books, the type of colors you wore, how long your hair was, the shoes you wore, the things you ate even the family members you had. If you did something wrong, you would be bullied for it. You'd always be known as the weirdo. To my grandfather, he did not care how I acted or what I wanted to eat. If I wanted to grow my hair long, he would show me how to properly brush and braid my own hair. If I wanted the pink cupcakes, he would make sure I would have it. To him, my actions did not make me more masculine nor feminine. It was my choice what I wanted to be, and it was my choice to be me. That connection helped me have the next key for this question. 
And as tempting as it was the to say it was actions that defined the measure of a man, that wasn't completely true. Sure, the actions and inactions told you about what kind of person that they were, but everyone was interpreting the question wrong. The question wasn't how do you measure a man as in how do you measure a person, it was how do you measure how much of a man a person is. If I answered the question as the measure of a man is his actions, I wouldn't be saying that you measure what kind of person they are by their actions. I would be saying you would know if they're a man or not by their actions. This question and the last question were made for me. They were made for me to answer, although I still don't know what benefit there would be for sharing the answer with everyone, I still answered. The measure of a man is his choices, I said as the words vanished and there was a click as the door swung open. A ladder down below is visible. Those were the words that spoke to me. My grandfather told me I would have to make choices on who I wanted to be. My actions would be how people saw me, but I would have to make choices to define myself to myself. I climbed down to the final bedroom. Everything was where it was supposed to be. The final door had the question inscribed with gold. Everyone came down with and when everyone came down with me, we read all the golden words together. What makes a hero was inscribed in gold on the door. I could feel everyone's eyes on me now. We all learned our lesson from the last two trials, and now they wanted me to go first instead of them. This question was the most open of them all so far. There are many answers that could be said here. All of them could be accurate. It could be honor, resolve, care, kindness, compassion, heart, courage, or even something more exoteric like action, strength, or even results. Still, that didn't feel like the answer the door wanted. It could have been something about tragedy, journey, or even about their end goals. Overthinking about it all, I rethought the question, what makes a hero? Trying to step outside of thinking of heroes as something that is esoteric and a higher concept, I had to break it down to a simpler concept, like thinking of power as a tree or thinking about a man as a percentage. So if you break down a hero to the simplest component, you have a person, a person whose choices and sharing of power helps others. We've already shown that we would share power and who makes choices that would help others. So what's missing? Sharing power, our choices, the only thing missing was us. And even when then the answer us was not quite accurate. It wasn't my friends that found the answers to the other questions. It was what I answered. So now I have the answer to the question. What makes a hero? Me, I said as the door clicked and it opened. Behind it, I could see the library of the pumpkin house. Stepping through the door, the library was warm and cozy. There were floors above us, and I could see never-ending bookshelves, although there was no ladder and no staircase leading up. The way forward had a few different fuzzy chairs that could be used to be sat in while reading. A beautiful place to visit. We continued past that area to head deeper as we passed by more sitting areas and alcoves. One alcove I could look out and I could see a beautiful midday sun, except the sun was a lot smaller and weaker than normal like it was behind thick clouds, except there were no clouds. And at the edges of the horizon, there were stars that were visible in the middle of the day, and there were four different moons that were visible in the sky. All of the moons in different phases all together, making the moons in different crescents and shapes. The only clue to where it was was the inscription of Astoria above the window. The next alcove showed 
a fog that was so thick that nothing else could be seen beyond the gray. The handprint was left on the window from the other side. The handprint that seemed so lonely in the fog with no structures, no people, nothing beyond the fog except the single solitary handprint. And the inscription above that read that it was elsewhere. Interestingly, there was someone sitting there in that alcove. Their long curly hair passed their shoulders, a black mask with rainbow snowflakes covered their nose and mouth. The book they were reading had a symbol on it that looked like an eye. I took one look at them, and they took one look back at me. Whoever they were, they weren't an actor. They weren't part a part of the pumpkin house. They just wanted to be left alone, and so we left them alone. Although as we passed by, I couldn't help but notice the smile in their eyes and some tears beginning to form as we passed by. A tear formed in my own eyes as I walked by and I wiped it away. At the time, I couldn't tell you why I cried. Now, well, I still couldn't tell you why. It wasn't often something like that happens. It was like being smiled at by someone that loved you. Someone that you never knew personally, but when you see them, you know that they love you. Whoever that was, they affected me just by sitting there and reading. We continued in the library, as we found a long table that had seven chairs and teacups at every chair. We quickly got to our spots, following Grace sitting on the table, not being able to reach the cup from the chair that was made for someone much larger than herself. The head of the table was empty for a moment at least, until I blinked, and then there was someone sitting at the head of the table. She resembled her statue in the Morris mine. She wore a large hat with many ribbons of many colors, including the color purple. Her chest cavity was broken open, and her heart was visible as it beat. Her face was half torn off, but she still spoke with ease, and she lifted a tea spout filling her cup first with red tea as she got off her seat to fill each of our cups one at a time. I tried to speak and to ask her what was happening, why she looked that way. I opened my mouth, but I was unable to speak. She lifted a single finger to her lips, shushing me as she filled each of our cups. Taking her time to fill the cups when she came near me, I could see that she was smiling on the non-injured side of her face. Her smile set me at ease, but I still had to look all over all the little ways she didn't move quite right. The way she walked without quite touching the floor, or how she slid halfway through the table to fill the cup with steaming red tea. No matter what angle I looked at her, she was looking me in the eyes with her mouth smiling towards me. Even when she was walking her way, her head was completely turned around, her smile and her eyes digging into mine. She always felt like she was the size of a child, and yet when she walked behind the chairs, she was tall enough to be seen, like she was taller than two meters. She filled Fallen Grace's cup and was small enough to stand in front of the fairy without blocking her face. She wasn't changing size. She was all of those sizes at the same time. When she sat in her chair, even though she did not completely fill the chair, she dominated the space. Every instinct in my body told me she represented and radiated power. Although I never met her before, Based on context, I could tell who she was. The Marquess of Madness, the Forever Child, the Goddess of Lockhart, the First Hero, the Lost Wanderer, the Dauncey, the Lady of the Pumpkin House, and the final prize of the entire haunted adventure. Thank you all for your patience. Now, I am sure you all know about the prize at the end of this all. However, as you all know, the best kind of prize is a surprise. So, as we drink, I will have surprise 
bring your prizes to you all, but let us drink and talk. Adonsi said as she poured honey into her tea as we all drank, and Fallen Grace finally spoke up. Adonsi, why did you change so much this year? The fairy asked the lost wanderer. He tilted her head. I don't know what you mean. There's always something new every year for the pumpkin house. I didn't change at all, unless you mean by something as superficial as my face and heart. When you get as old as I do, the heart changes easier than you change your mind, the Dauncey said as she drank the tea. The blood-red tea viscously fell from the hole in her cheek and leaked out of her cavity in her chest, staining her dress. I was talking about the overseer, Fallen Grace said as Dauncey nodded. Oh, that. As you know, the pumpkin house changes year to year, person to person. It is what scares you. It's what frightens you. And you, Fallen Grace, feared the pain above all else. Did I change so much? I am vast, not unchangeable, but so vast that very little change can be considered significant. So, did I change this year? Or did you change a lot, Sage Sun, since the lo since when you last came here? Adonsi asked, and Fallen Grace nodded. Accepting what Adonsi said before Autumn decided to ask Adonsi something. Why the face? Autumn asked as Adonsi raised a hand to the uninjured part of her face. Oh, most people I find prefer speaking to someone with a face. Although there are some, such as yourself, who prefer to speak to someone with no mouth to argue against them. No eyes to judge them, and no nose to turn up at them. Do you find the idea of my face so disquieting that you prefer that I don't have one? The Marquess asked Autumn Orum, who shook her, her head. No, that isn't what I meant at all. I'm just saying your face doesn't look whole. You look injured. Autumn tried to salvage the situation as I flicked my eyes to Summer, who and we both did a, a tight-lipped smile towards each other as I turned to Kel, who was busy holding his head in his hands. While in grace, I couldn't see her expression. She was too busy hiding her face in the teacup, drinking from the cup like a trough. Marceline just shook her head and sighed. We all knew how Adonsi spoke and answered questions, and here Autumn was, sitting before one of the most legendary figures in the history of all that is, and she is focusing on something as superficial as a facial illusion. If you're asking if I'm hurt, I'm fine, physically, although my heart definitely has been hurt a little by your words, Adonsi said, no longer drinking her tea both of her hands resting on the table, palms down, and I could feel tension in the air, strong enough to cut through. Autumn was still oblivious to it all. I'm glad you're not hurt. However, your face is unsettling as it is. Maybe you should change it to something that is less unsettling? Autumn suggested as Adonsi focused her eyes on Autumn. Until this moment, Adonsi was looking at me directly, her eyes not blinking. Eyes that had a color I could never describe, while also never being able to forget it. I'm pretty certain everyone else was seeing the same thing. Even as she spoke to Fallen Grace and Autumn, her eyes and face were still turned my way. Although at that moment, she no longer looked my way. She focused on Autumn and that terrified me in my seat. I am comfortable with my face how it is. If you are uncomfortable with my face, you don't have to look at me. You don't have to speak with me. You can just ignore me and let me be comfortable, Adonsi said, her voice shifted, no longer sounding like a silly girl, sounding like a harbinger. Well, I have to look towards you. It's rude not to look at someone while speaking, Autumn began, as Adonsi interrupted her. 
then tear out your eyes. If looking upon me offends you so much, tear out your own eyes before you ask anyone to change who they are, make you more comfortable. You think I am more offended by a lack of eye contact than I am by insulting my face? I am many things, Autumn, Abigail, or Jenton. I do not enjoy having my time and being wasted. It is a far greater insult than anything you can say about my face. So choose your next words with care, Adonsi said, her voice booming through the library. Autumn looked towards her tea before she finally spoke. This tea is very good, is it cherry? She asked Adonsi, who smiled again, and she turned back to me, presumably towards everyone else at the same time. She picked up her tea, stirring it as she lifted it to her torn face again. It is. Cherry tea goes quite well with raspberry honey, I find. I'm glad you enjoy it, Autumn, she said as we drank in silence for a few moments before Adonsi spoke to Summer next. I admire your work in the mine. You have a lot to discover about yourself, Summer. Do not fear exploration. There are many dangerous places in the world. But just like that mine, you have to suit up to explore it safely. It doesn't mean that there isn't something for you in the mine, Doncy said as she sipped her tea, and she turned to Kel next. As for you, the studious one, the strange one, the admired, as you know, death is the least of your concerns. However, it should still be a concern for you. Death is rarely so kind twice in the same family. Although I do hear that you impressed Jack, and he is almost never impressed anymore, she said as she turned to Marceline. My dear prince, are you still hesitant? That is your right, that is your choice, that is your duty. However, I cannot offer you more wisdom than I did earlier. You cannot build an ark after it starts raining, and you should not bake bread before it finishes proofing. Don't rush yourself, but don't hesitate forever. Just because it isn't raining now doesn't mean it won't ever rain. She said as she turned to me, and she said the shortest sentence I've heard yet. Your grandfather is very proud of you. He will fulfill his promise she said as she finished her tea. Now, with all of our tea gone, Adonsi rested her hands on her leg as she spoke. As she spoke, a figure in a dark hood came out of the darkness and laid her gifts in front of us, each gift explained with both a strangely new familiarity. To Mark Pierce, the Red Prince, you sought a great prize in the countryside. You have many wonderful strengths, body, mind, soul, heart, and being. However, hand-eye coordination is definitely not one of them. You sought out this prize so much, something that when you saw it, you did not recognize, but immediately loved. A creature that represents a large part of yourself. A part of yourself that you once hated, once fought, that you now love and embrace. I hope you see this prize and remember how much it means to you. You remember to always love yourself as much as you love this prize, Adonsi said as the figure in the cloak laid out a small four-legged animal on the table. The toy was bone white with stubby legs, a big round head, and two black eyes that did not focus on the same thing. The nose was a single line and the mouth was a short straight line. It was adorable, certainly, but it was not something I could tell you what it was. When Marceline saw it, she hugged it close to her chest and started crying over the yippee. Clearly, this prize did mean a lot to her. When for falling grace, you've struggled against tragedy your entire life. You give a persona of strength and stoicism because you've seen your emotions and weakness used against you. Despite your impossible walls around your heart, you always had a weakness for others. You still care about others, even when someone you don't know is hurting, 
you hurt too. You want them to heal and be well, even to your detriment. So to you, lost princess of the Florian fairies, I give you a reminder of tragedy. May you see it not as a reminder of tragedy, but as a promise that even tragedies can have tears of joy. She said as Sir Prize brought forth a teddy bear, much larger than Fallen Grace, lying the stuffed animal in front of her. The fairy almost reached out to touch the animal, just stopping short, not quite touching it. She seemed hesitant to accept it. I could see her shaking at first. I thought she was angry, but then I realized she was sobbing. She was sobbing so badly that she was shaking and nearly collapsing into the arms of the teddy bear. The parents found their child. They lost the toy, but they regained who the toy once belonged to. The Dauncey said as Fallen Grace sobbed louder, crying into the embrace of the teddy bear. As for you, Kel, you already were given your prize, but honestly, we're still giving it to you again because it's fun. For one whose heart carries so much love, your passions burn in a shade misunderstood by many. It burns gray, white, black, and green, recognized, respected, and received by the Jack of Hearts. It will never wilt. It will never weaken. It will remind you that you are not broken, that your heart is whole as it is, and that your heart will save so many others, that none will ever count them all. She said as Sir Prize laid out an envelope in front of Kel. As he opened it, retrieving from the inside of it a rose that was two different shades of green, one shade of white, one shade of gray, and one shade of black. The thorns did not prick his fingers, but still I could see tears filling up his eyes. That rose meant so much to him, matching the pen on his lapel. As for you, Autumn... You have a lot of progress made and a lot more to go. You have a lot to learn about the worlds that you are a part of. So I hope that you will see what I give you and remember what you are willing to give up to help others. However, I hope you also see the cost associated with helping others and in making assumptions about how others will behave. Just because someone should act a certain way does not mean that they will. Adonsi said as Sir Prize laid out a gray chip in front of Autumn, a single red thumbprint in the center, the same chip that Autumn gambled in the casino, a gamble that gave us all passage, but also nearly cost her both her life and her freedom. Autumn did not cry. Her face was blank, but she slipped the chip away into her pocket. I do not know if she was listening to what Adonsi was saying. She certainly heard Adonsi's word, but that was not the same thing as listening or even understanding. For summer, you were tricky. You care. You cared for those who came before you. You cared for those statues. You did not know who they were, what they represented. You just knew that they were once people, and you mourned them all the same. So this prize to you isn't a reminder that they once died. It is to remind you that they once lived. The world is full of death and tragedy, but if you focus on all of the darkness, then you may never see how full of light the night truly is. Adonsi finished as a limestone statuette of a ghost figure was put in front of Summer. Summer examined the figurine, careful not to touch it, but she seemed fascinated by the golden eyes of the little statue. Now it was Adonsi's turn to focus on me. Her head did not move, but it did feel like something in the room shifted as she spoke to me. Did everyone else now see her looking my way, or was it something else entirely? As she spoke, I felt like the pressure and the voices from the sentinel weren't in my head. For the first time in almost a year, a burden that I did not know that I was carrying eased. So I relaxed as she spoke, and surprise brought forth my own gift. You were promised a long time ago to have the heavens in your hands. 
You were so young at the time, you thought you were promised to have the stars above. You only realized at a far greater age that you were promised sentinel and not the stars. However, I do have something I hope you will use and remember. Consider it an old promise kept and a new promise made. She said as surprise left the model of the solar system I saw in the first room in front of me. Now I had a much closer look. I could see the rotating stars, moon, and sun around the planet in the center. It looked like somewhere I may have never heard of before. You were promised the heavens in your hand, and you have that. And the new promise? That model represents Lockhart. My own home, my own heavens. You will visit Lockhart. The question of when? At a time when it is proper to go, she said as I watched in fascination of all of the moving constellations of bronze and gold around the blue-green jewel in the center of it all. When you all make it home, you will find these prizes, along with anything else you bought here, in your rooms. Thank you so much for helping me celebrate Feralia. I just hope you all remember how to wake up, Dauncey said as the lights went out. I don't know how long I was asleep for, but when I woke up in my bed, I thought for a moment that it was just a dream, until I saw on my desk the model of the Lockhart system. The stars cast light into my room as they wandered in the night, surrounding the planet. I laid my head on the pillow, looking above at the ceiling. That was definitely a fun time recommended by Fallen Grace, and I think spending time in the Black Moon Club with my friends is definitely going to be worth it. I felt like I finally found somewhere I belonged in Sam LaSalle University. Now you're there, and I know you what you've been doing. I hope you enjoy my stories, Adonsi said to the silent room. No light is there, but to those who remain in the room, light isn't necessary. Adonsi ran her fingers across the book, and she sighed while she spoke again. You went to such great trouble to listen to my little story, and yet you didn't burn a candle for me. And you didn't bring me a snack, she said before she tilted her head as if someone was speaking to her. But no voice was said, and it wasn't spoken in any sense of the word, not even telepathically. Well, I guess you burned a candle, and you did bring me a snack, but you didn't bring it with the others. You only did it about twenty years later than everyone else, but I guess that still counts. Time is a web, and my friend is a spider. If they brought you here, they must have seen value in you being a part of the story. She turns in the darkness, her eyes seeing nothing, and she is not able to sense anything. But she knows the unseen observer is there. She knows that they are there because she is there too. As great as a Dauncey is, she knows that she would never be here if the Observer wasn't there as well. Speaking on three different levels is difficult, so let's make this even simpler. You know that knowing the story makes you a part of the story. You know that everyone there was taken away when their tribute and their candle was blown out. You know that you offered the candle in the future, and your snack as well. It wasn't my fault that I brought you back in time, to a time that makes sense. You witnessed my stories, and now you will get to join the others. Do you understand what that means? Adonsi asked the unseen observer who remained silent. 
not able to speak in a way that a Donsi nor anyone else in this world could listen to. Dearest friend, you know that this quest was never meant for six. It was always meant for seven. You are the unseen observer. You may think you had no impact on this quest, but you had the biggest impact. What would they have done without you observing? The story exists because you were there to see it. You heard my story like everyone else. You got to be a part of the story. You get to be a part of the pumpkin house. All you had to be was a witness. You helped them with all of their quests, their trials, your own personal struggles, simply by giving them a place to talk about it. You are the one that lets the story be a story. You listen to it, and you spread the story. The Unseen Presence is nervous and keeps thinking that Adansi isn't talking about them. You may think I am addressing someone else, but I am not. The payoff wasn't what you were expecting, but the payoff was always going to be this. What was the ultimate prize that you were willing to sacrifice so much for? What would make you listen for so many hours? What prize is worth following six friends? What is the ultimate prize in the center of the pumpkin house? Well, now you know. And now you know you are the last part of it all. You are given one last chance to back out of it all. And one last chance before the candle, the light source that lets you listen to the story, is blown out and you become a part of the story. So tell me, is the prize at the center of it all worth it for you? Or are you going to back out now at the end of it all? Good call, dearest friend. I could always count on you.